Howdy. Howdy. Welcome. Howdy. Howdy. Welcome to our fourth annual bioinformatics symposium. Uh, the focus of this year's symposium is cancer, basic research to bioinformatics. Due to the current pandemic, we are hosting our symposium virtually. And on behalf of the organizing committee, it's my pleasure to welcome all the scientists, academicians, uh, young researchers, and students to the symposium. This symposium is organized by the Department of Biology, Department of Statistics, and the Department of Molecular and Cellular Medicine, and co-organized by Center for Statistical Bioinformatics and Texas A&M Tripods Fields Institute. We thank Dr. Raymond Carroll and the Institute for Applied Mathematics and Computational Science, IAMCS, for sponsoring this symposium. Thanks to Kerry Rellis and Joyce Sutherland, Department of Statistics, and Mackenzie Lavre, uh, Febre Department of Biology for all their help to organize the symposium. The purpose of this symposium is to bring together researchers in different areas of cancer research and bioinformatics and encourage further collaboration and learn all the new interesting findings in their labs. We are fortunate to have some world-class scientists here today with us and they are going to talk about their research. We are looking forward to learn a lot from them. And now to begin with, I would request Dr. Alex Keen, Head Department of Biology and Dr. Branislav Vidakovic, Head Department of Statistics, pioneer research and experts in this field to say a few words. Dr. Alex Keen. So thanks, Tapestry. I don't have a lot to add. I've only um, been here for a month. Um, but one of the things that, that stands out about a &M is that it's a massive campus. And one of the things that's really wonderful about this symposium is that it has potential to, to bring people together. Um, and so, so as Tapestry just said, this is a, a collaboration between biology, statistics, and the Health Science Center. And I think the, the interdisciplinary nature of bioinformatics and cancer research really lends itself nicely just to to bring people together from different disciplines. And so I just um, I want to acknowledge the, the chairs, Dan Malik and Tapestry, Roy Sarkar for, for putting this together under, I mean, I think a really challenging last year for everyone, both personally and professionally. Um, and then Yang Ni from Statistics and Raquel Stichiren and Artisha Singh from Health Sciences um, for making this, this wonderful event happen. Um, and so you brought together a world-class group of, of cancer researchers from across the country. And I just wanna welcome all of you. And I hope that um, the, the Texas A&M hospitality can extend over this virtual format. And all of you that are, are giving these talks virtually will come, come visit our, our campus soon. Um, so thanks again and look forward to hearing some great science. Thank you. Now, Dr. Branislav Vidakovic. Yes, uh, thank you, Alex, uh, for introduction. A uh, year ago, I was in the same skin as Alex now. I just arrived uh, at Texas A&M campus, and I was asked by organizing committee to open the, the symposium. So uh, now uh, Alex is the uh, opening for the first time, and maybe for many, many uh, times in future. Statistics at Crossroads uh, uh, workshop two years ago identified that if statisticians uh, uh, want to make impact, they need to uh, diverge to other sciences. And I cannot see a better science uh, for statisticians than the bioinformatics, uh, essentially. The proteomics, genomics, uh, clinical trials are part of statistics and the statistical methods, uh, learning uh, causal models, Bayesian machinery are indispensable uh, in cancer research. I see today here the who is who in cancer. Researchers from MD Anderson, from Harvard, from Northwestern, from Fred Hutchison, and even uh, people from, from industry. I would like to recognize Giovanni Parmigiani as personal friend uh, and future speaker today. Giovanni and myself spent eight years together at Duke University. And while the rest of us 
deal with Bayesian statistics and priors. Giovanni did uh, cancer research uh, 25 to 30 years ago, started to do. With Don Berry, he started to work on PRCA uh, gene uh, and other, other things. So I am really pleased to, to uh, see him as one of the featured speakers today. I would like to welcome everybody and thank everybody for, for uh, attending the conference. I would like to thank the organizing committee and I hope to see you next year in person to have the, the conference, the workshop, the, the symposium in person. So thank you and please uh, uh, start with, with, the, with the workshop, with the, with the symposium. Thank you so much. So we are going to wait for another uh, 15 minutes. Uh, then we are going to start our uh, keynote speaker. Maybe wait for a few more people. So personally, I'll thank Brani. So if you go to our website, we have now a very fancy website. So we had an old one. University said it's not working well with the university. Uh, you know, they're changing their things every time. So I requested Brani, can we make it really modern, really fancy, putting all the information? Because it's very important what Brani would like, you know. And I think that's true. Why didn't you do Okay. Yes, uh, so that's fine. <laughs> uh, it happens all the time, so like when you use. Um, but anyway, so what I want to say, like, you know, I went to Brani and I told that, you know, this uh, statistical bioinformatics is really uh, important, not for the department, for the college, for the whole university to integrate people from all over. And uh, he helped us to build the whole website, like, you know, paying financially, getting the right people to build it. And I'll request all of you, if you, to, if you go now, we have a lot of new advisors, uh, uh, um, uh, new uh, investigators, and if you're interested, like, you know, please let me know. We, we, we are ready to work with others. It's interdisciplinary center to involve others. It's, it's very integrative in nature. You want to add people there in terms of your ideas. So in future, like, you know, if you have idea to do small meetings, workshops, like, you know, please let me know. We'll, we'll find out something to do so that we can do more. It's an annual workshop what Tapasri is doing for a few years and with the committee. Now we have a very, very, very uh, smart and equipped committee helping Tapasri out. But uh, in the middle also, if you want to do small workshop, hand-on experience, doing together some research projects, very specific possibly, we, we can do that. We have students who are interested in uh, all over the campus, not only statistics, biology or medical school uh, or uh, other in, uh, engineering or other colleges, but it's all over the university. So we can, we, we can do that very easily. Especially what is very important is now we have seen like, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning is coming in a very big way from Washington. There will be a national academic committee. They are talking about on AI, like so uh, who will try to think how artificial intelligence can be used in bioinformatics, biology and other fields. I think it will be a fantastic way to integrate this uh, artificial intelligence intelligence with bioinformatics. Can we make these drugs or small equipment which can take genomic level observations possibly, but uh, not with, without human interfere almost like, you know, so this kind of ideas, cutting edge ideas, we can do small workshops here, getting people from NIH, getting people from anywhere, like, you know, and just hear them to say like what they're doing. So that's the first thing. Second thing I have a request, a lot of times we do a conference and forget about it, right? Yeah, that's okay, that's a conference. We heart fantastic people and what about it? I always want to have a follow-up meeting after that, right? So people, what we learned, can we do something together after that? Like, you know, can we think about a big proposal together, R01 or U1 or something like that in NIH? Or NSF, there's a very big thing what Brani knows the best, like biologist and mathematician works together. They're a little bit specific. Can we do that? That's really the use of this kind of conferences when we learn, when we see some common ideas, what biology is doing, what medical people doing, what statistician doing, and then working together and possibly can involve others from outside as our advisor or as our investigators. But then at the end of the day, really it will be successful a conference when it ends up with some 
really sweet things, a great paper or a great uh, um, uh, proposal or some ideas, nothing but some discussions, like, you know, so I'll request, like, you know, the Traposti uh, uh, and all other uh, people who are here to organize a follow-up meeting after that. We don't have to do it within a week, but possibly in this semester or next semester, just to discuss this meeting and see what we can do together after these things, what ideas we get, or what lot of outstanding speakers. We have Manny, we have uh, Giovanni, like, you know, we have others, like you know, all outstanding speakers. So they're talking about cutting edge things, but what we can do in AM, and right? So, uh, and uh, that's my request, right? So. Thank you, thank you, yeah. some time so if you have uh, any question about the center or if you have some uh, you know, the idea about the center or anything like that you can, we, we can discuss because I think uh, um, I can try to do it okay. you have something organoids. so after organoids yeah and I leave 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 leave. Leave. so we can do it yeah okay and I think I need to ask everyone to <laughs> meet. Yeah. Uh, Possibly you can mute her because you, yes, you that's you're what I'm, <laughs> I'm literally going and then checking and muting everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I think I, I did already. <laughs> So if I if I if I may give uh, give a a plug uh, for NSF, yeah, uh, I ask you, Brandy, exactly yes. about the figures. Modest with respect to the proposal, but it is well funded uh, program, and I cannot see better topics for the proposals uh, at NSF than, for example, the topics or theme of of today's conference. So please take a look. Many of you uh, probably uh, got funded and many of you uh, applied, but for people who are new researchers, uh, please take a look at mathematical biology uh, program at NSF. It is uh, under DMS uh, directorate. Mathematical. I have a quick question about that. Do they, by biology, like and it's, it's a perfect place because biology, statistics and all these things, are, are they looking for traditional biology and uh, mathematics or they're also looking for bioinformatics there in, within that program? They're looking for bioinformatics in that program as well. So anything biological is, is uh, that has application in biology. The... Uh, There is small division of the tasks uh, with respect to with respect to the NIH and uh, NSF, and when disease and uh, diagnostics and uh, treatments are involved, then NIH is is involved. But if there is a sort of mathematical background or statistical background or methodology that is used then it is, it is the uh, NSF. So, so it is, it is uh, definitely a fair game to, to uh, apply to mathematical biology. Well, that's, that's fantastic. In fact, uh, in future, uh, possibly we should also involve mathematics department here because a lot of things going on in maths also, right? They, they model things with differential equation. We do it time series kind of thing. Possibly they do the scientific modeling on bioinformatics, some of the things, right? Fast varying thing. So it will be good to know who are in mathematics also working on this kind of problem. I know they do traditional biology, a lot of people do, but in bioinformatics with their modeling, mathematical modeling, so that that group will be much stronger. We have a big biology thing, right? You know, we have Rob here and Tapasri Biology, medical schools, and then statistics is always strong. We work with others, but if we can get mathematics also uh, who are working in this group, then that will make that, what NIH also, I know that NIH is more, 
It was like, but I, I mean, BMRD, this study section and other studies, they are appreciating a lot on foundational research now, mathematical foundational research in bioinformatics and biology. So that will be a good thing to have some mathematicians involved in, in, in this kind of proposal or in our meeting conference. Possibly we can do a small workshop kind of thing, right? Statistics, mathematics, and biological sciences kind of thing where we can see, like, you know, just like, you know, what people are doing to find out here. Yes, yes, definitely. Well, in this mathematical biology program, about 40% of the people who apply are statisticians, essentially. Yeah, I don't know. I, absolutely. He's a biologist. Yeah, but but don't you think, Brandy, like, you know, we have statistics and biology, right? But if we can get, because not too many times a mathematician, because the proposals are very different, statistician with biologist, mathematician with biology. But if we can create a group where statistician, mathematician, and biologist, because, like, you know, coming together, possibly that get a... If that, that's a good proposal, I'm not talking about anything, that can make it a stronger thing because uh, in ANM we have this great thing about working statistician and mathematician together, right? We, we do these uncertainty quantifications, like, you know, we do a lot of differential equations and they are statistical model, like you, know, you do yourself and we do like, uh, so possibly some way integrating them, then it can look very different than other proposals rather than separating them, getting uh, more integrative mode, how you move math, stats, biology from big foundational domain towards completely application experimental domain and uh, it's like a closed loop science kind of thing, right? Absolutely. So, so uh, these things are done uh, among these different disciplines in mathematics and the, they're funded uh, maybe about uh, three, four uh, grants per, per, per season as RGM's research groups in, in mathematics. That uh, when I say mathematics, uh, I really uh, see the, the directorate. So statistics would be there, statistical uh, biology, mathematical biology would be there. So that would be uh, really good to take a look at the RGM's because these grants go between 1 million and 2 millions. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah, those are big grants and always getting more from more fields, you get more support from scientific officers also, right? Because yes. in that group, statistics, they are very aggressively, then mathematician comes on and biologists, then you get, uh, but possibly what I'll do, because Tripods is a good platform, like, you know, because we are working with almost all over the university and a lot of mathematicians are involved with tripods and and we are also part of this uh, bioinformatics conference i'll try to meet people from all colleges one people like you know from department like six seven departments we are in like uh, and uh, try to see like you know what departments are doing and possibly this year is too late for the biology program but uh, for next year, we can prepare for several proposals. Like you know, not only this biology, but there are some bigger proposals which come with the innovative things. Or AI, some of the artificial intelligence with biology will come in next year, definitely, right? So uh, those are the, possibly will be a good platform to start working with. And always we have friends in MD Anderson and UT Medical in Houston, right? All this, <laughs> we can get uh, all these top level researchers uh, you know, helping us out. So that'll, that'll, that'll be fantastic. Yes. So possibly Tapusri from uh, 925, you can start introducing uh, uh, Manny, like Dr. Manny, and then we, we can start from there. So, yeah.
Tapasri, uh, can you send a link to somebody or they need to register for this one? She's preparing something. You know, Brani, you know Ken, right? Ken Ramos, you know him, right? Yep. One of our advisors, I think, oh, he's looking for a link, but I think you have to register for. I actually just got on. Oh, you got Ken? Oh, welcome, Ken, welcome. So, Ken is one of our advisors of this uh, uh, center, and he's also Rob, Ken, both of us here. We, are, we have three advisors here, Ken, uh, uh, Robert Chapkin, Ken Ramos, and Raymond Carroll. Ray is a little bit busy today, I think, but we have two advisors. Fantastic. Thank you, Ken. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for doing this. So, should I start? I'll go ahead and start. Please. So we are now going to start our session one, Cancer Research Basic Science to Bioinformatics. Uh, we'll have, uh, after the talk, we'll have five minutes for question and answer section, session. And then you can unmute yourself and ask question, or you can send your question via the chat box. So it's my pleasure to introduce our today's keynote speaker for the session one. He's a pioneer in cancer research, an amazing scientist and a great mentor. He's my postdoctoral mentor, Dr. Sendurai Mani, professor in the Department of Translational Molecular Pathology, the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. He's also the co-director, the Metastasis Research Center and Can Center for Stem Cells and Developmental Biology. He did his PhD from Indian Institute of Science. After that, he did his postdoctoral research at MIT with Dr. Bob Weinberg. He was the first to demonstrate that cancer cells can become cancer stem cells by activating the latent embryonic epithelial to mesenchymal transition or EMT program. This finding provides the foundation and explanation for the presence of plasticity within the tumor cells, as well as the development of metastasis and resistance to various treatments. These findings published in Cell in 2008 and has been cited over 8,600 times and ranks 86th out of 3.3 million articles published in the area of cancer research. He has received numerous awards, including B Scholar, the Jimmy V Foundation of, uh, for Cancer Research, the American Cancer Research Society Scholar Award, fellow American Association of, for Advancement of Science, full member Sigma Xi, the Scientific Research Honor Society. His lab at MD Anderson is investigating the biology and the contribution of EMT and the cancer stem cells in developing metastasis and chemo resistance. The areas of his research are, understand the biology of EMT program, identify and characterize cancer cells undergone EMT, either within primary tumor or within blood, by monitoring circulatory tumor cells for diagnostic purpose and therapeutic monitoring. And also develop small molecule inhibitor to inhibit EMT and cancer stem cell properties for treating metastasis and preventing or treating the development for therapy resistance. Today, he will be talking about contributing contribution of epithelial to mesenchymal plasticity to cancer metastasis and treatment resistance. Without any further delay, let's welcome Dr. Sendurai Mani. 
Thank you, Tapishri. Uh, that's very kind uh, introduction. And, uh, uh, yeah, and thanks to you and thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me to give a presentation uh, to this elite audience. Um, I'll just uh, share my screen and let me know if it comes as uh, presentation mode or in the... Um... It is good, yeah. Um... Just... Can it be a little bit bigger? I think in the it's right coming. Way. It's coming. It's a uh, who can see this transcript? I don't need the transcript. It's a uh, MD Anderson has given us a Wi-Fi at home. Okay. Uh, so we have to use that to get onto the MD Anderson network. It's sometimes slow, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess it's. Just give me one second. I will yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So do you see my one screen or do you see the screen with the, what do you see? I can see the screen uh, and then. No, is it like an just a one screen? Like an, one, there is no. At the side. <laughs> Yeah, I just can see the next slide, but we can see. Oh, that I don't want. That's what I'm asking. It's in the presentation mode. Is it in yeah. the presentation mode? Or? No, no, it's in the presentation. Give me one second. Just... Okay. Yeah. Should be enough. Fine. Yeah. Right. Now you just see one slide. Just you don't see uh, the, yes. the next. Yes. Yeah. Now it's okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, special thanks to, again, Tapashree and all the organizing committee for giving me an opportunity to share uh, what we work on in the lab. Um, and, uh, and uh, um, you know, as uh, Tapashri said, she was in my lab um, um, several years ago. Uh, she's one of the most productive, effective uh, scientists. And in fact, when she was in the lab, uh, she, uh, you know, we had a bunch of uh, astronauts from NASA visiting us uh, they wanted to see. Um, they wanted to see um, how to handle the mice before they could take mice to the space station, and it was Tavashri who showed them all. Uh, you know, holding the mice and giving them, asking them to play around, and uh, you know, uh, again uh, she did quite well in the lab. And uh, um, with that. Um, and I'm see she's doing very well here. Good luck. Um, I'm just going to, I know you have a, many of you are bioinformatics, statistics, uh, students and uh, undergrads. So I'm just going to give a more of a basic biology point of view of my story uh, because I'm not a bioinformatician or a statistician, but it's very important that, you know, we need help as uh, one of you talking earlier that the biologists need help from a bioinformatics and the statistical uh, support. And it'll be spectacular uh, that, you know, you know I, I thought I would just play, uh, show some biology of cancer metastasis, and then um, we could find a way to collaborate, uh, et cetera, uh, later on. So, so why am I interested in what I'm interested in? Just I'm, my lab, uh, 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 we are interested in understanding the biology of cancer metastasis. Uh, the reason is, as you all know, um, if somebody has a just plainly a primary tumor, um, this is shown in blue, the survival rate is much better. For example, in case of prostate cancer, it's more than 95%. But independent of the cancer type, if someone has a metastasis, the success of survival is extremely low, independent of the cancer type. So while this is the major reason why cancer patients are dying, the understanding of the biology uh, of metastasis is not uh, full. Like, you know, we, we don't know um, completely how uh, uh, the cancer cell find a way to leave the primary site and then develop a metastasis at the distant site, how the tumor cell overcome immune cells um, while they are in transit, et cetera. The number of things we need to understand. So, so therefore, you know, my, I've, I've devoted my past uh, 15, 20 years trying to understand the biology, so that through that we can understand diagnostics and therapeutics to target metastasis. So how I got started, uh, this is a kind of a slide, which again, for the students' sake, um, you know, when I joined many years ago in the Bob Weinberg lab, 
Um, there was a, two other postdocs who were uh, uh, in the lab at the time. They were taking a normal breast epithelial cells. And then to that, they were introducing a bunch of genes trying to make them cancerous. And they were, able, they were successful. When they put uh, SP40 early region, catalytic subunoptilomerase and H2L RAS, they were successful in making them to be a cancerous. You know, when you put them in a mouse, they form a tumor. But what they noticed is that the tumors were non-metastatic. And this is not only in a breast cancer, it's also true in other epithelial cells. So that's when I just joined Bob's lab. I kind of hypothesized that probably metastasis is driven by a separate set of genes and pathways. Therefore, can we go after them? So I partnered with, uh, you know, this, this, all this data I'm going to show uh, is done in collaboration with many, many, many amazing colleagues and friends and collaborators. Um, so just to give you a background about metastasis, metastasis is not a, just a simple tumor cell leaving and developing a metastasis at the distant site. It's a quite a complex process where um, the tumor has to grow big. And when the tumor reaches one to two millimeter, um, they get highly vascularized. Uh, through this process called angiogenesis. And then the tumor cells uh, enter into the vasculature through the leaky vasculature. Um, and then uh, the tumor cells travel and they reach a distant site and they get out and they create a micrometastasis. And sometime in, for example, in ER positive breast cancer patients, tumor cell can sit in a bone for centuries, um, 10 to, sorry, not centuries, for decades. Uh, for decades, they can sit there uh, doing, just remain dormant. And then at some point, those cells come out of dormancy or micrometastasis and develop into metastasis. And a metastasis can seed more additional metastasis. So this process goes on. So the tumor cell has to also survive in the circulation. So quite a complex process in, in summary. So there are two ways people study metastasis. One is called a spontaneous metastasis, where in, the, in a laboratory, people introduce tumor cells, in this case, breast cancer into the mouse breast, and then ask how that breast uh, tumor metastasized to the lung. Or there are groups who also introduce tumor cells directly into the blood and then ask how the tumor cells grow in the lung. The reason I'm showing this slide is that students, when you are looking at um, a paper, you should pay attention whether they're doing a spontaneous metastasis or experimental metastasis. They are completely different and they are addressing a different problem. So, so what I did, I wanted to know the spontaneous metastasis process, not just an experimental metastasis process, because that's what Brian Ellenbos and Bill Hahn did when they put the tumor cells in the mouse breast, they did not develop metastasis. So, so at that time in collaboration with another postdoc, uh, now she's a faculty in UCSD, um, we hypothesized that you know, epithelial cells, they are well organized, they are, they bind to, they interact with one another or, or, or they bind to one another through various cell cell adhesion molecules. When a tumor cell, when a normal epithelial cell like this get transformed, become cancerous, even those cells will continue to express these cell cell adhesion molecules. Therefore, they will remain local. So in order for these cells to leave the primary site to go to distant site, we hypothesize that they need to break the cell cell adhesion and cell matrix interaction. And that would allow them to go from primary site to the metastatic site. And that's what the case, and there's a number of papers I've shown that activating EMT make these non-metastatic cells, which I showed earlier, uh, become metastatic. So they can go to the lung, uh, they grow all over. So as uh, Tapasri said, now we know that EMT program play a role um, in promoting metastasis, but we also know that if you speak to pathologists, um, when a pathologist look at a tumor um, a section, he or she can look at the tissue and right away predict that this tumor, which is found in the lung, whether that belongs to the lung or it has come from breast or prostate or pancreas or spleen, just by looking at a histopathology of the tumor, uh, which they found uh, in the lung tissue. So when I heard that, I kind of hypothesized. So now we know that cancer cells can leave the primary site through uh, uh, EMT program by activating EMT program, but they recreate a tumor histopathologically similar to where they come from. Therefore, I hypothesize that the tumor cells not only become migratory, invasive, et cetera, rather they also become a stem cells so that they could recreate an organ 
similar to where they come from. In fact, that turns out to be true. That's what Tapestry was saying, that this paper has been cited over 8,600 times, suggesting that this hypothesis, this idea is not only true in breast cancer, but beyond um, cancer types and uh, uh, proven by many groups. Now, now coming to cancer stem cells, um, the therapies targeting cancer stem cells, um, there are very few. Um, um, if you think about a tumor, uh, which has, let's say, differentiated cancer cells, in this case, it's shown in pink, and then cancer stem cells shown in yellow. And if you give a conventional treatment to a tumor like this, you will, the conventional treatment such as chemotherapy will eliminate most of the differentiated cancer cells. The stem cells will remain and they will, they can proliferate and differentiate and recreate a tumor um, uh, either at the same site or a different site. Alternatively, let's say we have a cancer stem cell specific treatment, then if that cancer stem cell treatment can remove the cancer stem cells. If you recollect the previous slide, the differentiated cells in response to um, the inflammation and various other parameters, they can de-differentiate, they can become a stem cells and then recreate a tumor similar to the original tumor. The ideal strategy would be combining cancer stem cell specific treatment and uh, differentiated cancer cell uh, specific treatment. When you combine, you should be able to eliminate tumor. But this is what now, as you all know, um, more very uh, at MD Anderson, as well as in many other cancer institution, that combination treatment is the, the next step which everybody's trying. Now, coming back to the biology. Um, so many years ago, this is uh, 2009, um, um, Jeff uh, Rosen, he's a professor in Baylor College of Medicine, um, and uh, uh, in collaboration with Jenny Chang, who's at Methodist now, but uh, they were looking at a human patient treated with various treatment. And what they noticed is that they were staining the tumor tissue after the treatment with pancytokeratin, which identify epithelial cell, and vimentin, which identify a mesenchymal cell. So here you could see in this section, a number of cells are um, pancytokeratin positive as evidenced by green staining. There are some of them which are red, which is shown in vimentin, this vimentin fibroblast, you see they are vimentin positive, but there are some cells, they are double positive. So in other words, while we know when a cell undergo EMT, um, they will become vimentin positive. And my original hypothesis was that EMT will promote metastasis, therefore the cells undergo um, EMT transition, they are e keratin positive or cytokeratin positive, will become a cytokeratin or e keratin negative and vimentin positive. That was our original hypothesis. But here, Jeff is finding the tumor cells, which some of them are displaying um, double uh, characteristics or retaining epithelial and displaying some mesenchymal. And this is a, uh, a data from Dana Haber and uh, Shamala Maheshwaran's group. And they were looking at a circulating tumor cells. And when they looked at a circulating tumor cells, they saw there are some tumor cells. Uh, this is an RNA in situ and they're looking for a number of markers. And they were able to find some tumor cells are predominantly epithelial, which is shown in green. Some tumor cells in the blood are predominantly mesenchymal as shown in red, but there are some had both. And therefore, um, it's kind of another evidence showing that you have a tumor cells which could have a both the qualities. So Wen Jun Guo, who was a postdoc in the Weinberg lab, now he's a faculty uh, uh, in Albert Einstein. Um, so he was working with me. Um, um, uh, we were trying to see, can we induce an EMT and make normal stem cells which can reconstitute memory fat pad? I will explain to you what it means. So here, this is a normal mouse breast uh, development. So this is at the time of puberty. Um, this is shown in a cartoon. Here is a nipple, the duct growing into the mammary fat pad. Um, and then at a virgin gland, the entire fat pad is filled with these ducts, but they are, they are just a duct. And during pregnancy, they start developing something called alveolar buds. And uh, at, during lactation, all the alveolar buds become a, uh, mature alveoli, they produce milk and the milk secreted into these lumen and they get secreted into the uh, nipple. And this is a cartoon. And here is a real um, have image or HNE of uh, developing mammary gland. Now, what one could do, you can take this three week old mammary gland, which is shown here. 
you can remove the left part, which you have a ductal tree and the ducts and the nipple and all that, you can remove that surgically. That's called a cleared fat pad. So now this fat pad is enriched with all the growth factors necessary for stem cells to proliferate and create a duct, but you need a cells. So you can inject cell of interest into that area and see whether there has a stem cell property. So what Wen Jun did, he took myself and Wen Jun, we spent a lot of time inducing EMT, injecting them to these mammary fat pad and asking them to reconstitute. Unfortunately, we were unsuccessful. So I lapped Weinberg lab. Um, so he continued. One of the things he found out eventually was that if you induce an EMT and lock them in the mesenchymal state, and they cannot create a duct, re reconstitute the ductal tree, which means when they become mesenchymal, you need to allow them to unwind the mesenchymal property and revert back to epithelial. So if you constantly induce a EMT signal, the cells will remain mesenchymal and they cannot differentiate and recreate a duct. So what he found eventually that if you take a SOX9 and slug and, and overexpressed in an epithelial cell in an in, using an inducible promoter, such that the cells become stem-like cells. Now, this is a control vector expressing cells. He's put 10,000 cells. There's nothing here. And, but just a hundred cells, which are induced by overexpressing slug and SOX9 uh, briefly. And then the inducer was taken out. Now the freedom was given to the cell to proliferate, differentiate, and recreate a ductal tree. Now, under that scenario, he was able to demonstrate that. The point I'm trying to convey here is that activating a stable mesenchymal program, while it can promote metastasis when you have a proliferation signal, but in a, in a, in a, in a real patient scenario, the tumor cells need to gain mesenchymal, but they don't have to become mesenchymal. And that's a kind of message we got. So, in support of this idea, this is Jing Yang, with whom I started a, you know, was a postdoc. She was in the Weinberg lab. Now she's a professor at UCSD. She developed a skin cancer model. Um, uh, please feel free to stop me anytime. You know, I don't have to uh, continuously talk. If you want to ask anything, we can discuss uh, along the way. Um, so what Jing did, she developed a skin cancer model where she exposed the mice to DMBA and TPA, and they developed a skin tumor. And these tumors were expressing an inducible twist. Um, um, so now when you give a oral dox to these mice, the doxycycline will induce twist all over the body, right? Because you're giving them orally. Under that scenario, the twist will get induced in the tumor and, uh, and the twist will be on even if the tumor cell managed to land in the lung. The second model uh, approach she took was topical docs, where she induced a, a tumor and she applied docs only to the tumor at the surface of the skin. So now under that scenario, the tumor cell will experience activation of twist, which is an EMT inducer. Now that would facilitate migration of tumor cells from the skin to the um, lung or wherever they go. But when they go to the newer site, they no longer will see twist expression because there is no inducer. Now they are allowed to go, revert back to uh, whatever they, are, they can revert back to. Under that scenario, she tested, can she increase the metastatic frequency? What she found uh, is that when, and this is a control mice, there's no difference between oral docs or topical docs, but in the twist to expressing mice, the oral docs did have some spontaneous metastasis, but she did a topical docs administration. You see 12 out of 14 mice had a metastasis. So they concluded that Reversible activation of EMT is critical, uh, but you need to activate EMT. So Max Vicha, he was looking at a cancer stem cells um, and trying to identify a stem cells, uh, because as you know, in order to create a tumor, you need a stem cells. But what I said is activation of EMT promotes the stem cells, which facilitates metastasis. Therefore, what Max was looking for is that are there stem cells which can create a tumor and there are stem cells which can develop metastasis. And he found that there are stem cells which are more of a mesenchymal or epithelial, and then the epithelial ones forms primarily tumor and the mesenchymal ones tend to be uh, metastatic. But the most uh, important, uh, there's one other study by Herbie Levin and Ishel Ben Jacob, uh, he's no more. Um, so they were looking at uh, from a mathematical 
and via physical point of view. He's a National Academy member and Herbie and I, we have been working together for many years. Um, so the way Herbie was looking at this problem is that you, know, you have an epithelial cell and the cell undergo mesenchymal transition. Once they undergo mesenchymal transition, now they cannot revert back to epithelial. Therefore, this is possible in case of fibrosis and chemo resistance. But in case of metastasis, the cell should have the ability to revert back. So they have proposed number of models um, and uh, we work together. Um, and then the, the, the conclusion is the cells with the hybrid epithelial and mesenchymal phenotype are more fit to develop metastasis than cells undergone a complete mesenchymal transition. So now um, here is the kind of the spectrum, which I think an epithelial cell, they can go to the various extreme. And I, I feel there's a point of no return. Um, the cells will have a, an ability to revert back at some point. When they lose that ability, they become mesenchymal and uh, they no longer develop metastasis. A number of groups are working in this area. I just uh, listed some. Um, so can we capture these cells, these hybrid cells? Um, so we have been working hard to identify cell surface markers uh, unique to hybrid cells. Uh, one of my postdoc, his name is Abhijit Deshmukh. Um, he's using a e caragran and n caragran um, as a marker to identify these hybrid cells because e caragran is predominantly expressed in epithelial cells. n caragran is predominantly get induced once the cell undergo EMT. The double positive cells is what he's using as a hybrid cell. Um, but the problem here is, um, you know, it's very hard to get sufficient population of cells um, to characterize them uh, functionally. So one of the other approach we are doing is doing a single cell RNA-seq and looking for an alternative marker. So here uh, is a single cell RNA-seq an epithelial cell shown in red, mesenchymal cells shown in blue, and hybrid cells shown in green. And you could see Claude in seven, they predominantly express in epithelial cells. This is each dot is a one cell, um, and but also in the cells, uh, the hybrid cells. If you see S100A14, which is also expressed in epithelial cells, also in hybrid cells. Now, if you look at the reverse side, fibronectin or TPM1, they tend to be mesenchymal and also in hybrid cells. And they're all keratin-5 positive, indicating they are epithelial in nature. So what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, the cells, when they um, undergo this EMT transition, the cells do land in a hybrid state. So in order to dissect this out further, um, what um, uh, Abhijit did, um, he, in collaboration with Herbie and Kunal Roy, uh, took an epi epithelial cell, induced them to undergo EMT by exposing them to TJ beta 1. And at some point they reach hybrid and then they eventually they become mesenchymal. And we performed a single cell rna -C. As we hypothesized, the topmost pathway which get induced is an EMT program. Um, so here is a pseudo time clustering. And what is pseudo time clustering? You know better than I do. Um, but for students, you can take this data um, and you can ask them to cluster um, um, in a particular way such that they create a kind of an order. And he found that this is zero day, one, two, three, four, eight. And here's a pseudo time clustering. And then he was able to see the pathways getting, some set of pathways getting induced or enriched. And then if you look at that under the pseudo time clustering, the topmost is EMT, TJ beta 1 signaling, because we are adding TJ beta 1, wind signaling, notch, HOC, OXFAS, PA3 kinase, et cetera. So one of the striking thing we observed in that paper, uh, which just came out in PNAs, um, is that microRNAs, they just, just flip from more expressed to not expressed, or just uh, at, at uh, pseudo time C8 uh, to Z0. Um, and then correspondingly, if you have a microRNA217, you see the microRNA dropping down. And the microRNA targets such as EZH2 and SMAT7 get turned on as soon as this microRNA drops. And that's true for many microRNAs, which is shown here as well. And you can check the paper for more information. Um, and again, in the pseudo time dependent manner, cell cell communication uh, pathways get uh, induced, um, wind signaling, and et cetera. So, what, what Herbie did, um, he did a quite a smart method of characterizing these pathways. Um, again, you know, I don't know uh, how he did it, but he did using a mathematical and computational modeling. 
and he calculated that you know there are a number of pathways get activated and he was able to go and intervene each pathway computationally it would have taken probably months um, or several months for us to do and they developed the algorithm now you can do for any pathway so when they these are the number of pathways which get induced um, um in this uh, 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 control related to pathway uh, activation and then they were repressing each pathway and you could uh, the idea is now if you repress and you could see the notch signaling is repressed here um and uh, in this case tj beta one pathway getting repressed um using their method and the thing they were asking is okay fine what is sitting upstream of each other so here in this case they are inhibiting aptas and looking at what happened to the notch you see inhibiting aptas had a minimal impact on notch signaling or tj beta one signaling but if you inhibit notch signaling it had an impact on yaptas um of course notch signaling is inhibited and some extent on tj beta 1 as well same thing true for tj beta 1 signaling because the cells are induced with the tj beta 1 yaptas signaling is affected notch signaling is affected and which is shown in like red and tj beta 1 receptor complex is inhibited so the point i'm trying to say is that computationally we are able to uh, predict that what pathway could be upstream and how can we intervene and we are experimentally testing this right now in the lab now just to switch the gear a little bit um, uh, but along the same line um so when you take an epithelial cell they become mesenchymal if you continuously treat them with the tj beta 1 they also become like a stem cells uh, based on various parameters we have characterized so far but what happens is that it takes several days for this to achieve um, it's not like when you take an epithelial cell add a tj beta 1 24 hours later they become mesenchymal and stem cells no it takes long 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 time some cells it takes 15 days and some cells it takes 8 days it's not overnight so what petra was asking is that you know if you take an epithelial cell they they become mesenchymal you can see they are attached with one another they lose this cell adhesion and then they become mesenchymal here is a morphology here is the biochemical characterization and then in this case she was looking at uh, something called a spear formation uh, where um, you can take a uh, stem cells you put them in a suspension culture if they have if they are a stem cell they will survive in a suspension they will proliferate differentiate recreate some kind of a spheroidal structure and each spear comes from a one cell um, because it takes while for them to develop and uh, so here she was measuring um, the increase in spear formation in response to tj beta 1 you could see the spear formation goes up by day 6 and then um remain constant so now if you take the similar system and if you withdraw the tj beta 1 the cells revert back to epithelial under that scenario you can see the spear formation also drops um the most important thing she was asking okay what happened to type of cell division um during this uh, time course in other words a cell can undergo something called a symmetrical differentiated type of cell division here you do stain them with num and the dapi for uh, nuclei and num for uh, a protein which is uh, kind of segregates to a differentiated cell if a two daughter cell gets a num you can see here then that's a symmetrical differentiated type of cell division both the daughter cells are differentiated cells or you can have a asymmetrical type of cell division where one daughter cell is a differentiated cells and one daughter cell is a stem cells or you can have a symmetrical self renewal type of cell division where both the daughter cells are stem cells and which is kind of you can see some other uh, representative images shown here now what petra along with the uh, uh, previous postdoc mika uh, they did is that look for increase uh, or changes in these type of cell division and you see in uh, uh, control cells they predominantly divide symmetrical differentiated type of cell division but when you treat them with the tj beta 1 this type of cell division goes down and the red which is symmetrical self renewal type of cell division goes up so suggesting there is a type of cell division switch suggesting there is an increase in stemness the point she was asking is does it mean do you need the cells to divide in order to become a stem cells and uh, is it true for stem cells as also also for mesenchymal program so what she did she took an epithelial cell expose them to tj beta 1 for them to undergo mesenchymal transition she also blocked the cell division by adding thymidine now you are blocking cell division adding tj beta 
and asking what happened. And, and then at this point, she takes the cells, removes TJ beta 1, removes thymidin, conducts a cell proliferation assay. And you can see they all proliferate normal once you come out of this side. Now she's asking, can they form a spear? Again, these cells are now not exposed to um, thymidin or TJ beta 1. They're previously treated. Now you can see the control cells form a beautiful spear. This is what I was mentioning earlier and which is, can be quantified. But the minute you block cell division, there is no spear and the cells are alive. And if you look for a mesenchymal marker, in this case, let's say fibronectin, even if you block thymidin, the cells become mesenchymal, but they are not becoming a stem cells. So um, she demonstrated this in in vivo. I'm just going to skip some slides. Um, what she found is that, that um, I'm going to go to this slide, um, that if you take epithelial cells, if you expose them to TJ beta 1, they become mesenchymal and stem-like cells. But if you block cell division, they become mesenchymal cells, but not a stem cell. So in other words, you need, the, you need to allow the cells to divide in order for them to gain both mesenchymal and stem cell properties. And she's in the process of understanding the molecular pathway involved in this. It looks like a, and a kinase, which is involved in cell division, play a key role in making this a switch. Now, in the last few minutes, um, I, I would like to tell you a story on um, um, how the plasticity, not only within the tumor cells, makes an impact to the, to the uh, metastasis, but also the tumor microenvironment. Here you see um, tumor killing immune microenvironment, which means uh, this microenvironment will not allow the tumor cells to proliferate, differentiate, um, or migrate to different sites. Uh, it will block them. But once the tumor cell reaches a particular stage, the tumor switches from tumor killing immune microenvironment to immune suppressive microenvironment, which means this microenvironment suppresses the immune cells, facilitate tumor cells to leave the primary site. It's, it's a, there are a lot of groups are working on. So one of my postdoc um, looked at this problem using a two syngenic tumor models. One is called a 67NR, another is called a 41. She put both of them into the mouse breast, and then you can see both develop a tumor equally, but only one goes to the lung, the other one don't. And uh, you can see even this is a luciferase labeled, and you can see the luminescence in the lung only in a 41, but not in 67NR, even though they both form a tumor with the equal rate. So the hypothesis is that why 67NR is non-metastatic? Is it because uh, they lack um, uh, metastatic capacity, they are unable to get into the blood or unable to grow in the lung? Um, so what Rubia did, um, she injected tumor cells, these two cells directly into the tail vein. This is an experimental metastasis, if you remember my earlier slide. Both the cells were able to go to the lung, develop a metastasis equally almost. And you can see here in h and &E, that they do go to the lung. So we, in other words, 67NR, if they manage to go to the blood, they can develop a tumor in the lung, but they lack the ability to leave the primary tumor to the vasculature uh, if they are injected into the mouse breast, and that's where these breast tumors develop in general. So then we hypothesized that it could be a, some immune cells controlling this process. She took not skid mice. Um, they don't have a T cells, B cells, and NK cells and put them in a mouse memory fat pad or mouse breast, both of them develop tumor equally. And surprise, 67NR is now metastatic to the lung, um, but not in the wild type mice. Suggesting that it could be T cells, B cells, or NK cells is stopping 67NR from leaving the mouse breast to the blood. So how about one step further using a nude mice? They don't have a T cells. And you put them in a mouse, uh, again, memory fat pad. Um, they form a tumor pretty well. They go to the lung as well. So it could be T cells. Now, you know that T cells, you have a subtype. You have a CD4 and CD8. And uh, Sean Zhang, who's our collaborator in Baylor College of Medicine, he has a knockout mice um, in a bulb C background uh, for a CD4 and CD8. So when she injected uh, these 67 NR in a CD4 knockout, didn't develop metastasis. But... In a CD8 knockout, you put them in a mouse memory fat pad, the tumor grew bigger. And then not only that, the tumor metastasized to the lung, indicating that it's a CD8 T cells, which is controlling 67NR, the tumor cells, from leaving the mouse memory fat pad 
and going into the uh, blood. Um, so she went on and characterized how it is, and she found a protein called CXCL4, which is uniquely expressed in the highly metastatic tumor 41, but not in 67NR. So, and the CXCL4 is predominantly produced by cell type called platelets. Um, so then she went ahead and blocked platelets function um, in this highly metastatic tumor and asking a question, if I block platelets, can I block metastasis? And you see in a control mice, again, she always puts the tumor into the mouse breast and asking for a metastasis to develop in the lung. The control group, you see this 41 tumor, which is highly metastatic. They did go to the lung, but when she blocked platelets, they did not. So now the question is how the platelets are regulating the metastasis uh, process. Um, she hypothesized that platelets may interfere with the CDA T cell function. Um, um, and she tested that idea. She isolated platelets, incubated with T cells and asked, could T cells um, inhibit TC, CDA T cell function? Um, she couldn't find a direct evidence. So therefore she went and asked, could platelets induce something called MDSC? Uh, what is MDSC? It's a myeloid derived suppressor cells they can inhibit CDA T cell function. So she was able to show that the protein she identified is called a CXCL4 or the platelets can convert or generate more myeloid derived suppressor cells. And which you can see here um, in these various scenario. And in an immunologist always would ask, okay, you are making an MDSC, is it functional? The way you could do that analysis is by something called um, label retaining assay. Um, so here uh, are CFSC assay, where you label the cells with the scion, some kind of color, um, T cells, then allow the T cells to proliferate. If they divide into two, then the dye get diluted into two. And now they divide one more time, the dye get diluted, it goes on. Now, if you had a myeloid derived suppressor cells, the T cells don't proliferate, the dye will be remain on the cell. Um, if they proliferate, they will lose the dye. So if the data is presented here, and you can see that the control, which is shown in gray, and you see most of the cells, they lost the dye. Um, in the y-axis, you see the color intensity of the dye, and you see most of the cells on the left side. But if you block, uh, if you expose these T cells to MDSE generated by CXCL4, and which is in blue, and you see most of the cells or retaining the dye. And same thing is true for GMCSF, which is a positive control, or you can also use the platelets, and that's the same story. So in, in summary, that the platelets or the CXCL4, they induce MDSC, that MDSC inhibits CD8 T cell function, and through that, they were able to regulate metastasis. So um, I'm just going to skip these slides um, in the interest of time. So in summary, this part, the tumor cells, they are inhibited by CD8 T cells and CD8 T cells also inhibit platelet function. Um, under that scenario, you have no metastasis. But at uh, some point later, this platelets find a way to survive. Now those platelets convert monocytes into this myeloid derived suppressor cells. They are immune suppressive cells. They inhibit CD8 T cell function. Now, when you inhibit CDA T cells, the tumor cells are able to metastasize to distant site. So, and uh, this is also, we have tested in a clinical setting and you can find this in the paper, uh, which just came out in British Journal of Cancer. So what we are doing in the lab is that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this epithelial mesenchymal spectrum or plasticity, you, you say, um, which is happening most of the time. So cell lose plasticity once reach a particular stage. And then, but we are asking at what stage the cells are losing uh, plasticity. And if they have a plasticity, how such a cell interacts with the tumor microenvironment where your fibroblast, neuron, myoepithelial cell, et cetera, uh, present. And then how these cells are also interacting with the tumor immune microenvironment. Together, how are they regulating the metastatic uh, cascade or metast metastasis? So we have a number of tools in the lab. Uh, we have this Rhapsody, 
uh, which kind of allows us to characterize these uh, tumor cells at a single cell level. Um, so in fact, for example, we are right now doing a, a working with a, a, another colleague, uh, Vivek Subaya, where he's treating patients with a RET inhibitor and we are collecting a tumor tissue uh, before treatment, mid-treatment, post-treatment. We are asking what kind of single cell level signature are present before treatment. And when you give a RET inhibitor, even though these patients do have a RET mutation, the entire tumor don't shrink. It's, you see only 40 to 50%. And what are those remaining 40 to 50%? They don't respond. So we can study that by doing this uh, single cell sequencing. So the second approach, we are taking something called spatial transcriptomics, where you can look at a tumor and see you know, what you have here, what you have here, and this spatial orientation, how, what kind of lesson it can teach us. And this is a, a site of data, which we have done in the lab, um, looking at uh, these two tumor models I was mentioning earlier, 67 NR and 41. And you can see the CD8, which is shown in yellow, clearly present in 67 NR, the non-metastatic tumor. Once the tumor become highly metastatic, or the 41, which is fully metastatic, and you see they have hardly any CD8 T cells, which is also quantified here. And we are looking at such an approach uh, to study this further. We are also using a, a multiplex immunofluorescence where you get a higher resolution. Here is a immunomodulatory subtype of breast cancer. It's a basal-like subtype of breast cancer. You see the tumor cells and the microenvironment are separating. And uh, in M subtype, and you have, a, a, again, tumor cells having a more uh, the positive cells. So in other words, we are using this various uh, uh, image-based analysis as well as transcriptomics to understand this heterogeneity and their contribution to the biology of metastasis. Finally, um, you know, I think uh, you know, EMT program play a regular uh, central role in regulating metastasis. And uh, these uh, program induces stem cell properties on differentiated epithelial cells. Um, we are trying to target EMT and, uh, and then we are able to prevent or uh, block metastasis, but I didn't show you those data. Um, we believe now epithelial mesenchymal plasticity, but not EMT, um, uh, is kind of associated with the hybrid cells and they are the key player in metastasis. So through the pseudo time analysis, we kind of found some signaling cascade. We are characterizing them further. And it's interesting that cell division is critical and we're trying to find out um, what that could be uh, the, the key regulator. Uh, can we use that as a potential diagnostic and therapeutic site? And again, um, this is a, um, I, I collaborate with various folks, including uh, Peter Davis and Cliff uh, uh, from uh, uh, Texas A&M. And here, here is all the names are given. And uh, here is my lab um, and we have funding support from various groups. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a member of a T32 and, uh, you know, we have a, a, a couple of openings in T32 and, uh, you know, if a, a postdoc, if anyone is interested um, um, in, in, in looking for a postdoc, um, but particularly you should have a citizenship for a T32 um, so that, you know, they could also apply to my lab. So finally, we have generated a tool, a guy with the name Suhas Vaseker who was in my lab as a postdoc. Now he's in a, a Allen Institute. Uh, he generated this platform called EMTOM. Anybody can go and plug in your gene of interest um, and then study how uh, its interaction with various um, uh, program. So with that, um, I thank you, uh, Tapashri and the, and, the, and the organizers for giving me a chance and I'm open to take questions. Thank you, Mani. Wonderful talk. Anyone has any question? Maybe I'm going to start. So, Mani, uh, okay, yeah, uh, please, Kamlesh Yadav. Yes, please. You can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mani. That was a really excellent talk. Um, I have a question about the, the cell division blockade that you showed that prevents uh, metastasis by. Um, having a simultaneous induction, induction through TGF beta one. Um, have you tried that therapeutically with any inhibitors that block cell division? Does that work as well, or is it specific for the inhibitor that you used? So, you know, uh, we used various cell division block uh, uh, inhibitors. Um, my uh, the Petra Den Halander, she tried many, they all work but in an experimental setting, right? This is just, a, uh, we just, we have not even published it. Um, so we are working on it. 
I think that's the line we are going and uh, trying to see how uh, we can use this information um, to particularly block the stemness, uh, gaining stemness. And if you can inhibit uh, differentiated cells um, using a, your cell division block and then um, prevent uh, the cells becoming a more uh, uh, stem-like, and then um, that would be spectacular. So we are doing that. We are working with clinicians, particularly those who are conducting a clinical trial um, and see whether we could uh, get more data and then firm our hypothesis. It's kind of an experimental setting at this point. So the idea here um, with the question was that um, if you can parse out the signaling patterns that are involved in this process. And so if this is upstream, say for example, if you have DNA damage and it's uh, 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 it's an inhibition of the apoptosis pathway or the DNA damage pathway where the cell division cannot proceed and the cell decides to die. Can you leverage that? Or is it a, a process which has to be intact and cell division is occurring and now the spindles cannot be uh, 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 form, cannot for, help form uh, daughter cells? And if you block there, then only it works. So, so there's a slight difference in, in and so it's really critical uh, where, uh, where how you identify and that would help you identify whether a person with say DNA damage pathway uh, 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 can have a better non-metastasis as a long-term outcome versus somebody who does not. You know, I, I think you're point on, like, and it's, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, that's uh, something, uh, again, this is, um, uh, we are just, uh, you know, fascinated that we never thought that, uh, you know, the cell division would make a huge impact, but it does. But then therapeutically, um, uh, it's going to be challenging as well, you know, translating this finding uh, clinically, it's going to be challenging um, because, uh, again, you know, is it a P53 dependent? Is it a DNA? How the DNA damaging agent, agent is going to work? Uh, we know loss of P53 is necessary for cells to gain stemness. So, which means, so is it the P53 function which is affected here? Um, is, it, um, uh, is it happening in a, in a cell type dependent manner or it doesn't matter any cell will have the same. So the number of questions need to be answered. And, um, you know, I don't have an answer for many things at this point. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you. No, really, really appreciate it. There's a question here in the chat. Yes. yes. So Dr. Giovanni Parmigiani, he said, uh, thank you, Mani. Very interesting presentation. What do you consider to be the most important challenges for statistical or mathematical tools in your area? Thank you. That's, uh, you know, Trust me, the one other thing we have been struggling is looking for experts in these two areas, bioinformatics, mathematical, statistical. You know, there are not many. You know, the thing is, um, you know, you are, for whatever reason, when you are studying, uh, at least when I was studying, uh, the mathematicians are separated from a biologist. And if you are a biologist, you know, you don't like mathematics and physics, or if you're a physics or a mathematician, you know, you are not a big fan of biology, but that's not the case. You know, all three has to be merged together. Um, we have been struggling. So I worked with a group in Canada in Fields Mathematical Institute. Uh, we have a papers together and uh, they used to organize meeting every year. Um, I used to be part of the team. And Herbie Levin is another best example. Uh, with By collaborating with him, we have we were able to uncover quite a lot of information. He's a physics professor. Um, so we need statistician and mathematician and these tools to help us uncover or understand the biology, it's, I would say, the utmost important at this point, you know, which is 50%, if you say clinical um, or experimental, we need a 50% help from you folks um, to help us understand um, our data and probably help us predict the next step. You know, we ba predict based on Experiment, it takes ages. By the time we hypothesize, we test our hypothesis, uh, you know, we are almost half, a, half, you know, half the year gone, but you may be able to do it faster. We need it, we need it. I, I cannot stress that enough. Um, it's one of the most, most critical need of the hour. Uh, another question, Reiki New, thank you for an amazing talk. Could you please comment on where the field is at in terms of scoring the EMT process? Thank you. Um, so there are people are writing a, a score, EMP score, um, which is fine. But now, you know, if you imagine a tumor, right? In a tumor, you can have the whole tumor being mesenchymal 
or some cells being mesenchymal, some cells are epithelial. And those some cells which are being mesenchymal could be fully mesenchymal or in a hybrid. So when you take an RNA-seq based approach, while you can score for a presence of EMT, while that's going to tell you something, but it's not going to give you the complete picture. The point what we want to know is that, is there an EMT program? Is that EMT program or the score happens at a cellular level? And is that partial EMT or complete EMT? So this is where we need an imaging based, bioinformatic based, um, mathematical modeling based approach to look for such a, an evidence and then associating that with a clinical outcome. We need that. Kayla Perich, this presentation was so amazing, so interesting. I am an undergrad student and I am curious as to how you begin to study the biology of the EMT pathway and just how you begin to do research in this field. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, that's, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I was just talking to somebody. Um, I, I did my PhD again in India. Um, so then I was uh, looking for a postdoc and I saw Bob Weinberg. He came to give a talk. So I approached Bob, I told him I want to join his lab. And uh, I just told him what I worked on. So one of the things what happened was, this is, you know, I, I would say I'm one of the most lucky guy. Um, so I, Bob said, he was going to talk to me. And then in India, it's kind of a hierarchical system, the professor rules. So another professor came to Bob and said, Bob, uh, can I take you to my lab for a few minutes? And uh, Bob said, Mani, sorry, I can't do anything. I will go and talk to him and come back. And uh, they went, they left. Um, and Bob said, wait here. So I was waiting. But they came back after a few hours. Um, I was still in the same place. So he was impressed. And he said, okay, fine. You know, he, he asked me, I said, there's only one thing which I, uh, I cannot, is I cannot give up. Um, so therefore, uh, just for that, he said he hired me. And later when he came to the lab, he told somebody in the lab that I don't know whether I, you know, I hired this guy, I don't know whether he will make it, but you know, I'm giving him a chance. So when I joined the lab, again, the reason I'm saying that is that one of the quality, which in my opinion, you all should have is not give up, right? You should ask yourself what you like. If you like something, don't give up. You know, there are, you may hear hundred no's, and then but then all you need is a one yes, right? Or, so, so I came to the lab, I worked. Uh, the way I always look at a problem is, you know, I, I, I was about to quit Weinberg lab, at least I would say 20 or 30 times. But all the time I told myself that, you know, it's, it's a gift to be in Bob's lab. Why don't I tell myself I'm a technician in Bob's lab rather than tell myself I'm a postdoc in Bob Weinberg lab? Right. So then when I, the minute I downgraded myself to a technician, I was happy. It's okay. That's good enough. Um, I am able to survive. Even if I fail, I'm okay. But then I continued on my problem. So you have to look for an opportunity. Um, again, you know, uh, that environment is completely different. Um, I was sitting in a, in a, in a meeting where a guy from a Rudolf Anish lab um, he was presenting a data, this is 2004. Um, he was presenting a data saying he could take a tail fibroblast from a mice, reprogram them into embryonic stem cells using DNMT3B by overexpressing or knocking down, I forgot what it was. So I was just, and he said the efficiency was 0.01%. Okay, this is before uh, Yamanaka protocol was discovered. And uh, when you induce an EMT, what happens? I was unable to overexpress a gene called Fox I was studying. Every cell I express, every cell dies. There are some few cells survive. I was just sitting and thinking, maybe I'm having a similar lower frequency of activation. I am also making them becoming a stem cells, but um, I'm not looking into it carefully. So that idea clicked in that room. Okay. So then I went up. I don't know how to do a fax even today, honestly. Okay, so there was a guy in the Weinberg lab, Mai Jing Leo, he's genius, expert on uh, fax analysis. I said, hey, Mai Jing, can you please uh, do a fax analysis for me for XYZ marker and then see whether the cells are undergoing EMT becoming a stem cells? He said, sure money. So he went and test the, did a fax analysis 
came, came back jumping. He said, what you said is true. And that changed my life, right? So again, it's, you should always run your problem, any problem what you have in parallel with what is going on. You know, you should never sit in a conference or a meeting thinking that I have nothing to do with this work. Therefore, it's not my problem. No, you should run your problem in parallel. So that really helped me in a second level. And, you know, as Tapasri said, that paper has been cited 8,600 times. It's, it's changed my life. Um, and Bob Weinberg, well, what he, you know, even though he said that I don't know whether he will survive, now my paper ranks number one among all the paper he published in his entire career based on citation, right? So the, the thing which I would tell you is that look for a problem. Don't look for a fancy problem. Look for an important problem. And then don't give up. You may fail, right? but you will succeed. Uh, but if you fail, if you say I'm failed and you just sit there and do nothing, you will fail, right? But you have to constantly try. So that's the way I got into the cancer biology. I knew nothing about cancer biology when I came to Bob Weinberg lab, okay? I was working on some transcriptional regulation of some gene uh, for my PhD. I knew nothing, didn't know what is telomerase until I met Bob. So, so that's the way I got into cancer biology and here I am. So Mani, can I ask you a follow-up question uh, from our students have? So we have a lot of very bright undergraduate students in biology, statistics, medical school. So do you have some opportunities where undergraduate research program, they can apply in your lab sometime, like, you know, and work with you to get a hand-on experience, uh, like a summer kind of things we are talking about, so that they can grow their career in this field, this exciting, outstanding talk. I think a lot of people are already influenced, a lot of our students, that's why I'm asking. Absolutely. You know, every year uh, we have, a, the last summer I had at least maybe six undergrads in my lab. Um, and uh, there's one girl, uh, um, she wants to come back for the whole year. And I said, sure. You know, and you know, she's really passionate about it. Um, we, uh, you know, there is a, you can directly write to me if you're really passionate about it. Um, there is also uh, in our department, we have something called ITERTS, um, um, undergraduate program, you can apply, you can, um, some people even, some, you know, you may even get paid. Um, you can work for a credit. Um, so, you know, we, I, I believe you guys are the future, you know, I, every undergrad, one of the undergrad, while I was at MIT, she contributed more to one of my paper than what I contributed. So, so I, I, I think, uh, I think uh, you're more than welcome to communicate. Many before end, I, I have a quick question, um, and there, there are there will be many more questions are coming, and please, uh, if you possible, please answer those chats. But I have a quick question. So when you are uh, saying that Petra's uh, data, uh, her data showed that when you are withdrawing TGA beta, it's going back to the epithelial state. So what happened to the marker, stem cell marker? Is it like they are losing? All goes down. They go back. All go back, and the stem cell marker goes back, and uh, the type of cell division goes back. Yeah. And um, it's they revert back to epithelial. But if you take a cell, if you chronically expose them for a month with the TGA beta one, yeah, okay, then they enter into the locked the mesenchymal state. They cannot revert back. Okay, so in that case, so they are not uh, playing any role in metastasis, right? You said that those cells correct. Cannot... So, so we have a data now, right. which is not published again. Right. If you have an epithelial non-metastatic, you have an extreme mesenchymal non-metastatic. Only when they are in the middle, they are metastatic. So when uh, Andrew Ewald, uh, his paper said that e catherin is important for metastasis. So when you are saying that the, you are targeting EMT, so are you targeting on the EMT genes or e catherin is one of those which is also in your mind? So e catherin is a marker. But right. uh, so we are trying to target signaling pathway. You know, one of the things, as you know, um, when Steve was in the lab, he was looking at a P38 pathway. Right. Um, PLK1, P38, there's a number of signaling pathway which feeds into EMT program. And we have another small molecule inhibitor, um, you know, uh, which inhibits vimentin specifically. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but in an epithelial cell, not in fibroblast. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, so that's the kind of thing we're looking at. Thank you so much. Uh, so there are a few questions probably here, if you possible, please answer. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think Raquel is going to be, you can introduce the next speaker. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. 
Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, all right, so it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Kirsten Bryant, who's an assistant uh, professor in the Department of Pharmacology at UNC Chapel Hill, where um, she's been in that role since 2018. She also did her postdoctoral training at UNC at the Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center with Dr. Channing Durr, and she um, did her PhD at Cornell. Dr. Bryant's research uh, focuses on understanding mechanisms by which the KRAS oncogene regulates uh, metabolism and metabolic processes that drive pancreatic cancer. Um, she discovered that suppression of KRAS increases autophagic flux, and that work has led her to investigate um, therapeutic approaches that target autophagy for treatment of pancreatic cancer as well as cancers. As a young PI, she's very well funded, including an R37 Merit Award from the NIH uh, National Cancer Institute and a prestigious uh, American Association of Cancer Research Pancreatic Cancer, and Can Pancreatic cancer Action Network um, Pathway to Leadership Grant. Um, so that's very impressive. She's already earned multiple awards, most recently being recognized as one of the rising stars of cancer metabolism and signaling by the New York Academy of Sciences. She's also passionate about mentoring, community outreach, and cancer patient advocacy, and we're so excited that she was able to join us. So welcome, Kirsten. Thank you so much for that introduction and for the um, invitation today. I'm gonna quick share my screen. All right, can everyone see that okay? All right, fantastic. Well, thank you again for the introduction and the invitation today. Um, I apologize a little bit for my voice. Uh, my, my little boy started kindergarten last week and brought a cold home. But I have two drinks here and I think we'll make it through. So today I'm going to be speaking about combination approaches for targeting rash-driven metabolic alterations in pancreatic cancer. So our lab is interested in targeting the RAS pathway for pancreatic cancer research. Um, pancreatic cancer, the, the predominant mutation that drives pancreatic cancer is RAS oncogene mutation. 90 to 97% of patients have a RAS mutation. However, because um, direct RAS inhibitors have not have been hard to develop, we have focused our efforts on inhibiting downstream pathways that RAS regulates. However, if you follow the field, you may be thinking to yourself that we actually just recently do have RAS inhibitors. This is true. So Sodorasib, the first RAS inhibitor, was approved by the FDA just this past June. However, um, this inhibitor and others that have been developed so far specifically target mutant RAS in which the hotspot glycine 12 has been mutated to a cysteine. While G12C mutations make up 14% of the total RAS mutations in all human cancers, this frequency comes mainly from lung cancer. 30% of lung cancer patients harbor a RAS mutation. And of those RAS mutations, 52% are G12C mutations. Unfortunately, when we look at pancreatic cancer, while 97% of patients have a RAS mutation and 93% of those patients have um, a G12 mutation, only a total of 2% of pancreatic cancer patients have a G12C mutation. Therefore, targeting RAS-regulated pathways is still our best bet for PDAC patients. And today I'm going to start my talk by discussing some published work on how um, these three strategies here all converge on the process of autophagy. And then after we get through that, I'm going to transition into ways that we're trying to improve this ERK map kinase and autophagy inhibition combination for pancreatic cancer therapy. So at this point, it's well accepted that um, RAS signaling alters the metabolic state of PDAC. Mutant KRAS has been linked to upregulated glycolysis in general, just upregulated glucose uptake, as well as the differential channeling of glycolytic intermediates into the non-oxidative pentose phosphate pathway, 
as well as the hexosamine biosynthesis pathway. Mutant KRAS has been associated with the differential utilization of glutamine, as well as the upregulation of nutrient recycling and scavenging pathways. Today, I'm going to focus on the metabolic process of autophagy, which is literally cellular self-eating in times of nutrient stress. So at the time that I entered the field, autophagy had been implicated in sustaining the tumorigenic growth of PDAC. This is work that primarily came out of Alec Kimmelman's lab, as well as Eileen White's lab, starting in about 2011. Pancreatic cancer primary tumors and cell lines had been shown to have upregulated levels of autophagy and inhibition of autophagy, either genetically in mouse models or by pharmacological means had been shown to um, cause tumor regressions as well as prolonged survival in genetic mouse models of PDAC. So approaching this um, question, approaching the autophagy field from a RAS lab, we started with a very simple hypothesis. If many patients harbor a RAS mutation and many PDAC patients and PDAC had been shown to be dependent on autophagy, Perhaps it was KRAS signaling that was driving this upregulated autophagy in um, KRAS mutant PDAC. And therefore, we hypothesized that loss of KRAS would impair autophagy. I'm just going to take a moment to describe a tool that's going to be used throughout a number of slides in this talk. And this is um, this tandem autophagic flux reporter that we use. So what we're doing here is we're looking at cells that are stably overexpressing an LC3B protein. This is an autophagosome associated protein that's tagged with an M-cherry and an EGFP. So when this construct localizes to the autophagosome, you will see both the EGFP and M-cherry fluorescence. When an autophagosome fuses with a lysosome, which is acidic, that acidic pH will quench the EGFP fluorescence and leave you just with the M-cherry fluorescence. So therefore the ratio of M-cherry to EGFP is read out as um, a method to monitor autophagic flux, whereas a higher ratio is associated with more autophagic flux. So what I'm showing you here is our very first um, experiment that disproved our hypothesis, because when we knock down KRAS, in a panel of our PDAC cell lines, we did not see a loss of autophagic flux. We actually saw the opposite. We saw a further enhancement in flux. And as I mentioned, we saw this across a broad panel of human PDAC cell lines using siRNA. We also used a, um, an early um, RAS inhibitor in the one G12C mutant um, PDAC cell line that we had at the time and could recapitulate this effect, increase flux in when G, RAS G12C was pharmacologically inhibited. And then we also used a, a dox-inducible mouse model that was described by the Depina lab, where when you withdraw doxycycline, you lose RAS expression. And we saw that when we silenced RAS expression in cell lines derived from this mouse model, we also saw this increase in autophagic flux. Now, as I mentioned, not many um, PDAC patients have a G12C mutation, and we would like to have our work have a translational impact. So we looked further downstream at nodes in the MAP kinase pathways that we did have pharmacological inhibitors for. So what I'm showing you here is when we inhibit ERK, which is downstream of RAS, this recapitulates this increase in autophagic flux. So again, across this panel of cell lines, increased flux when we treat with an ERK inhibitor. And we also saw this in the IKRAS mouse model. And so we um, scrapped our initial hypothesis, but this was still exciting to us. And we postulated that perhaps loss of KRAS or ERK signaling leads to an increased dependency on autophagy. And because, um, therefore, because we can target autophagy, perhaps concurrent inhibition of both ERK and autophagy 
would increase, would decrease um, cell viability and proliferation. Um, and this is exactly what we saw. So what we're going to be using here is our autophagy inhibitor is chloroquine. Um, this is, there are no FDA approved specific inhibitors of autophagy. What chloroquine is, is a nonspecific inhibitor of lysosomal acidification. But because autophagy culminates in the lysosome, um, inhibition of lysosomal acidification um, blocks autophagy. And so when we treated with a combination of our ERK inhibitor plus an autophagy inhibitor in a panel of our PDAC cell lines, we saw a shift in the dose response curve. To calculate synergy, excuse me, we used a mathematical model called combination index, where a combination index of less than one is indicative of a synergistic interaction. And we treated a panel of cell lines across a range of ERK inhibitor concentrations. And you can see that many of these um, combinations fall within the synergistic range. Moving out of 2D cell culture, we showed that this also occurred in 3D organoid models of PDAC, looking again at our ERK and fluoroquine combination. And we showed this at a variety of different nodes of the ERK map kinase cascade. This synergy was not only observed with ERK inhibition, but also MEK inhibition, RAF inhibition, and like I, and with this um, RAS, early RAS inhibitor. Finally, this also um, translated into PDX models of pancreatic cancer. So here we're looking at a xenograft mouse model that was treated with hydroxychloroquine and ERK inhibitor alone, as well as the combination. And we observed a decrease in tumor weight, which you can see here in the, the images of the tumors as well. And we also observed increased survival. So when this study was published in, in 2019, um, while we were assembling the manuscript, we learned that another group had uh, very similar observations to ours at a conference, and we actually published side by side. And at that same time, we also learned that um, a group at the RAS initiative at the NCI had similar observations. Um, so these three studies, focusing our study focusing on ERK, this one focusing on MEK, and this one focusing on RAF, all demonstrated that inhibition of this pathway synergized with autophagy inhibition. And this has somewhat led to a resurgence in interest in targeting the autophagy pathway for cancer treatment. This is evidenced by a number of clinical trials that have been established to um, test this combination, um, both looking at ERK and MEK inhibitors, um, two of which we're happy to be involved in, one in, combo in collaboration with MD Anderson, as well as one here at UNC looking at an ERK inhibitor and hydroxychloroquine. So as we're um, of course, very excited to see what the outcome of these trials are. Um, moving forward, we know that there are ways that we can improve upon this combination. And so that's what I'd like to spend the rest of my time today talking to you about, some um, newer unpublished data about how we're hoping to improve actually both sides of this combination. And first, I'd like to talk about ways of potentially improving the ERK inhibitor side and identifying potentially new or additional sensitizers to autophagy inhibition. So the way that we um, came about, came at this question is in a very unbiased approach. So what we did was we performed a large chemical library screen, actually targeting multiple nodes of um, the RAS signaling pathway. So downstream of RAS, um, there, I just focus primarily on the RAF mec erk pathway. Um, PI3 kinase is also downstream of RAS. And these two pathways, although there are multiple pathways that emanate from the RAS protein, these are the two that are most um, implicated in playing a role in driving cancer. And so what we did was we targeted each node um, specifically with a specific inhibitor in combination with a chemical library 
of oncology related compounds. So this, these experiments are called drug sensitivity and resistance testing. And it contains a library of 525 different um, pharmacological compounds that we looked at in combination with each of these RAS pathway inhibitors. I should note that we did not do this ourselves. We did this in collaboration with Krista Warnerberg's lab when they were at the FIM, now at the University of Copenhagen. Some interesting things about this screen is that we did both a viability screen using real-time glow as well as a cytotoxicity screen. We're particularly interested in combinations that are going to, because ERK inhibition alone or RAF inhibition or MEK inhibition is primarily cytostatic, we're interested in developing combinations that switch this into a cytotoxic therapy. In addition to doing two different types of screens, we also assayed a large number of pancreatic cancer cell lines. So we looked at 18 different KRAS mutant PDAC cell lines, as well as two um, mouse PDAC cell lines that are KRAS mutant, as well as a normal um, pancreatic cancer cell line as well. And what we were trying to get out there is we know that there's a lot of genetic heterogeneity in pancreatic cancer. And so we were aiming to try to sample that heterogeneity and look for trends that um, held true in at least a substantial portion of the cell lines tested. So how are we reading out these screens? Um, what we're calculating is something called uh, Delta DSS. And where does that come from? So we'll be performing two dose response assays. The first, each one is called a drug sensitive, generates a drug sensitivity score or DSS. And so we would look at one of the 525 compounds alone. And what this curve that I'm showing you here as an example is a cytotoxicity curve. So you see as the concentrations increase, cytotoxicity increases. And then we look at that, that drug from the library in combination with one of our primary pathway inhibitors. And we look at the, the difference between these two curves. If it shifts in this direction, the drug plus the um, primary inhibitor increases cytotoxicity. So this would have a positive Delta DSS score. Across our screen, we defined a hit as something that causes a greater than five-fold change in the Delta DSS in more than five cell lines. Okay, so now looking at a little bit of the data that we um, generated, I just wanted to share some, some big picture um, observations that we've had with the screen so far, and then dive into a little bit more of the specific data as well. First, we observed, as we expected, after doing a number of large-scale cell line screens, we consistently observed significant cell line heterogeneity. Um, there were many more combinations observed for the raf mec erc pathway than for the PI3 kinase pathway. And we were pleased to see that we saw significant overlap with this screen with some of our other CRISPR and um, siRNA-based genetic screens. So diving in a little bit more into the data, when we considered the MAP kinase pathway, so looking at RAF, MEC, and ERK combinations, um, we observed synergy with 100 different inhibitors out of the chemical library. This was significantly more than the 34 synergistic hits that we observed within the PI3 kinase pathway. And so our lab for some time has focused on the raf mec erc pathway as um, perhaps the most important for driving RAS signaling, and this is something that was further supported by this screen. Another thing that was supported by the screen was that um, a, the biggest hit class in the erc map kinase pathway screen are members of the PI3 AKT mTOR pathway. This is well established that inhibition of these two pathways is particularly synergistic, and that was observed in our screen as well. Something that surprised us much more was the second biggest um, class of hits, and that was other MAP kinase pathways aside from the node that we had directly inhibited. And so 
And that's what I'm gonna go through in very briefly over the next few slides, just to give you an idea about what this data looked like. So if we looked across all the hits that we got here, we're looking at the ERK inhibitor screen, we saw a large number of RAF and MEK inhibitors hit, but we did not observe other ERK inhibitors. When we look at the RAF inhibitor screen, I'd like to point out that this is the node that had the most synergistic combinations, and we saw large amounts of synergy with other MEK and ERK inhibitors. And finally, when we look at the MEK screen, again, a large number of synergistic hits within with RAF and ERK inhibitors. And so that's summarized here. And what I hope that this conveys to you is that some of our most effective combinations involve inhibitors of the other two nodes in the MAP kinase pathway, separate from the one that we were directly targeting. So this is now part of a story that was just published last year, and I'm just gonna highlight just a tiny bit of the data just to show that we could recapitulate these results in-house. This We focused on RAF and ERK inhibition for the paper, and I'm showing you here that this is a dramatically synergistic combination. And because we focused on things that were synergistic in terms of cytotoxicity, this is a common annexin-5 apoptosis assay, and you can see that this combination is robustly synergistic in terms of inducing apoptosis. And so as I mentioned, this, this was recently published and I would recommend anyone who's interested to check out the publication. But our conclusion was that whereas single agent inhibition of this cascade has been shown to be ineffective due to loss of ERK dependent negative feedback mechanisms, our evidence shows that the dual targeting of both RAF and ERK, while it does um, still stimulate compensatory mechanisms, it's refractory to these mechanisms um, and it consequentially achieves much greater pathway suppression. Another piece of work that's still ongoing in the lab, I mentioned this vertical inhibition was a big hit from this screen. We also had other classes of inhibitors um, that were particularly synergistic with MEK, RAF, or ERK inhibition. And so we're currently working on understanding the mechanism behind these synergies with HDAC inhibitors, HSP90 inhibitors, and tubulin inhibitors. And so in conclusion, what we've shown is we can improve just um, single node ERK inhibition by vertical inhibition of this pathway by the addition of a RAF inhibitor. What I'd like to focus on for the last little vignette of this talk is ways in which we would like to improve upon the HCQ half of our combination. To do that, I'm gonna to have to give a little bit of an introduction into the autophagy pathway. And so what, I, what I'm just showing you here is a few of the key players. So major nutrient sensor, sensors in the cell, AMPK and mTOR regulate the autophagy pathway which is initiated upon OLK activation. This results in the recruitment of a nucleation compact, complex that includes VPS34 and Becklin, and that begins to nucleate an autophagosome um, assembly, which then matures um, surrounding um, the cytoplasmic contents. Once a mature autophagosome has formed, it fuses with the lysosome, and this results in an autophago lysosome and contents are degraded and recycled. I mentioned previously that we focused on um, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. These are general um, lysosomal inhibitors. However, there are a number of tool compounds now that have been developed for upstream portions of the autophagy pathway. While they're not FDA approved, they allow us to um, study inhibition of the autophagy pathway specifically. So to look for additional sensitizer to, sensitizers to autophagy inhibition, we performed a CRISPR-Cas9 loss of function screen that targets 2,240 genes that represent major cancer signaling networks. We call this our um, druggable genome library. 
just very briefly how these screens are done. Um, we infect cell, we, we generate lentivirus expressing our library, infect cells, and then grow them up and apply different pharmacological agents and compare to a DMSO control. We look for, um, we then perform desequencing and anal analyze barcodes to understand what um, constructs are enhanced or lost following two to four weeks of culture. Um, we use magic analysis to quantify our sgRNA abundances and then perform gene set analysis to rank genes by their magic beta score, which you can think of similar to full change. And so what I'm showing you here is um, a volcano plot of our hits from DMSO treated cells from this druggable genome library. As you can see, there are many more sensitizers, genes that when lost reduce growth than genes that um, enhance growth. That would be expected as these are um, all genes that have been targeted for cancer treatment, so that made sense. Um, what I'm showing here in orange though, are specifically autophagy related genes. And this was a, we, the, the library that we used only contains um, 72 autophagy related genes. It really wasn't something that we were intending to focus on. However, we were struck by the fact that of those 72 genes, 27 were depleted in the vehicle treated cells. And this really confirms that um, PDEC cells are reliant on autophagy for proliferation. Interestingly, when we looked at our chloroquine treated cells, um, a number of those autophagy related genes were maintained. And what I, and so this made us think about um, the story that I just talked to you about, vertical inhibition of the MAP kinase pathway. Here we're treating with a terminal inhibitor of the autophagy pathway and pulling out upstream um, genes that regulate autophagy. Particularly this, this hit here, VPS34 stuck out to us as there are VPS34 inhibitors to look at. And so that's what I'm showing you here, validation of the screen pharmacologically um, in two cell lines, just because that's all that fits in the slide. We've done these studies in six so far. And I'm showing you here that um, chloroquine and this VPS34 inhibitor, SAR405, um, are a synergistic combination. As I mentioned previously, we have other inhibitors of other upstream um, pathway components in the autophagy pathway. So we also see this synergy when we treat with an ULK inhibitor in chloroquine. And just looking at upstream um, pathway inhibitors alone, we also see synergy looking at an ULK inhibitor and a VPS34 inhibitor. Thinking a little bit about mechanism, um, going back to our autophagic flux reporter, what we can show is that dual inhibition of the autophagy pathway can actually reduce flux more than one inhibitor is capable of by itself. So what we're doing here is using a flow assay to read out flux, and we're using the ERK inhibitor as a tool basically to induce flux in our system. You can see ULK inhibition can reduce the flux that's, re that's induced by a NERC inhibitor, as can chloroquine. But we can, when we combine ULK inhibitor and chloroquine together, we can have a further reduction of autophagic flux. Finally, because we think that um, while autophagy inhibition definitely does um, slow PDAC growth, it doesn't it is incapable of doing it as effectively as an ERK inhibitor. So I think that autophagy inhibition will always have to be used in combination with a MAP kinase inhibitor to have a therapeutic effect. And here what I'm showing you is the triple combination of chloroquine, an ERK inhibitor, and an ULK inhibitor. And as you go across here, there's increasing chloroquine concentration, and I hope you can appreciate a dramatic reduction in growth. We also observe an intensely synergistic relationship among these three components, which we're particularly excited about. And so with that, I'd just like to give you a few key conclusions. Um, I started by summarizing our published work showing that combined ERK and autophagy inhibition 
is a potential therapeutic approach for KRAS unit pancreatic cancer. We've, our group has gone on to show that vertical inhibition of the rat mech erk pathway results in apoptotic cell death as opposed to just um, cytostasis. And that concurrent inhibition renders cells refractory to compensatory ERK reactivation. And finally, some of our most recent work has shown that vertical inhibition of the autophagy pathway more completely inhibits this pathway um, and results in, enhanced, in an enhanced antiproliferative effect. With that, I'd like to thank my group. Um, we're, we're small but mighty, uh, and this is a recent picture. Most of the, the vertical autophagy work that I explained um, is a thesis project from our, my first graduate student, John Deliberty. We function as part of a broader supergroup here with the labs of Channing Durr and Adrian Cox. And so the, um, the vertical inhibition of the MAP kinase pathway was a project that was driven by Rem Doglion and the DSRT screening in general is driven by Craig Goodwin, a postdoc in the lab. I'd like to acknowledge collaborators and my funding and I'd be happy to take any questions that anyone has. That was great, Kirsten, thank you so much. Does anyone have questions? I have a question um, regarding the um, vertical inhibition of the the MEC-ERK pathway. Um, I used to work with PI3 kinase mTOR pathway a lot, and I saw similar things that um, inhibiting, I think um, mTOR with AKT was very, very uh, toxic to the cells. However, when we tried it in mice, it was also very toxic to the mice, which was kind of a surprise to me because I thought it's one pathway, what would it do? Have you tested this in animals? And do you observe any kind of very high toxicities when you do it with the neck erk pathway? Actually, we, we, we have tried it in mouse models um, and, and that's in the cell reports paper actually. And so actually, no, we did not observe very, very much toxicity. We, we hope that although it's hard to translate these um, ideas right now to the clinic, but the hope with vertical inhibition is that you will actually be able to reduce the dose necessary for each node alone, and that may um, be able to help with the cytotoxic effects. We were able to show that in, in mouse models. That's very cool, thank you. Uh, I have a quick question. For your screening, um, you did not use Sotorasib, uh, one of the newly approved uh, RAS inhibitors. Uh, is there a reason? Um, yes, yeah, so the screening that was presented in this talk was performed before there was sotorasib, unfortunately. Um, we've we've re-performed the screen um, with, with uh, new KRAS G12C inhibitors, and I can say that we, we see a, a number of similar observations. So we can see um, vertical inhibition as something that's potentially interesting as well as um, synergies with uh, some of the other classes of inhibitors that we saw for RAF and ERK as well. Thank you. I have a question for you actually. So sure. did you see any um, inhibitors or anything that fed into um, glutamine synthesis or glutamine metabolism because that's known to regulate autophagy in cancer cells through mTOR. So I was just one, I think, I don't know if you were screening on, you know, FDA approved or known exactly. you know, targets, but I think that would be really interesting to see if you had any downstream regulation of glutamine metabolism by ERKs. And that, that might be a, a new, a different way to, to synergize. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100%. So the, that doesn't happen to be a part of our chemical library, because as you said, they're FDA approved drugs. However, in the lab, we're very interested in glutamine utilization in PDAC, and, and we certainly um, are interested exactly in combining um, with our MAP kinase inhibitors along with uh, different inhibitors of the glutamine pathway. Yeah. That'd be cool. Just thinking about the metabolism, you know, aspect of it. So very yeah. nice. It was a really nice talk. Any other questions for Dr. Brian? 
Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you so much for a beautiful talk. Um, glad, so glad you could join us. Um, thank you, Dr. Brown. Nice talk. I hope you feel better soon. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. So our next speaker is Dr. Taru Muranen from Harvard Medical School. She is an assistant professor. She did her PhD from University of Helsinki, uh, Finland, followed by postdoctoral research at Harvard Medical School with Dr. Joan Brew. Uh, she did some notable work over there. She saw uh, inhibition of P3 blindness. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Enter uh, leads to adaptive resistance in matrix attached cancer cells. Uh, she, she also observed that starved epithelial cells uptake extracellular matrix for survival. She has received numerous uh, awards, including AACR Women in Cancer Research Travel Award, Stand Up to Cancer Laura Ziskin Prize for Translational Cancer Research. Her lab is investigating how the stromal cancer tumor microenvironment regulates drug resistance in breast and pancreatic cancer. Areas of her research are investigating how ECM and tumor microenvironment con contributes to drug resistance, identifying therapeutic vulnerabilities in meta metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer and therapy resistance pancreatic cancer, 3D platform to do proteomics and metabolomic studies to gain insight into multiple pathways and mechanisms that cells use when developing drug resistance. Today, her talk will be talking, she'll be talking about the stromal tumor microenvironment's effect on treatment resistance. Welcome thank, to our Thank you for that lovely um, introduction. Um, and let me know if you can see, is it on presentation mode or is it? Yes, it is. Oh. oh, sorry. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. And, and thanks so much uh, for Dr. Bryant for um, introducing pancreatic cancer, because this talk will be focused on, on pancreatic cancer. So I'm going to give you a brief background on what led me into this interest in, in stroma and, and uh, drug resistance. So when I started, oh, there's a little echo. I wish you could um, mute your microphones if they are um, on. So I started with this question, um, how do normal tissues survive transient periods of nutrient starvation? And if we can understand this, uh, could it help us to understand how tumors survive and even thrive under nutrient uh, limiting uh, conditions? And what kind of prompted this research um, was this collaboration when I was still in, in Joan Brugge's lab, I collaborated with Nada Kalani's group here in the Children's Hospital at Boston. And we just wanted to see what happens to normal tissues when you normally fed them. This is the ad lib uh, fed mice uh, or dietary restrict them. And what we saw was quite striking. Uh, we saw these very massive um, collagen deposits shown in blue in the dietary restricted mice. Um, and we saw this in other tissues um, as well. And this is a trichrome staining where you see um, uh, the collagen is, is lit in blue. What we then uh, started to look at, the, what would this matrix uh, proteins be doing? Uh, what would the tumors be doing? Uh, so my previous work was on um, P3 kinase inhibitors and adaptive response to um, uh, mTOR inhibitors. And that's why we were probing BCL2 family proteins um, and uh, other receptor tyrosine kinases, which we had been seen that were upregulated in uh, under mTOR inhibition. And we saw that caloric restriction kind of mimics uh, mTOR inhibition. So would we see similar things in these normal mammary glands? And indeed, what we saw was upregulation of uh, of BCL2 family proteins. But what was very surprising was that we saw an upregulation, a robust upregulation in beta-4 integrin, um, which binds laminin, uh, which is an extracellular matrix protein. So next we wanted to know what, is there any, is it just kind of random chance that they upregulated um, these integrins under caloric restriction and why would that be? So, 
now we switched into an in vitro system. So what we used was MCF10 A cells, which are um, kind of almost normal memory epithelial cells um, that you can grow in 2D. They form these memory asini in 3D. So it's a very nice model system. And what we just simply did, these are growing in 2D and we grew them in normal growth conditions or starved them and, and stained for beta-4 integrin. And beta-4 integrin, what we thought would happen uh, if they would use integrins, which kind of feed, uh, tell the cell about their matrix environment and if things are okay, whether uh, we thought that they would be more at the membrane if they're upregulated, like pushing this survival signaling to the cells, kind of keep thing, keeping them alive. Um, and here's just a normal uh, staining showing, um, let me put this marker on, um, showing it at the membrane. But what is very surprising to us when we looked at the star cells where we saw very high integrin levels, it was mostly intracellular. And that was kind of surprising because integrins are not supposed to be intracellular. Uh, their main function is at the membrane. So we wanted to know whether these integrins that are inside the cells are still functional. Can they bind their, their uh, matrix ligands at the membrane? And to answer that question, um, we uh, fed these um, non-starved and starved cells fluorescently labeled uh, laminin, which is shown in red. And in the non-starved cells, we kept the laminin on for 30 minutes and then uh, looked at where it was. This is confocal microscopy. Uh, in the midsection of the cells. And in the non-starved cells, you see a little bit um, here and there, but which was very uh, obvious in the, um, in the starved cells that it was very rapidly internalized into the cells, suggesting that the beta-4 integrin is indeed active. It goes to the membrane, it grabs the laminin and drags it inside. For what purpose, we did not know at this point, but um, at the time, uh, let me see. At the time, there was a lot of papers coming out about um, macropinocytosis from Daphne Barsagi's lab. And they had shown macropinocytosis is, is a route for protein eating in, especially in KRAS mutant cells that they used to, especially nutrient starved cells, use macropinocytosis. Mm to grab nutrients outside the cells and they just engulf stuff. So we were thinking that maybe in this case, uh, normal cells don't usually use macropinocytosis, but maybe they are using intergen instead to grab matrix proteins and bring them inside the cells because the matrix proteins are, first of all, have amino acids. They are highly glycosylated, so they can provide also glucose to the cells. Maybe the cells are using integrins to grab these laminins to bring them inside and, and uh, destroy them in lysosomes. So a lysosomal marker is here as LAMP1. And that is actually what we saw, that in non-starved cells, um, beta-4 integrin and laminin and LAMP1 was not, they were not particularly well uh, co-localized, but in the starved cells, um, they all co-localized at, at lysosome shown here in yellow and here in uh, quantification. And it has also been shown that macropinocytosis um, increases um, uh, mTOR signaling. So what we next did, we used phosphorus 6 as a marker of active mTOR signaling and, and, and stain it in, in starved cells or cells where we had fed these uh, these MCF spin A cells with laminin. Uh, and we saw a robust increase in, in phosphorus 6, almost at the same level as in the non starved cells. And here again, uh, we quantified that. So, in summary, this is all published and leading to what I then wanted to do in my own lab. In normal growth conditions, these cells uh, stay in a kind of status quo. Uh, state where the fibroblasts are secreting matrix proteins such as laminin and the integrins are in the cell membrane and everything is in, in homeostasis. However, under starvation, uh, what we observed and I haven't talked so far was that the cancer associated or the fibroblast started secreting very high amounts of matrix proteins. And in response, the, the cells, the epithelial cells, 
upregulated their um, integrins, uh, allowing them to grab the matrix proteins and internalize these um, matrix proteins. And this leads, um, they went to endosomes and then into lysosomes, where um, these, uh, we also saw internal uh, amino acids going up uh, when we fed with, with laminin, so suggesting that they do gain um, nutrients from these matrix proteins, and this leads to increased uh, stress tolerance. So then this was published just about time when I, I started my own lab um, here at Beth Israel, and um, we wanted to move back to cancer field um, and wanted to see whether or understand whether starved cancer cells use similar strategies to survive. So there were three questions I had when I, when I started. One was, is starvation linked to stroma abundance in cancer? Um, what are the most matrix abundant cancers? And do these secreted matrix proteins influence therapy efficacy in cancer? And you don't have to think far um, of, of stroma abundant cancers. These are breast and pancreatic cancer. And that is why my lab focuses on these tumors. Um, but the absolute winner of, of stroma abundance in, in cancer is the pancreatic cancer, where up to 95% of the, the tumor can be uh, extracellular matrix proteins. And these tumors are defined by nutrient starvation, desmoplasia, and, and drug resistance. And here are the adjacent normal tissue uh, stained for collagens and hyaluronic acid. Or the tumor tissue, you see this very, very thick stroma uh, surrounding the, the tumor cells. Um, the other thing, this is a little old. Um, the survival odds have gone up, not dramatically, but to 10% now. So the, the five-year survival rate is, is 10%, which is still pretty poor. So this these tumors, as um, Kristen mentioned, is desperately in need of better treatment options and, and also to understand why they are so treatment resistant. So the, um, the fibroblast type in the pancreatic cancer that is responsible for this, this high uh, stroma is uh, pancreatic stellate cell or pancreatic fibroblasts. And they are usually quiet, um, uh, quiescent cells in the periacinar space. However, they can be activated by multiple mechanisms such as ethanol and its metabolites, uh, reactive oxygen species and different cytokines. And once they get activated, they obtain this myofibroblast-like phenotype. They get higher in smooth muscle actin um, staining and they start secreting very high amounts of, of collagen uh, and matrix proteins and also cytokines and chemokines. And then this is kind of a vicious loop because once they start secreting these growth factors and cytokines, it keeps them in this, this activated uh, state. So once you start this process, it is somewhat difficult to reverse it. So we asked, like we had seen in the normal um, mammary fibroblasts, if we starve them, if we starve the pancreatic um, stellate cells, do they start secreting more? Do they get activated by just simple starvation? And the answer was, was yes. And this work was initiated by Vianjana Tapa, who's um, now moved on. Um, she was uh, my first employee, my uh, technician. And the rest of the work is, is, has been done by a very talented uh, postdoc uh, in the lab, Nina Koslova. And what we saw was that just pure serum starvation activates these uh, stellate cells. They start secreting a lot of uh, matrix proteins, their whole phenotype changes. They become much more um, highly um, smooth muscle actin positive. They also start secreting a lot more cytokines and also um, other matrix proteins. These were done with uh, mass spec or cytokine arrays. And all this work is, is unpublished uh, um, because yeah, we are young lab there still. <laughs> Sorry. So next we wanted to know, what if we take media from these um, activated uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts? So a lot of the time we do these experiments by taking conditioned media. So we condition media on these cancer-associated fibroblasts for three to four days, take this media and move it to cancer cells and see what happens. And first we wanted to know, 
does the, the condition media from the fibroblast induce drug resistance? And the answer is yes. If you look at the IC50 curves here in, in blue is the condition media. And here in, in uh, yellow is non-condition media. And with all the um, uh, drug treatments we've tr uh, tried uh, that are frequently used in pancreatic cancer, the calves can stimulate drug resistance um, quite robustly. Next, we did um, kind of, this was a cool experiment. Nobody else wanted to do this, so I did it myself. Uh, where you take uh, cancer-associated fibroblasts, you keep them on a dish, you let them become confluent, and then you keep them for 10 days and feed them every day with high doses of vitamin C. And this um, induces them to secrete a lot of matrix proteins. Um, after the, at the end of the 10 days, you remove the calves kind of carefully and, and very gently wash. And what they leave behind is this mesh of matrix proteins. And now you can uh, plate, you can do all kinds of things with these, these matrices. But what we did, we plated uh, tumor cells on these matrices or matrices derived from uh, tumor cells and saw checked whether these matrices themselves can induce drug resistance. So this is not conditioned media, it's a kind of laid out matrix proteins. And what, what we did observe was that this matrix alone was sufficient uh, to stimulate resistance to chemotherapy in the pancreatic cancer cells. So this was all good and well, but now we wanted to understand what happens in the tumor cells when they see these uh, calf secreted uh, proteins and matrix uh, proteins. How would they become resistant? What is the mechanism? So to do this, we, um, we did reverse phase protein arrays comparing uh, tumor cells that have seen uh, calf conditioned media or non-conditioned media. And this shows just the top um, and these were all treated with gemcitabine. And this shows the top 15 hits uh, from this uh, RPPA screen that was done at MD Anderson. And what was nice, we saw many of the things that we thought would, we would see, uh, like phosphofac and phosphosarc, which are playing a role in the integrin pathway. Um, also, uh, STAT3 is known to be stimulated by um, calves in many different tumor types. But the top hit here was uh, phosphoNDRG1, which we also um, validated by uh, Western blots here. Um, this is uh, just empty media, cancer cell conditioned media, and the stellate cell conditioned media. And in all cases, I mean, the cancer cells also secrete things. So we were, it was not surprising, or it was, yeah, it was expected that they would change things, but it, all, it was always the stellate conditioned media or the calf conditioned media that stimulated this uh, phosphorylation of NDRG1 the highest. We next wanted to know whether we would see, yeah. Oh. We next wanted to see whether we would see similar things in um, patient-derived organoids. So we, um, this was done in collaboration with Santel Motoswami, and their group has been deriving these pancreatic cancer patient-derived organoids from pancreatic cancer patients. And what we did here was um, stimulate these uh, organoids with calf conditioned media and stain them for phosphoNDRG1 or total NDRG1. And we did observe um, that this also happened in, in patient samples. We also um, looked in tissue microarrays uh, from um, pancreatic tumors, uh, whether there would be any correlation with the grade and intensity of either the phosphorylated NDRG1 or the total NDRG1. And what we did uh, observe that both phosphorylated and uh, total NGR, NDRG1 are higher in the, in the tumors than in the normal tissues. And if you look at the total score, it seems to go up um, as the tumors get um, to higher grade. And finally, um, what is NDRG1? Um, at this point, we were kind of interested in what would it be doing and, and would it be important in pancreatic cancer because it definitely seemed to be responding to the calf media and also be upregulated in tumors. This is, um, NDRG1 is called NMIC downstream regulated gene one. Um, it has a controversial role in cancer. Some groups say it's a metastatic suppressor and others say that it is more of an oncogene. 
It is a hypoxia inducible gene. It's involved in stress and hormone responses and in, the tra in, in trafficking. And it might be a prognostic indicator for multiple types of cancers. And um, here's just the schematic of it. It belongs to the um, hydrolase family. However, it has not shown to have any hydrolase activity and the site that should be the hydrolase is mutated. So um, that is, uh, it's an inactive member. And then in the C-terminus, there's uh, these tandem repeats of multiple, uh, and this is where it's most heavily phosphorylated. And what regulates the phosphorylation are, is SGK, AKT, and GSK3. Um, and it's used usually as a marker of SGK activity. So first, we wanted to see whether it would be amplified in tumors, and it is pretty highly amplified in multiple tumors. In pancreatic cancer, it's amplified in 10% of the cases, and it's rarely deleted, which to us would suggest that it might not be a, at least a tumor suppressor, but rather an oncogene. Uh, and its amplification status correlates with poorer overall survival here. Uh, in blue is amplified, in green is non-altered. And it's also up um, at the RNA level in, in pancreatic cancer tumors. And interestingly, this, we also wanted to look at the RNA levels. And this uh, data set is from uh, the Australian pancreatic cancer cohort. They have much more samples that, there than in the, um, in the TCGA data set. And there too, we could see um, that high NDRG1 correlated with poorer overall survival. But what was very interesting to us, they also have this gemcitabine data set there, which is the chemo used in, in pancreatic cancer. And there also, if we look at just the gemcitabine treated uh, patients, the high NDRG1 correlated with, with poorer overall survival. And this kind of made us think that maybe it might be also uh, involved in, in treatment resistance. Next, we wanted to see also what happens upstream. Would it be uh, um, somehow regulated by matrix proteins? And what Nina did first, uh, she did a time course of uh, when does phospho-NDRG1 get act or phospholated um, as you add the conditioned media. And what she noticed was it was kind of delayed kinetics. Usually if you have a very kind of robust kinase cascade, you would assume getting phosphorylation at very early time points. But we only saw it at three hours. And um, given my matrix background, I, I always think that maybe this is an kind of less direct. So maybe it does require integrins or a, a different uh, kind of pathway for activation. So we, we fed these cells, tumor cells, matrix proteins, and those were sufficient. These were purified matrix proteins. Those were sufficient to, to activate NDRG1. And inhibition of, of uh, SARC and FAC that are downstream of integrins um, inhibited this phosphorylation. And also blocking integrin uh, by blocking antibodies was sufficient to, to block this phosphorylation. So we're pretty convinced that the phosphorylation at least happens through integrin uh, activation and, um, and SARC and FAC. And we have data that I'm not showing that this leads to SGK activation. And SGK is in fact the main kinase phosphorylating NDRG1. So what does this do? Would it be important in, in drug resistance? So we did CRISPR-Cas uh, mediated knockdown of NDRG1 and looked at whether this calf condition media can still drive resistance. And here's just the wild type cells with gemcitabine. Uh, the blue lines is the calf condition media. It drives resistance. However, when we knock down NDRG1, this reduces the resistance. So they become sensitive again and the condition media cannot drive resistance anymore. And the way chemo um, works is by often by inflicting DNA damage. So we wanted to see whether these cancer-associated fibroblasts, can they reduce the DNA damage inflicted by chemo? And to do that, we used gamma H2AX foci staining, which is a marker for DNA damage. And as you can see in condition media, there is not as much damage or it is uh, more effectively repaired. 
The other way we wanted to look at, this is a comet assay, which is a single cell electrophoresis assay, and it's an image-based DNA damage assay. And here is just two example images. Intact DNA shows as like a very bright spot in one place because um, when DNA gets damaged, it gets these loops. And as you run it in electrophoresis, you get the loops kind of drag behind. Uh, and that's why uh, the name of the comet assay. And you analyze these by analyzing the intensity of the staining in the head and in the tail. And here's just an example of, of the assay in non-treated cells, um, gemcitabine-treated tumor cells, or gemcitabine-treated tumor cells that uh, were in conditioned media. And here again, the calf conditioned media reduces the DNA damage. And we did the same um, comet assay with uh, NDRG1 knockdown and asked whether knockdown or NDRG1 would increase DNA damage. And that was the case um, with both uh, chemos that we tried, gemcitabine and irinotecan. You get much more of these tails, bigger tails, when you have uh, NDRG1 knockdown. And the other um, experiment that, that Nina set up in the lab is, is called DNA fiber assay. And it's, it's basically, it's, you can um, use this assay to analyze DNA replication and any errors or hindrances that might be happening in, in DNA replication. And it's based, it's an image-based assay. You use two um, different thymidine analogs, um, IDU and uh, chlorodeoxyuridine. Um, and over here. And what you can do is you basically analyze the length of the green fibers. So first you uh, pulse 20 minutes with the, the red thymidine analog, and then you followed by 40 minutes with the green. And what you can see here is if you look at the green fibers, um, you see that in the control cells, they are much longer than in the NDRG1 knockout cells, uh, suggesting that NDRG1 is required for DNA replication. And this assay is nice because you can get the fork speed. So it, it slows down the DNA replication fork. Um, and here are the track lengths. The other way you can use the, the fiber assay is, is to look what happens if you disrupt the fork. And many chemotherapies um, cause um, fork stalling, a replication fork stalling, um, and the cells need to be able to restart the replication forks, otherwise they undergo apoptosis. So the way you do this assay is, again, you first pulse with the red um, thymidine analog, and then you put hydroxyurea that depletes the intracellular DNTP pools and um, acts as a fork staller, and then you wash it out and put IDU again and see uh, whether the forks can uh, resume replication. And here again, you see, if you look at the green um, tracks in NDRG1, these uh, tracks are much, much shorter, suggesting um, that NDRG1 is also required for the restart of, of uh, fork, um, replication forks after stalling. So here's um, we have quantified this. And uh, we've done this also with uh, CRISPR-Cas and rescue constructs and can verify these findings. And the last um, data piece I have, I'm almost done, um, was to look whether, because so far it suggests that NDRG1 is required for um, DNA replication and, and also um, for crystalling or for crystart. But it could be doing it by binding other proteins. It is found in the nucleus, but also in the cytoplasm. So we found, wanted to know whether it would actually be found physically at, the, at DNA and at the replication port. And what we did, uh, or Nina did, was um, set up this IPON method, which is basically you EDU label uh, newly synthesized DNA, uh, and then you cross-link the proteins that were um, kind of in that in those DNA fragments, you permeabilize the cells, you add biotin by clicket reaction to the EDU, and now you sonicate and purify, you can now purify only the EDU labeled DNA, so the newly synthesized DNA. And then you can look what kind of proteins were involved there. 
And the four conditions we have, I'll, I'll show you the data, but I want to walk you through this, is uh, one is a negative control. So you do no biotin labeling, so you should not be pulling anything down. The second uh, scenario is you just pulse with EDU and pull down whatever proteins are there uh, should be in the active replication fork um, and involved in ongoing uh, replication. The third scenario is you pulse with EDU and then you do a thymidine chase. So now you get the labeling in the more mature DNA. So you should get histone uh, and other uh, more mature chromatin elements there. And the fourth condition is you do a, a hydroxyurea chase, which causes fork stalling. And now you should see DNA damage response proteins. And what was very nice that we saw um, uh, phosphorylated NDRG1 and NDRG1 are both um, at the replication forks. They are not really anymore when the DNA matures, but when there is DNA damage and the, the replication forks are stalled, you can see a very robust NDRG1 um, involvement in, in these stalled forks. And the others are just uh, controls for, for this acid. So we are still figuring out um, mechanistically, how does NDRG1 work at the fork? What does it do, how it is involved? Um, but our working hypothesis is that chemotherapy and stress induces these calves to secrete ECM proteins and cytokines. And the cancer cells, when they receive this um, in the presence of chemo, um, they initiate this cascade um, that leads to activation of integrin, SARC, and FAC, SGK activation, and phosphorylation of NDRG1. And NDRG1, in turn, um, is, is required for um, tolerance of DNA damage. I think Max is, Max is not muted. Um, and this leads to tolerance of DNA damage via maintenance of the replication port. And with that, I, um, I'm sorry, I didn't have time to talk about our breast organoid stuff, but um, maybe another time. Um, so all this work has been done um, by Nina Koslova in the lab um, and Bianjana Tapa, who's now um, in New York. And yes, our lab is also small but mighty. Um, and I'd also like to thank all the collaborators and my previous PI, John Boogie, um, for, for their help. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Taru. Anyone has any question? I hope I didn't go too fast. No, no. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't much bioinformatics, unfortunately. <laughs> no, that's so, uh, just a question. I mean, because India G1, it has a role in uh, in another cancer. And I, I think in um, uh, head and neck cancer, and I'm not yeah. sure about the cancer, it has a role in uh, inducing EMT. Uh, by any chance, have you checked in your cell line or that? It's... So we... Um... We haven't actually looked at NDRG one's role, like when we knock it down, we haven't looked at EMT. Uh, however, the tumor lines that we have, one of them is very mesenchymal, one of them is very epithelial, and it seems to be doing similar things in both tumor types. So we don't think EMT is, well, also we haven't looked at like migration and innovation type of assays. So, it might have, but we have not done those experiments that I could say anything. <laughs> right. Hi, Taro, this is Masar. Great talk. Hi, um, thank you. I have a question about this uh, extracellular matrix uh, that the cells are becoming more resistant to gemcitabine and other drugs. And even when you just culture them on the uh, collagen, it, do you think this is that this extracellular matrix is like without any other calves being present? 
is it initiating some signaling events in the cells or do you think cells just physically are hiding better in that extracellular matrix? In this case, they can't hide because the way the experiment is done, the matrix is laid first and then the cells are on top. And then as soon as they adhere, we put the drugs on. So they can't hide. So my thinking is that it is signaling that just makes them more resistant. Um, now, the, I mean, I... I talk about matrix proteins because that's what I love. Um, but in truth, a lot of cytokines and chemokines like TGF beta, they are embedded in the matrix. So even though we wash it, I cannot say that we got out of all the, the cytokines because they might be so well meshed in there. So I think there is a role both for matrix proteins and cytokines. Um, I would not rule it out because as the cells adhere, they secrete MMPs to get break down the matrix. And in that, they might also release cytokines. So it might be other, other signaling pathways than only integrins, which I think is, is likely. Do you think if you just culture these cells on like a collagen, like a recombinant collagen, will they still be resistant or no? I, I didn't show the data, but uh, so that depends. So we didn't culture them on collagen, but what I did, I added um, um, soluble matrix proteins, different kinds, collagen, fibronectin, laminins, and looked at whether they become more resistant or not. And it all depended on what kind of integrins they express. If they had a lot of, let's say, fibronectin binding integrins, fibronectin would make them resistant. Uh, if they had a lot of laminin binding integrins, laminin would make them resistant, but not vice versa. So they, that's why we are kind of backing away from blocking integrins because they are very flexible in there. They can switch which integrins they use, and that makes them resistant to that. So it, it's a little tricky, but but basically, if they are mesenchymal and they have the mesenchymal integrin signature, fibronectin will make them more resistant. I don't know if I answered that, but... <laughs> Thank you. So I have sort of a broad question. Um, I think it's actually fascinating to think about the extracellular matrix, you know, directly really conferring this resistance on the cancer cells. Because I guess I would think about um, immune cell infiltration and all the connections that have been made to that. So um, I know you're using your sort of just co-culture system um, and very beautifully show this direct, you know, effect. But I'm wondering if you've thought about how um, interaction with the immune system might be affected. Um, um, I've, I've tried to stay away from immune cells because I know <laughs> I, I'm, I'm so bad at them, but, <laughs> but I know I'm, I'm kind of being forced in that direction because of all the cytokines we, we have identified. Um, but the, as far as I know, um, immune cells also have very specific integrin profiles and the integrins are also, I think, important in activating or with the, the immune cells. So I do think that the matrix environment has a, a big role on the immune cell function. And pancreatic cancer and breast cancer both are, are known to be very um, like immune deserts, mm -hmm. that deserts, not deserts, deserts. <laughs> um, that that they, they are not very, they're not working very well with immunotherapies um, because the immune cells are kind of kept away or quiescent. Thank you. Just wanted to just speculate, but it was a lovely talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taru. Okay. Is it time for, for Mazar? Okay. So um, it's really an absolute pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Mazar Adli. I've known Mazar since he was a young graduate student in Al Baldwin's lab at UNC Chapel Hill, <laughs> my postdoc. Mazar is currently an associate professor at Northwestern University in the Feinberg School of Medicine. And prior to that, he was at the University of Virginia. Mazar did his postdoctoral work at the Broad Institute and Massachusetts General Hospital Harvard Medical School with Dr. Bradley Bernstein. 
And as a postdoc, he um, uh, was instrumental in establishing new approaches in um, genomics and epigenomic profiling and computational data analyses. Specifically, um, he developed the nanochip seq technology to map whole genome level um, epigenomic, epigenomic mapping in um, limited cell numbers. And he played critical roles in multiple large-scale projects, including the Roadmap Epigenome Mapping Consortium and Cancer Genome Projects. So using these and other um, CRISPR-based cutting-edge um, functional genomic strategies, his lab seeks to understand um, the dynamic gene regulation and 3D organization in normal and malignant contexts to identify and characterize key drivers of cancer, as well as novel therapeutic drug combinations to treat cancer and overcome therapy resistance. Um, he's extremely well-funded, including grants from both NIH, NSF, and private foundation grants. His work's been published and featured in high-impact journals that earn a lot of citations, and we're so happy to have him join us. So welcome, Lazar. Thank you, Raquel. This is a very generous uh, introduction. It's a really pleasure to be um, with you guys. I wish these were in-person meetings but hopefully very soon we will start those. And i also like, like to thank the previous speakers who introduced pancreatic cancer because some of the work that I will present is, is about pancreatic cancer. So it's a pleasure to be with you guys. My lab is generally interested in, in genome regulation. And um, you know, for this one, when I say genome regulation, I want to um, kind of convey that there are at least three layers of regulation in the genome. Um, the regulation at the primary DNA sequence, uh, at the chromatin structure and now at the 3D organization. Of course, with the Human Genome Project, we know quite a big deal about the primary DNA sequence and all the mutations associated with cancer and many other genetic diseases. The chromatin structure is, is, was, is a second layer on top of this genetic information that with the ENCODE and REMC type of projects, we now also map the chromatin in, in various different cell types. I think the 3D organization is one area that is still, um, you know, we don't have a full picture of it, but we, we have now much better tools to study the 3D organization as well. So um, CRISPR has been one of these tools that my lab has been using and, and developing cert to certain aspect to really manipulate all these three different layers of regulation. And, and the talk, my talk will be focused on mostly about CRISPR. No, CRISPR is no longer just a, a genome editing tool. We can do many things with, with CRISPR, you know, the base editing, epigenetic editing, you know, topology editing and chromatin imaging. And my lab has, has uh, applied to CRISPR and developed to a certain extent some of the tools that allows us to, to study all these different layer, layers of regulation. So CRISPR early on was just a wild type and, and, and that Cas9 and new function has been added. This is now completely a multi-tool that you can do many things with, with CRISPR technology. This thing as parent is, is, is a real thing and it is out of stock now. So I guess people really love that. I don't know how they're gonna use this one. But uh, my lab, as I said, we, we published uh, about the different aspects of these kind of technologies. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about CRISPR screenings. Uh, and it's really powerful um, to to interrogate the functional um, consequences of many different genes, all at the same experiment. So I'll talk about the general screenings, and then I'll uh, briefly mention two stories. One uh, about the in vivo screening that we identified a novel tumor suppressor in pancreatic cancer. The other one is again from the in vivo screening that we identified a uh, synthetic little partner of HM cytopin. Uh, PRMT5 inhibition. And I will briefly present some data about this. Um, the first story is not published, but the second story is published. Um, you can read more about that as well. So CRISPR screening. Um, so I think by now most, most people um, are more or less familiar with this, but for uh, someone who is just in the audience that is not familiar with this, with this field, I want to briefly mention this one. So it's a very powerful uh, experiment that you knock out thousands and thousands of genes in the same experiment and study their function. The way we do it is we deliver a pool of guide RNAs and depending on the pool, anywhere from thousand to maybe even 500,000 guide RNAs you can deliver to the cells. The rule is that each cell will receive one guide RNA, but as a population of cells, you know, in each cell you knock out different genes. Typically, each gene is targeted by six to 10 different guide RNAs. Uh, and 
the guide RNA sequence, that's 20 nucleotide sequence, is serving as a barcode for us computationally. We can now, we deliver the guide RNA with the virus, the guide RNA becomes part of the genome, and every cell has that barcode now. And now the rest is basically depending on a phenotype. One of the simplest screening strategy is to, let's say, look at look for proliferation. In this particular case, let's say we delivered the cells. Some cells didn't receive the guide RNA because um, we are using very low viral titer to ensure that each cell will receive one guide RNA. Uh, typically, you know, 75% of the cells don't get anything, so they die out when we add the drug. And then there are other cells we assume, and, and to certain extent we can control, that each cell has one guide RNA. And if our uh, selective pressure in this case, or the phenotypic selection is now proliferation, we'll basically look at these green cells. So these green cells is basically when we knock out that gene, the cells, they were even proliferating much faster. And now with the sequencing, we can exactly know what kind of guide RNAs are present in these cells, uh, et cetera. But this is one of the simplest strategies. There are different strategies as well. So I just mentioned this one as a, like a cell proliferation. If you are interested in you know, doing cancer research, typically proliferation is a good phenotype. But we can also uh, get fancier or with the technology. Now we can use the power of technology to do, for example, single cell uh, screenings. In that case, the phenotype is a transcriptome, basically. So you knock out in each cell, let's say you knock out different transcription factor, and then you do single cell RNA sequencing to really see how each gene affects the overall transcriptomic changes in cells. And of course, there's much more computational you know, analysis going on here. Uh, and, and one of the stories that we have about this one is, for example, we target different um, uh, genome-wide association studies uh, risk loci and, and to see what are the gene targets of this risk loci, for example. And, and finally, we can also do much simpler uh, selection pressure on the cells. For example, you can just fact sort your cells based on certain uh, surface expression of certain proteins, and, and you can do the screening that way. If your, for example, your treatment is we did one of the stories, for example, for PDL1, and you sort cells with high PDL1, low PDL1. You, you can see which genes are involved in PDL1 down regulation or up regulation. So you can do these kind of things as well. And so, the key, one of the key things in screening is, is your library, what kind of libraries you are using, whether you are going to use the entire genome targeting library or much kind of focused. Uh, custom design libraries. So we have different libraries in this in the lab. Uh, one of the libraries that we have been using, um, we haven't published, but we, that we have been using a lot is is a druggable genome library that we custom design. In that case, we target all the druggable genes in the human genome, uh, and we are using this for you know drug screening, etc. And you can use screening, do the screening with wild type Cas9 as well as uh, as well as uh, the epigenetic activators and inhibitors, Cas9, like DCAS9 VPR or DCAS9 CRAB as well. So is this also you can do this kind of screening as well. So um, the for the sake of this, uh, there's two uh, stories that I'm going to talk about. You know, we did we wanted to study pancreatic cancer. I think the previous um, uh, two speaker, Professor Marunen and Brian, they. Um, very well described pancreatic cancer and how horrible this disease is. Um, there are a few things that I want to highlight. So pancreatic cancer is really actually two kind of, the pancreas is, is a mix of two organs together. So it's on one hand, we have endocrine gland and the endocrine cells and, and exocrine cells. Most pancreatic cancers are originating from this exocrine cells. Um, you know, it's as, uh, Taru just, just presented, it's it's very fibrotic um, cancer. You know, 95% of it is not actually cancer cells, but this all this is fibrosis going on in, in cancer. And it's probably because of this one, it's also very drug res resistant to drug. Um, it has a very extremely good prognosis and we know the genomics of it. You know, KRAS is the main driver um, mutation and together with the loss of other tumor suppressor, unfortunately, none of them are targetable. Um, at least the KRAS version of the pancreatic cancer is not targeted yet. 
because of this one, it is you know predicted to be even the second most lethal cancer. We wanted to do the in vivo screening to um, to understand the potential tumor suppressor as well as drug targets. So this is the story about this this uh, tumor suppressor that we found. So the way we did the screening is we took the patient derived cells. Uh, this was a patient derived uh, xenograft model where you can also culture them. We culture them, we deliver the library, we inject orthotopically into the pancreas of mice. So this is a, a orthotopic model where you grow the two human uh, cells in the normal you know, physiological organ, in that case, the pancreas. So we inject into the pancreas, allow them to form tumor. And now we can basically uh, isolate the tumor, amplify the guide RNAs, and quantify them with sequencing, and then compare the number of guide RNAs in this final tumor versus the day zero. And in this case, we are focusing on the green cells where when we knock out, they proliferate even faster. So the top hit that we found was this gene called ISL2. Uh, we can also, I will present this one. We can also in the same setting, we can uh, have another set of mice where they will receive drug. And in this case, we are comparing basically the drug treatment to control cells, and we are focusing on this red one. And red one means that when we knock out this gene just by itself, it didn't affect too much. But when we add drug, they are depleted from the population, meaning that inhibition of these genes or depletion of these proteins becomes lethal, synthetic lethal with the drug combination. And I will tell the story about this one as well. So we previously uh, published the trimatinib story where we found the kinetochore function genes are synthetic lethal with, with MAC inhibition. And we recently did another screening now with gemcitabine. Uh, we published about the PRMT5 being one of the uh, synthetic lethal partner. And I will present some data about this one. So about the ISL2, uh, a tumor suppressor. So uh, it is potentially a transcription factor, I'm saying potentially because we really don't know anything about this gene. And very few publications are, are uh, reports are, um, have been published about this gene and none of them really implicating this in cancer. Um, so, but the guide on the screening clearly show that this, when we deplete this gene, the cells are proliferating faster. Here, for example, 10 guide RNA is targeting this gene. All of them are highly enriched in the, in the tumor in the in vivo tumor versus day zero and when we deplete this this with the with the independent guide rnas both in vivo and in vitro cells are probably much higher, much faster so we i mentioned that we can use crispr uh, to epigenetically activate an endogenous loci and this is what we did we uh, use dcas9 p300 p300 is an enzyme that will deposit histone modification this active histone modification and it will turn genes on. And we use this one to turn the, the ISL2 locus about threefold, not that much actually. And, and we can see the growth inhibition in this sphere formation, I say. Um, when we overexpress and exogenous to overexpress ISL2 with the cDNA, which typically overexpresses expresses the protein maybe 500 times, 1000 times, then you start to kill cells actually. So that's why this is one of the nice things about this epigenetic activations. So, um, so what happens to ISL2 when we knock out this, this gene? So uh, to what happened to, to ISL2 in actual cancer? If this is really tumor suppressor, we thought then cancer should have, um, you know, take care of this, this gene somehow, whether genetically or epigenetically, it may silence this gene. So, um, at the genetic level, we didn't find any mutation in this gene. But at the epigenetic level, when we study the DNA methylation, we see that a large fraction of pancreatic cancer tumors are actually uh, methylating this gene. So around, you know, more than 50%, around 60% of pancreatic cancers, they actually methylate this gene. So the methylation level is much higher than the normal uh, adjacent tissue, suggesting that ISL2 is one of the genes that is epigenetically silenced in pancreatic cancer. And this is very specific to ISL2, this methylation. It's not that this 
in this PDAC patients, somehow all the genomes was, was more methylated. For example, when we segregate this uh, based on high ISL2 met methylation and low ISL2 methylation, the two neighboring genes, these are just a adjacent genes, they were not significantly methylated. So I'm just saying that this is specific to ISL2 methylation. More interestingly, um, high ISL2 methylation or um, similar uh, or low ISL2 expression, because high methylation means low expression, um, is associated with a significant, significantly poor patient survival, indicating that, you know, again, the, the, the critical role of this ISL2 potentially being one of the kind of uh, prognostic factor for bad uh, survival. So then what we wanted to figure out you know, what happens? What is the ISL2 doing? Uh, what happens when ISL2 is, is depleted? So we knock out ISL2 in two, two different cell lines. Um, and the RNA seq expression data, the pure just, just expression data, clearly suggests that there is something about the metabolism here. Because when we look at upregulating genes, they're all involved in lipid metabolism, you know, oxidation, oxfos reactions, adipogenesis, fatty acid metabolism. But the downregulated genes are about glycolysis, you know, mTOR pathway, et cetera. And of course, the apoptosis is downregulated, et cetera, as well. Um, so this clearly suggests that there is something about the metabolism. Of course, me coming from uh, epigenomics and genomics background, I didn't have much knowledge about the metabolism when we start to read about it. So to very simplify, this is like a metabolism 101. Uh, my understanding of metabolism, very simplified version. So um, basically, there are two major metabolic pathways in the cells. The first one is glycolysis. The second one is called oxidative phosphorylation. In the glycolysis part, cells are taking glucose and turning it to pyruvate and lactate. And pyruvate then goes into the mitochondria. Well, now my, in the mitochondria, it goes through this TCA cycle really to generate ATP as well as many other uh, metabolized that cells need to proliferate. Cells can also use glutamine to feed, feed into the oxidase reaction. And the cells can also take lipids, fatty acids from outside to do this, to feed into the oxidase reactions. So this is the very basic metabolism. Of course, we we find that, you know, glycolysis is down and oxidase is up. But this is kind of opposite to what Warburg has suggested, right? In, in his, in Warburg's hypothesis, this Warburg effect, the normal cells generally perform oxidative phosphorylation, meaning that they use mitochondria a lot. But cancer cells, they produce their energy from glycolysis because there's, by using glucose. And this is known as, as Warburg effect, uh, which is largely true, except his early hy hypothesis suggested, suggested that because cancer cells don't use mitochondria, there must be something wrong with mitochondria in cancer cells. That part is not quite correct, but the rest is largely correct. Cancer cells, usually they use glucose and, and do the perform the glycolysis more often than oxidants. But we find something opposite. We think when we deplete ISL2, there is less glycolysis and higher oxidative phosphorylation. And we uh, can uh, measure this in a different ways. Uh, this one, this is uh, one of the essays, you know, a seahorse essay is called, where you basically measure extracellular acidification rate. So basically lactate production, how much lactate is being produced. The, at the basal level and also with this perturbation, you feed with glucose, you add the glucomycin, uh, oligomycin, which kind of blocks the TCA cycle. You, every time the wild type cells are doing more lactate production than the knockout cells, suggesting you know, kind of confirming the gene expression data. We can also measure um, ox oxygen consumption rate, basically the rate of kind of mitochondrial um, activity. Again, the knockout cells are, are doing, consuming oxygen more than the wild type cells. Um, so then um, if this is true, uh, then we wanted to test whether these cells are sensitive to uh, oxfos inhibitors. Uh, in this case, metformin is one of the inhibitors that target, targets oxidative phosphorylation, this electron transport chain. Um, and knockout cells are actually much more sensitive to metformin treatment. And metformin treatment results in, in, in significantly higher rates of apoptosis in these cells, uh, indicating that 
this is a quite stable metabolic reprogramming. And we also tested in vivo as well. So um, we, um, I'm not showing too much data about this one, but we think one of the main things that's going on in, is with the ISL to depletion, cells are uh, upregulating PPR gamma that drives the uh, fatty acid metabolism. And, and uh, that's how the cells are becoming more, more proliferative or self renewal. Now, pancreatic cancer is interesting because mostly actually pancreatic cancer is, is glycolytic. But we found this, that this gene is making these cells more aggressive, but it makes them um, more doing more oxfos. There are two cases in, in, in the literature that describe that some pancreatic cancer cells are doing more oxfos than glycolysis. In one case, when you genetically ablate a KRAS, there are some survivors and these survivor KRAS in, that grows independent of KRAS activity in mouse model, they do more oxfos than um, glycolysis. The other case recently was described that pancreatic cancer stem cells are doing more oxfos than the glycolysis. And uh, indeed, when we measure some um, cell surface expression for stem cells, the ISL to deplete, depleted cells seems to be increasing the, the stem cell, uh, cancer stemness basically in these cells. So this was ISL2 story. Now I want to um, talk about this synthetic lethal screening in, in pancreatic cancer. Yeah, and these are, so pancreatic cancer is very bad and we need new drug combination. And, and we wanted to do in vivo screening for the synthetic lethality. So the, the synthetic lethality, the word is coming from the yeast genetic where when they were deleting one gene in yeast, the yeast is still viable. When you delete another gene, it's still viable, but together they become non-viable. So um, in cancer, we want to, of course, we cannot delete genes in cancer for treatment, but we can add drug A, it is viable, drug B is viable, um, but the, together they are non-viable. So I, I draw happy faces here, but in reality, you add a drug, of course, the cell is a little bit sick, but still survives and, and a bit sick. But together, hopefully, you will achieve this synergistic uh, cell death. Um, so we published about the MAC inhibitor, but here I want to uh, focus on the, the gemcitabine. So where we find the PRMT5 as one of the top uh, screening target. So um, first, when we find this kind of screening, we will, of course, want to look at the genome, the cancer genome. Does it make sense? Um, is it potentially a druggable gene? Is it, you know, uh, has any implication that this, this, this is maybe a driver gene? So initially, we look at the data. This is the laser dissected uh, uh, data that PRMT5 is expressed much higher in cancer cells compared to the stromal, uh, the adjacent normal cells. And moreover, when we look at the pancreatic cancer patients, those who express much higher PRMT5 as, are actually doing much worse compared to low expressive one. Again, suggesting that if you could inhibit this, maybe you, you can have some benefit, some beneficial uh, benefit for these patient, uh, patients. Uh, we, of course, we validated this with multiple, we generated multiple uh, uh, knockouts. Uh, we tested that the knockout is, is uh, both in, with MTT, simple MTT assays, and also with the crystal violet assays. You know, depending on the assay and, and thing, anywhere from 10 to 50 fold, the cells are becoming much more sensitive when we deplete PRMT5. Um, this is kind of to highlight, yes, you know, Many genes, when you knock out genes, they, you know, the cells are becoming sensitive, but is it synergistic? Is it the kind of synthetic lethality? Uh, for this one, it's actually not very easy to, to measure this synthetic lethality or this, um, this synergy between two different drugs. Uh, one way is, is to calculate this combination index. There are some mathematical formulas behind them, but we want to, you or you want one, if you are, dealing with this kind of situations, you want to ensure that the effect is more than additive. If you are, if one drug is killing 20%, the other is killing 20%, if together they are killing 40%, it may not, it still may not be synergistic. It may be just additive. 
but in order to be to be synergistic then one kills 20 percent the other kills 30 20 percent but together they kill maybe 80 percent so in that case um then it becomes synergistic so in this combination index calculations you uh, do multiple dose uh, test multiple doses and if the ci index is less than one typically it means that the drug is synergistic if it's above one it is antagonistic but if it's one or around one then it's just additive uh, so in our combination, more than 80% of the dose combinations, we observe this synergistic um, uh, lethality. Is it working? Uh, well, the, the, of course, what is the mechanism? Uh, so um, uh, Taro presented the, very nicely about the, the uh, replication fork and their collapse and, and uh, speed. We think when PRMT5, or our data suggests, when PRMT5 is depleted, um, replication fork uh, with, the, with additional DNA damage, the replication fork collapses. And there is huge accumulation of DNA damage uh, and, and the fragments. So we, uh, for details, you can uh, feel free to read the paper, please. But the, finally, is this really working in vivo and is it relevant? So to test this one, we wanted to inject wild type tumor and PRM5 knockout tumor in the same mice, because we thought this is the best way to control this experiment. In the control, both of them are forming tumor. But when we add GM cytobine, only the, the, the knockout tumor is shrinking, which was you know, very convincing to us that this could work. And of course, as I mentioned, we cannot knock out genes in cancer. So we have to do um, drug treatment. So then we also perform this, this PRMT5 inhibitor drug. So it's called EPZ. Um, there's some numbers associated with it. Um, so PRMT5 inhibitor, basically. So, when we use gemcitabine or this drug alone, at these doses, they didn't do much killing, but together they do the significant, um, you know, tumor volume reduction. Uh, again, confirming our, overall our finding that PRMT5 inhibition is uh, synergistic uh, with gemcitabine inhibition in pancreatic cancer. Um, with this one, I would like to summarize that, you know, um, uh, I mentioned about the uh, CRISPR screening with two stories. Uh, I actually didn't present this one, sorry, because I had to cut some slides. Um, but we present that PISL2 is potentially a new tu uh, no, uh, tumor suppressor in pancreatic cancer, and its depletion re uh, reprograms the metabolism. And then PRMT5 depletion uh, makes PDXL significantly more sensitive to gemcitabine. And uh, with this, I would like to actually thank all the people who did this, this work. You know, my job is really to just um, discuss with them and they are the actual people who did all this, um, this work. So I'm very thankful. Tom was the main person about the PRMT5 story. Uh, Jem started this ISL2 story and a couple of other people started finishing it. These are some old picture from University of Virginia. This is a new picture from uh, Northwestern. And we moved our lab to Northwestern, uh, to Chicago, and we are looking uh, for computational biologists. So we are, I want to shamelessly advertise this. Um, so we look for uh, talented postdocs, graduate students, or um, just scientists to join us. And with this, I would like to stop here and take any of your questions if you have. Wonderful, so, that was so great, listening. thank you. Does anyone have questions for Lazar? I, I can start off. What's happening with, I'm gonna kind of link your um, ISL2 and PRMT5. What's happening with glycolysis in the PRMT5 um, knockout? And are you seeing a synergistic effect of inhibiting? Because isn't there some indication that it regulates glycolysis? Or are you seeing a synergistic effect of inhibiting DNA replication and impacting metabolism? So that's a great question. So we didn't check metabolism in PRMT5 depleted cells, but there was a paper about um, drug resistance in pancreatic cancer. And one of the main thing was there's metabolic reprogramming where the cells are now using more, you know, DNTPs. Uh, and that's how they, they, you know, prevent this cytotoxicity from um, 
uh, gem cytabin. But we didn't specifically look what happens downstream of PRMT5 here. Can I ask also a question? Um, mm -hmm. I'm always curious because pancreatic and liver cancer to me are a little like they're, I guess the, the environment is the same kind of the stellate cells and that's where they most frequently metastasize. Um, have you looked, first of all, in metastases or in, in other tumor types, whether these might be also important? For, um, for ISL2? OPRM and 5 yeah, either uh, way. You know, for ISL2 story, we um, tested um, in organoid model and injected organoids. I, I, sorry, I didn't uh, present any of this data. Uh, with Nabil Bardizi uh, at MGH. So we uh, knock out in organoids, in PDAC organoids. And when we inject these organoids into mice, uh, one, of course, it forms larger tumors and also they seem to be metastasizing much faster uh, than the, the, the knock of the control cells. So it definitely increases the metastasis in these cells, uh, ISL to depletion. Thank you. And you said that it's decreasing the, the stem cell? Uh, it is increasing the stem cells. So yes. So ISL2 seem to be because it was perplexing to us that why increasing oxfos is you know right. beneficial um, but one of the the only human cell lines that seem to do be doing this is pancre for pancreatic cancer is pancreatic cancer stem cells they right. do higher level of oxfos than glycolysis Maybe this is kind of a naive question, but is there, is there any, do you have a preference or is there any advantage of doing which way you do the screening? If you're screening for tumor suppression, is it like, do you find any indifference in the robustness or sensitivity if you're doing, you know, sort of the tumor suppressor versus oncogene screening? I think, yes. I mean, it's not, you know, first of all, it depends on your purpose. You know, what is, what do you want to do? But typically, uh, detecting a tumor suppressor is easier because there the pressure is that you're going to select the cells that has already proliferated much faster. Right. But in the other case, you need to find something that has been depleted. Uh, it, it becomes more challenging to find the, the depletion one, the de depleted ones. It's just you have to control, do much more normalization that controls to really ensure that that's true. Mm -hmm. um, but the screening, the, so the, the for screen for any screening to work, you need really a good pressure on the system, and that pressure can be cell proliferation, uh, or it can be the, like flow cytometry sorting. Uh, like flow cytometry works much better actually than the proliferation. For example, if you have a phenotype, let's say your system. You with the treatment that all the cells are turn, are turning into green, or you can actually do fact sorting them. Mm -hmm. Then you can do a much cleaner screening. Mm -hmm. If there is not a strong pressure in the system, then the screening really is very difficult and to mm -hmm. kind of make sense out of it. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Have you have you uh, done any CAS thirteen uh, centric screening where the focus is on knocking down the RNA but not really a knock? Out. I haven't done any sRNA. Is that what you're so? No, so instead of using Cas9 or DCAS9, have you used Cas13, uh, which is basically for uh, knocking down the uh, RNA? No, I haven't. I personally haven't done it. No. Okay. So, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Adli. Of course, thank you guys. We appreciate your invitation. Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to session two of the today's bioinformatics symposium on onychoinformatics and cancer research. Um, I hope everyone can hear me well. I know that we have been doing it for a while, but great. 
Um, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Giovanni Parmigiani, um, who is professor in both the Department of Data Science and Department of Stati Biostatistics at Harvard University. Uh, Giovanni is very well known. He is a fellow of the American Statistical Associations. He is also a fellow of the AAAS. And I think what's also quite remarkable is that he's well recognized for his mentoring activities uh, for junior people. And of course, his uh, research um, and contributions that he did to cancer research and statistical methodology. And we're very pleased to have him here today uh, talking about the statistical learning on collections of heterogeneous studies. Uh, so Giovanni, if you can share your screen now, that, uh, that will be great. Thank you very much, Irina. That was a terrific introduction, and I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to this audience. This morning was uh, a very exciting uh, morning of cancer biology. This will be a little bit of a, of a switch of uh, gears towards the interface between computational sciences and the more translational aspects of cancer research. And I... I I also want to uh, point out to both, uh, to, to Brani, uh, Dr. Mani and Bani, that both my first and second name end in Ani. So I think I will likely fit in with the uh, schedule, hopefully, uh, well enough. I uh, was logged in a good 25 minutes ahead of time to test my screen sharing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was punished for my excess of... Uh, of caution because it worked 25 minutes ago, and then I, I gave permission to the uh, to 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 recording my screen, and that tripped the connection between my computer and my iPad. So if you give me another three seconds, I should I would like to pull up uh, a static copy of um, of the talk. I will not be able to scribble on it, but I think we'll survive. And I will screen share directly from the computer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so I need, I need, I think I'm almost there actually. Uh, yeah. So this should give me the screen share not a problem. button. Uh, for and, everyone who is attending, if you have questions throughout the talk, I will be uh, monitoring the chat so uh, you can put them to the chat to everyone or just uh, write them directly to me if you want them to be anonymous uh, and I will pass them to the speaker at the end. Oh, this okay. looks perfect. It does, all right. So I'm, I'm delighted that it does. Uh, and while you check the truthfulness of my statement about the ending of my first and second name, let me reposition my um, my uh, computer and start start the video. Hi everyone. Sorry about the technical glitch, and I think we're ready to roll. Uh, the the two titles for today in <laughs> in an excess of uh, of uh, communication zeal. Uh, when when I was in invited initially by the stats department, I thought I, I did a little bit of repackaging of what I was going to present and focus more on the statistical learning aspects of, uh, of my presentation. Then seeing what the symposium uh, looked like in terms of the overall complexion of the speakers, I, I took a step back and decided to give a little bit more of the background and history about why we arrived at, uh, at the focusing so intensely in my group over the past few years on uh, uh, learning from multiple heterogeneous studies uh, through giving you a little bit of background about, uh, about the challenges of validation and replicability of prediction algorithms in the context of oncology specifically. So um, yeah, here we go. I want to start out with disclosure. It's a little bit unusual in statistics, but I think it's important. It should be done more often. They're mostly unrelated to what I'll describe today, except for the second from the bottom, uh, which uh, uh, discloses a patent on a biomarker that we discover using some of the ovarian cancer uh, uh, papers that we 
that I will describe in, in the early part uh, of the paper. This patent is not active, in that I derive no income from it, but it is a, a potential conflict in the sense that we discover uh, what we discovered using a multi-study analysis, not a single study analysis, so that there could be a, a potential uh, there. So as I said, I want to start this presentation by going back to the challenges of reproducibility and replicability in science and uh, highlighting a, a, a report that the uh, uh, National Academies of Sciences have uh, um, issued in 2019 uh, on this topic following a decade of uh, scandals, political pressures, technological transformations, uh, uh, realizations of, uh, of challenges uh, in this space. I don't want to say very much except the fact that this is, is, is a very vital problem for, for, the, uh, for how science can make progress and how science can make an impact in society and in, in, uh, in uh, uh, health uh, in particular. Um, I just want to use this slide to highlight uh, the terms reproducibility and replicability because ironically they are not used replicably in the community. Uh, I, I will adopt the statisticians convention of thinking about reproducibility as a, a question of transparency and documentation. And is there in a study enough that others could try to retrace all the steps that were that were um, utilized to come to for for uh, uh, reaching the results replicability on the other hand has to do with new experiments asking the same question and whether such experiments would reach the same conclusion it's a much broader question and, and much uh, that that allows for uh, much more uh, detail and and great air gray area and replicability is the question that we're going to uh, be concerned with today I also want to make another point in connection with this report uh, and, and give you the results of what was at the time the most complex uh, natu natural language uh, processing exercise I had ever done, which is a word count in the National Academy report of the words hypothesis test and machine learning. And as you can see, the attention given to hypothesis tests is the cube of the attention given to machine learning. And I thought that that was uh, a, a bit sad because I, I think that the ability to uh, understand uh, the validation and replicability of algorithms that predict future outcomes for patients is one of the key bottlenecks in the application of AI, machine learning, statistical learning, you name it, in, uh, in health and in oncology particularly. So if one algorithm is developed in a, on, in a particular platform in the context of a particular uh, medical institution, it is typically very challenging to uh, make it work equally well uh, on a slightly different platform for measuring the same biology, on a slightly different medical system, on a slightly different uh, uh, population, either genetically or socioeconomically. And so uh, it, uh, if we want to be successful in bringing all, all the technologies that are now emerging in, in the space of statistical learning to bear in, uh, in improving patient outcome, we really need to solve this, uh, this replicability problem. So that's that as a way of general motivation and context. I'm going to um, walk you very briefly in, in this talk through our own path over the past decade uh, that has been motivated by this. Uh, so we started at the left asking questions about replicability of prediction performances across studies. And we decided to try to answer it empirically by lay, laying the foundation by a comp comprehensive reviews of studies that are relevant for training and validation of these algorithms. This foundation has then served us for doing a couple of different things that are listed next on the right. The first is some initial meta-analytic training of uh, signatures for prediction in oncology um, that utilize multiple study and acknowledge the, 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 the heterogeneity of the studies at, at the training stage. And I'll tell you a little bit about those. But also we use the, these collections, comprehensive collection, to build realistic simulations uh, environment that would allow us to then ask questions that are of, of a more methodological nature, I would say. And the, fir the first part of what I will present will tell you a little bit about how we use those 
to document a gap that, is, that has been uh, acknowledged and recognized anecdotally for very, very long times. Uh, and it, that is the gap between the so-called cross-validation, which for those of you uh, who are not familiar, is based on trying to understand whether an algorithm works by taking a single data set and dividing it up into two, into parts and using some for training and some for validation, as opposed to cross-study validation, which means uh, to uh, validate in a, a completely new uh, environment, so to speak, either technologically or genetically or, or uh, uh, sociologically in terms of the populations that are being interrogated uh, for a question that is fundamentally similar that may lead to, this, to the same clinical decisions but that needs to operate in a slightly perturbed environment. So we, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how we uh, think about documenting that gap. The, the, all those exercises uh, brought us to the conclusion that we needed a, a more robust effort as a community and certainly personally, uh, several uh, of my colleagues and myself have, have made that commitment to building novel learning architectures that would address this this gap and would uh, help us overcome the difficulty of validating in a new study when you train on a single study so i'll, I'll spend quite a bit of time talking at the end about the uh, uh, ideas that we have for simple and scalable methodologies that use multiple studies for training and try to acknowledge that heterogeneity as part of the landscape uh, of the machine learning or statistical learning exercise. So that's the overall map uh, of, of, today's, uh, of today's presentation. It, it traces a, a, a set of uh, uh, grants and publication that goes back at least 10 years for, uh, for myself and several uh, other collaborators, maybe too many to list. At the end, I'll put up a slide with publication that will be a fairly inclusive list of collaborators, but this is by no means my work uh, alone. And there are four or five faculties involved and maybe 20 or 30 trainees in various different parts of this, of this complicated machinery. So a good place to start uh, is a paper that was led by Levi Waldron, who uh, was at the time a postdoc jointly working with myself and Curtis Attenauer to try to set up a comprehensive reviews and meta-analysis meta framework for understanding the extent to which existing prognostic models uh, would be uh, replicable. And so he, he uh, conceived of these two tracks uh, um, literature review approach where on the track on the left you do a comprehensive literature review of the prognostic models and on the right you do a comprehensive literature review of the data sets that would be amenable to either training or validating uh, these models and we we applied this uh, to uh, ovarian cancer prognosis using gene expression data and for that, uh, we uh, created uh, sets uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, we created essentially R packages that included on the left end, the prediction models that we found and that we were able to re-implement. And on the right, uh, the data sets that contain sufficient inf information for evaluating uh, the outcomes that we were interested in. So we ended up with 14 uh, prediction models reproduced and for, um, and 10 data sets to understand their replicability. Uh, all of this has been available in, in a bioconductor package called curated ovarian data, which I've used for teaching for now a uh, very, very long time. And it has served uh, as a blueprint for other groups to develop similar packages in other cancers as well, including uh, uh, breast, uh, bladder, prostate, uh, at uh, those are ones that come to mind. I don't have time to uh, dwell too much on the on the methodologies or the or, or the uh, inclusion criteria, but the uh, the data set uh, curation uh, is an art in and of itself in this case, and I, I just want to bring up this slide uh, uh, for the uh, uh, th that briefly describes the pipeline for the curation of both the expression and the uh, the phenotype label which is the part where we invested uh, more thought and, and, and time, because that is, I think, where the challenges are more often coming 
in terms of uh, the bottleneck uh, to generalizability of what we do in the space of machine learning in health. So going, uh, going back to the previous slide, we have a 14 prediction models and 10 data sets, and you can, uh, you can uh, on a pairwise basis, examine the uh, ability of each of the models to predict on each of the data sets. And uh, I, I, I have given you know, 45 minutes talk on this slide alone, because there's a lot to unpack here in, uh, in, in, in this exercise, but I want to just draw very quickly a couple of general points. The black uh, combinations corresponds to in-sample validation, training and validation on the same sample, and they give you far higher uh, degrees of predictability than, uh, than the ones that are not in black. The, the scale that you're looking at here is a, is a hazard ratio that, that tells you how predictive uh, the score developed by each of the models uh, is. So the models are uh, able to rank patients by, by risk, and then these, these ranks as part of the validation exercise are in, included in a proportional hazards model with, which, whose hazard ratio for that score is then uh, a measure of uh, predictability. We like that because it has a direct clinical interpretation. It's fairly interpretable in terms of, you know, if you have a high score compared to low, you increase by one unit. Uh, that, that's how much more risk you have. So that's that's uh, consideration number one. Um, there's also quite a bit of variability for each of the model. If you look across the row, the, 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 um, the, uh, the row in terms of how well they validate in other environments. And that variability is another point that, that uh, uh, was an important take home for us. So that was exercise one, just documenting the variation in validation performance and the gap between cross study, between internal and external validation in a systematic way in a relevant application in cancer. We also took the step of trying to see whether uh, having built a comprehensive uh, environment, we could leverage it to improve existing prediction model compared to what had been uh, well, we presented these 14 that we presented. And that's that's a, a twin paper in the same issue of JNCI back in, to, in 2014. And I want to bring up this slide just because it's the birthplace of two things that we did quite a bit in years to, uh, after that. One is a, a concept that we call leave one study out validation, where if you have 14 studies, you train on 13 and validate on the other. And we think that that's a very reasonable way of understanding uh, 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 generalizability of, of algorithm because that the, the, the set aside is now completely independent from a study perspective as well. And the second is a meta-analytic way of training uh, the signature, which in this case was implemented very, very simply by having a, a, a prediction algorithm that depend on certain coefficients, mm -hmm. estimating the coefficients on a study-by-study -study basis, and then meta-analyze them uh, to get a, a, a consensus a consensus model out of, out of the various studies. So those, those, that's where we were in 2014. As I said, one of the things that we like to do is to uh, uh, generate collections of study that, that are, are artificially generated. So they, they are, they're genuine uh, data generating models where you know the truth and, and you can use it for methodology, but are very close to uh, representing what goes on in the real world and having having a comprehensive list of all the studies that, are, that have been conducted in a, in a specific space, we think is a, a robust way of thinking about, about this problem, particularly if you're also thinking about the studies, the study variation as one of the aspects that you're interested in documenting. So uh, we have developed, uh, uh, mostly due to the uh, efforts of uh, of uh, Yuxing Zhang, who is uh, who's a uh, graduate student joint with, with a group at BU uh, led by uh, Evan Johnson, um, uh, a, uh, a bioconductor package for, for doing this type of, uh, of uh, uh, data simulations where you can, in, in, essentially you can, you can input your own collection of studies into the package and it'll produce for you a simulation, a data generating uh, model uh, that that generates data consistent with that, but where you also have through the ability to know the true outcomes. 
So we use that to try to understand a little bit more closely the determinants of this gap between cross-validation and cross-study validation. And this is a, a, a summary of Yu Xing's result that appeared in Biostatistics a couple of years ago. There are, there's a color and a black and white version. The black and white refers to gene expression microarrays and old, old data of which we have more extensive uh, uh, versions and also more studies. And the second is, uh, uh, the, the color one is for RNA-seq data, uh, which is more recent data and has a small, generally a small number of studies that have been carried out. On the, um, let's, let's focus on, on, the, uh, on the black and white because the message is essentially the same for the two platforms, uh, at least as far as the replicability of algorithms is concerned and what are the drivers of that. So the, um, the, the white boxes are cross-study validation results uh, as represented by the C index, which is an index that, uh, that uh, is essentially uh, the, uh, the close relative of the area under the curve for survival data. And, and the gray ones are the cross-validation obtained internally from the same data set that was using training. And at the very far left, you see the baseline results where, where we sh we, you, you can observe a very substantial a very substantial gap. These are tough problems. The, the, the C indices in the in the 55 to uh, to 60 percent are not are not rare, uh, but even those can be substantial overestimates of, of how well the algorithm is, is predicting, as you see from the baseline. Then we look at a number of different potential um, uh, determinants of that. We looked, at, for example, at rebalancing artificially rebalancing relevant clinical covariates across the studies. Uh, th this did not do very much to the gap, uh, suggesting that those uh, covariates were not responsible for overfitting and had been correctly captured by the machine learning approaches that we were looking at. We looked at filtering genes by uh, their, their, their uh, unsupervised replicability, uh, an approach which did uh, level the playing field a little bit more. It did reduce the overfitting from the... Um, the uh, um, from the cross from the cross validation, we look at at leveling the the baseline hazards of the different studies, which originally came with quite a bit of variation in that, and we noticed that that did not uh, particularly change uh, the gap. And then we uh, finally um, looked at what we call the same models, meaning the same coefficients that describe the relationship between the gene expression and the outcome in the data generating model. And it is when you do that, that you, know, you bring up the uh, uh, DC index for the cross-study validation up to the levels of the cross-validation and the two are very, very close. Suggesting that it is, at least in this type of application, very important to think about why different uh, variables have different uh, effects in different, in different studies. Um, my own personal opinion is that uh, it, this has to do with uh, unmeasured confounding and the existence of subtypes in cancer that are represented in different proportions of the different studies. And I can elaborate on why in the Q&A. Uh, the, the concept is relatively simple. If you have a biomarker that only works in the subtype, and the subtype appears in different proportions in the two studies, and you don't know that the subtype is there, then the marginal coefficient of that biomarker will change from, uh, as a result of that change in the mix uh, from one study to another. And it's only when you can include that unknown subtype as, as something you can condition on or train on that, that you um, get rid of that variation in, in the relationship between, uh, between the x's and the y's. So uh, that, that's uh, a very, very summary conclusion from, uh, from this exercise, uh, focusing on the lessons that were more useful for us uh, in, in uh, going forward. So what we did, so if the next exercise is a little bit more focused on the methodology. And it asks the question, yes, there is a, there is a bias between, there is a, a bias in cross-validation. There is a gap between cross-validation and cross-study validation. There is study heterogeneity. But why does that matter for um, uh, training models? And that, that's a question that my colleagues in statistics were asking me a lot. We know that cross-validation is biased and, and that's not the, and it's not the be all and all. But for comparing models, it's still the best way we, we can do it. It's not. 
the the bottom line of this of these simulations and, and a lot of extensive work that we have done in the in this area is that the ranking of different AI or machine learning or statistical algorithms changes if you ask them to do well in cross-validation compared to asking them to do well in cross-study validation. This is a very important point. Uh, again, the notation is the same, the white boxes of the cross-validation, the... Um, did I, did I uh, revert? The notation is reversed. Uh, the uh, gray boxes are the cross validation and the white are the cross study uh, validation. And you can see, and I have six algorithms that are being compared and I'm taking, a, uh, I'm showing you histograms of the rankings over multiple uh, simulation runs. And you can see that it's not always the same that win, uh, that win uh, in uh, both uh, categories. I can I can go into detail what exactly uh, these uh, these algorithms uh, do, uh, uh, but maybe some of that will 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 emerge in in later discussion uh, and in the and in the Q and A. The point is, uh, algorithms that win or do well in cross validation don't necessarily win or do well in cross study validation. And there's a general trend for simpler algorithms to do well at cross-study validation and for more complicated algorithms to do well in cross-validation as a result probably of, a, of an increased tendency to, uh, to overfit. So, um, so this is in the way uh, of, of uh, background, uh, going back to the outline maybe real quick. Uh, we are now, uh, we now move to the first four uh, boxes that I have here, uh, actually five, and we're, we're going down to the second part of the talk, which talks about what can we do uh, to improve the ability of statistical methodologies to deal with these various problems. Okay. Yeah, so the next question, the question for the, for the remaining part of the talk is, to, is how do we engineer statistical learning methods that validate well other samples? The foundation will be to use multiple studies for training. And this is not a luxury that we always have, but in this area of big data and uh, data science becoming pervasive and uh, a major NCI initiative for increasing data sharing, including some that are part of the moonshot, things are improving quite a bit. And I, I think it behooves us to leverage that uh, to, uh, to the best uh, that we can. So we've started developing some methods along these lines. The key, some of the key words uh, here are meta-analysis and domain adaptation. Many of the things that we do could be categorized um, as being part of those, uh, those fields or maybe bridging those fields. The niche where we try to uh, make a real impact is to develop simple and scalable and hopefully to some extent interpretable architectures that ha are helpful at the statistical learning health interface, particularly for precision medicine, for what has been my passion throughout my career, which is precision prevention. These are, pro are problems that uh, often have very, very skinny uh, matrix matrices of predictors in terms of having very, very many predictors and not very many uh, examples or labeled uh, labeled cases for, tra for, tra for training because the sample sizes. Uh, are humans and humans remain a, re a relatively rare commodity compared to say images on the internet. I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're doing uh, both in the unsupervised and the supervised uh, world and I, I, I hope that the supervised I hope will be uh, super intuitive at least in terms of the very high level description of what the goals are and and maybe lay the foundation for some of the more black boxes thing that will be coming in the supervised world. So, start by talking about two papers led by Roberta De Vitus, now a faculty member at Brown University, uh, about what we call multi-study factor analysis. The data structure is shown at the top here. You have case studies, each uh, that gives you a, a matrix that has uh, subjects uh, as the columns and feature or predictors uh, as the rows. And we are interested in decomposing these matrices 
uh, into uh, a factor type matrix decomposition where each uh, point in the uh, observed matrix is a simple linear combination of factors uh, and uh, weights given to those factors. So in, 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 uh, in standard factor analysis, you can look at stu study one, you can maybe find a couple of factors that explain a lot of the variation in that matrix and, write, and rewrite your numbers approximately as a product of those two matrices at the bottom. And this in this matrix, just as a cartoon, I have a green and an orange factor. If I could do this exercise again in study K and maybe find the same factors again, but if I do that exercise in study two, now I realize that there may be a couple more factors that are important to consider, which I now have um, uh, written down in orange and in, in yellow and blue. So what, we, what, what Roberta did is she developed a joint model for doing this type of analysis, a joint model that decomposes the, the covariance matrices of each of these studies in a way that allows for some of the some of the factors to be exactly com in common between all the studies, and for some of the factors uh, to be unique to individual studies, and uh, the, the common factors are hopefully sort of the reproducible, replicable rather core of this set of studies in terms of the covariance structure of the, of the matrix uh, matrices X. While the, uh, uh, the unique uh, factors to each study could come from a variety of different uh, sources. Uh, one that we are always concerned about are batch effect or idiosyncrasies of technologies that were unique to a particular studies. But there could also be some real biology uh, driving that. And there could be some confounding, including, for example, the type of confounding that I described earlier about a different admixture of unknown uh, subtypes, for example, if these are cancer gene expression data. Two versions of this, 2018 is a maximum likelihood version where we uh, talk about uh, identifiability of these models, which is non-trivial, uh, and, uh, and give algorithms that work for uh, when you have more observations of variables. And then we scale it up to the uh, P greater than N and a Bayesian version with various uh, ways of incorporating sparsity in a subsequent paper. Both are available as, uh, as uh, archive. And one is actually out already in, uh, in uh, biometrics. This is a little bit of motivation in comparison with, with what normally goes on. And I'm taking two of the ovarian cancer studies that I talked, that I talked about earlier and showing you uh, the, the, the two factor decomposition for, for the genes that belong to a specific pathway, which I think is uh, related to uh, immune system response. And if you, if you look at these two uh, sets of factor, you recognize uh, similarities and differences and you can kind of eyeball them, uh, but you're left with, the, with several questions about whether the factors are the same or unique to each, each of the studies. And in some cases, for example, if you compare uh, Lambda 1-1 in the top study to Lambda 1-2 and 4-2 in the, in the second study, whether those are really two different factors or the same, because you find uh, factors that are highly correlated to each other uh, and, and uh, both within and across studies. So our analysis really systematizes all of this and goes straight for an inference on both common and, and study specific factors, cutting out all this uh, head scratching that you have to do at the end in a, in a statistically too informal way uh, when you do things separately by study and try to, to put the things together at the end. Probably too late to get into uh, covariance matrix uh, reconstruction and comparison with standard factor analysis with respect to that, but I invite you to read that uh, material in, in uh, Roberta's biometrics paper. I just want to put in a plug for work that uh, Isabella Grabsky, a graduate st student in, uh, in Biostat at Harvard is doing right now, where she's generalizing this to a uh, what we call a combinatorial factor analysis, where factors can be shared by any subset of the studies in the lot. And this turned out to be quite a tour de force technically, uh, and uh, the, the, because there is an underlying uh, matrix that looks like a checkerboard where uh, uh, of membership of different uh, uh, factors to different studies, uh, that is that is quite difficult to learn. And she's done a spectacular job with MCMCs that can that can crawl over that over that space and and uh, and learn really interesting stuff. And we are, we are also using this same paradigm 
to, uh, to do regression that have matrices as outcomes and uh, uh, discrete covariates uh, as, uh, as potential predictors that so, so that th those discrete covariates are coded as a two to the K, uh, as a two to the, to the, to the, to the say I, and two to the I is the P, is the K in this, uh, in this formulation. So she's she's quite quite uh, outstanding and has made a lot of progress in this. Okay, so that concludes my unsupervised version of uh, of this uh, of the uh, multi-study uh, work that is going on in our group, uh, and I want to move to the supervised uh, to the supervised part, which brings us back uh, to the question of replicability in the context of precision medicine specifically. Now the, the data structure is a little bit different. We also have labels at the top. Uh, so Y will be the label and X will be the predictors. And I, I, I think I, I want to start out by clarifying what the goals are because uh, over the years, we've been encountering many different goals in many different applications and also trying to bridge this work with work in domain adaptation. We found many ways of defining this problem. So on the right hand side, uh, I have potential uh, target tasks that your model is going to want to learn how to do. So we, we are training on these case studies. What do we want the result to be good at? One option is to try for something that is good at, at study K plus one, where that is in some, in some unseen domain. Let's say that I am doing an imaging project and I have data from MD Anderson, Harvard and uh, uh, Memorial, and, and I want to make, make sure that this uh, algorithm is gonna work in uh, other hospitals randomly chosen around the, the United States. So that's the unseen domain version of that unknown everything. Um, what can we do to ensure replicability? That's probably the most relevant in terms of the uh, precision medicine application. The second uh, problem that we want to highlight is uh, what if we really want to apply this algorithm at MD Anderson? Uh, and so we know that the population is going to be very, and the technologies are going to be very much like the ones for study one. Uh, can, is, does it still make sense to do multi-study learning to get rid of video synchronies and, and to have a more stable algorithm or maybe borrow strength from other populations uh, for uh, uh, increased genetic variation or whatever other reason? This, this is, is the second uh, white box that will, for which uh, we, uh, we know that the data are going to come essentially from a, a very similar data generating model as study one and how do we how do we train that? We have two different approaches for training, one that we call the generalist and one we call specialist when we implement them as, as stacking models. Last but not least, we can be in a situation where we, when we predict, we already know the vector X for which we'll be, we try to predict, we just don't know the Y. And uh, for that as well, uh, we have been developing algorithms that, uh, that uh, leverage multiple studies as well as the variation of course studies to try to come up with algorithms that are more robust. So most of what I'm going to tell you today is going to be about the unseen domain and I don't have time to cover very much about the other two cases but I'll point you to uh, papers that we have in the archives where we do, where we do develop quite a bit of uh, methodology and, and evaluations for those two cases as well. So so the unseen domain, what we, what we have concocted for, to, a, to attack this is a simple ensembling architecture that works in two stages. In, in, in this example, uh, I have K equals three, and I have three, set, three subsets of data that I'm, that I'm considering as different studies, the purple, the, uh, the blue, and the green. And I have two way, uh, learners that I'm interested in. Maybe one is random forest uh, and the, one, the other one is boosting. So A is random forest and B is boosting. And what this, in stage one, I'm going to train both random forest and boosting on each one of those studies separately. Then I'm going to calculate the predictions for each of, the, uh, of, of these six models on every data point and construct a new uh, uh, predictor based on those predictions uh, taken together. 
the general architecture here is simply one where those six models, the combinations of boosting uh, Renault Forest on the one hand and the three studies form an ensemble. And then I worry about weights that can optimize my goals. So some weights will optimize the, jet, the goal of predicting to the unseen domain. Others will uh, try to optimize the goal of uh, predicting for more data from study one, et cetera. And the, the, the scheme that I just gave you is one that is useful for developing weights uh, for the, un, for the uh, unseen domain. Let me elaborate on that um, a little bit. We call that uh, multi-study stacking. So uh, at the top is a reminder of the data structure. The observations are the labels uh, and the predictors. And we have P rows. And in this case, just for the sake of uh, uh, a uh, concise illustration, I boil down the learner to just a single learner. Now I'm just doing boosting. And so uh, I train a boosting algorithm on each of those studies separately. That's stage one. Then. I have now I have k k in k incarnations of boosting. I can apply each of these incarnation to each data point in the study, and I generate those uh, red matrices at the bottom. They have k rows, one for each of those incarnation, and as many columns as there are data points. And this is where uh, I'm missing my iPad because I was hoping to write down a, a decent expression for what we actually do. But what we do is we concatenate the labels at that point in stage two and concatenate the red matrices and just regress a big factor of the labels with a big matrix of, of the prediction jointly. Why is that useful? If you think about this, the, the you know, a, a simple regression situation or penalized regression situation where you are looking at the black and white, uh, at predicting the black and white based on the red stuff at the bottom. Most of the data point that you have will be predictions made by training in one algorithm and looking at the label, training in one data set and looking at the label from a, a different data set. There, there is some data reuse. There are some points that are, uh, tr that where we have the, the red points is, is being trained on the same label that is used later. And we could exclude them and that's a, a whole other discussion. But if you have a sufficiently large number of studies and you don't have very big dominant studies, the majority of this, the exercise that happens in stage two is an exercise in cross-study replicability. And it is the features in, that, in those K rows that are more cross-study replicable that are going to have the bigger coefficients in my penalized regression and that are going to carry more weight in my ensemble. So my ensemble of these study specific models is not just going to be a straight average, it's going to be a, a weighted average that I hope will be smart enough to realize when one of the algorithm is good at predicting out of study. So that's what we call uh, multi-study stacking. Uh, I, I want to circle all the way back to the ovarian cancer application and tell you what happens if you uh, apply this to, to, that, to those original data sets. The scale here is discrimination, uh, same as we discussed earlier, except expressed as a ratio of a baseline algorithm uh, that, that was the, the one from our uh, NCI paper. I'm comparing it to merging all the data together and training, uh, that's one of the orange, to the meta-analysis approach that we use in JNCI, to the average, to the ensemble that I described, just with the average, uh, with the uh, with no weights, with the weights being one upon upon k, equal weights to each of the ensemble member, and then on the right, uh, the multi-study uh, version that I gave you, and and so you can ten ten percent in this case is is an is an interesting improvement to us because the problem is so hard. We have a, a now a lot of simula simulation trying to understand when that improvement is big or small. But I like the fact that we were able to come full circle to the, to, to the uh, 2012 data set uh, and show that we have been able to at least uh, come identify an interesting direction to robustify our algorithms to this uh, multi-study variation. All right, it's 2.58 um, and I, I uh, as I was uh, fumbling the, uh, the uh, IT, I forgot to keep track of when I started talking. How much time uh, uh, should I um, use for a quick wrap up of uh, 
current topics. We still have five minutes. Okay, good. That's oh, about exactly minutes. as much as I as I need. Um, from here, so let me tell you a little bit about what is uh, going on uh, in the group uh, it, working on this general uh, general architecture. Uh, Sun Zoe Guan, who is now at Memorial, uh, worked on uh, what we call a transition point uh, model. Uh, she has, she worked in a, in a in a context where uh, models are driven by uh, coefficients, uh, real valued coefficients. And that there's a generating model for those at the higher level. So um, it's, it's, it's a, like, like a hierarchical model with, a, with study clusters. And uh, there are random coefficients that vary across study according to some random distribution. And, and she was able to prove analytically that depending on the variance of these random coefficients across studies, it may be optimal to merge all the data or ensemble. And her work, which I hope to be able to describe to you maybe in just a little more detail, is the first place where we were able to respond with some theory to the question that we were at, we got asked a lot, particularly by our colleagues in computer science, about why don't you just merge and train? Now, we don't answer all the questions because we, in this context, because the training is mostly uh, based on relatively simple algorithms that may or may not leverage optimally the study label. But I think it's important to understand this trade-off between uh, variance of the coefficients across studies and uh, gains to be had by these two-stage structures that train first a study-specific model and then ensemble, it, ensemble those versus trying to train everything uh, at, the same, at the same time. The transition point is that magical level of, of uh, 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 random effect variance that gives you an equivalence uh, of expected performance between the two approaches. Um, the next work that I want to mention is work of Maya uh, Ramchandran, who's just about to finish as a graduate student, who's looked at uh, a situation where your learner is, a, is random forest, and comparing that to the situation where you take the forest, you unpack it and uh, look at every individual tree in the forest and weigh the trees instead of weighing the forest. And she has characterized situations where weighing the trees is more efficient than weighing the forest, which is actually a, a, a substantial majority of, of scenarios in, uh, in uh, uh, the type of work uh, that we have uh, that we have considered. This is, a, is something that we are still very much exploring, the balance between uh, uh, stage one and stage two. Do you want a ton of algorithm in stage one or do you want uh, um, to have uh, more of the weight being in, on, on the stage two uh, development of, of weights? And her work uh, points to the, the, the potential for using many learners as uh, as study specific learners, maybe uh, pushing the weak learner angle on that on those, and then doing some simple assembling uh, uh, by by picking the specific trees that are uh, going to be replicable across uh, across studies. Generally, her her results suggests that it's only relatively few trees that get picked out of the forest as being very interesting, in part because we build sparsity in the uh, estimation of the coefficient, but also conceptually. I think uh, there is an element of randomness in the generation of trees that allows you to uh, hit on things that are uh, likely to be scalable across studies. Gay Blowinger uh, is a, a graduate student who came to uh, the lab with a background in neuroscience and brought to us a really beautiful application in, uh, uh, in neurosensing where they have uh, different uh, uh, sensors that can be thought of as different studies in that they have their own idiosyncrasy in the way they generate the data. And he's been uh, very in, uh, clever in generating an approach that can create a continuum between merging and the two-stage assembling that, that I describe by using clever uh, multi-level multi uh, resampling uh, re methods. And he has studied that and shown its advantages. And it turns out, uh, which is interesting, is that a, a lot of time the, in his more general world, 
it is the optimum is not our simple to stage uh, stacking. It is not merging. Is some hybrid form of the uh, of the two uh, that that involves some uh, creating some artificial training data sets that mix different studies together. So on on a similar vein, uh, the uh, and I'm going to tell you about uh, the Ren paper last because I want to, th there's a natural continuity between uh, Gabe's group uh, Lovinger's uh, work and Maya's last paper in 2021, where she looks at what she calls cross cluster weighted forests, and the idea there is um, that even if you have a data set that doesn't come with k designated studies. Um, or with k obvious subgroups you can try to cluster the data and do what we do and if you do that in the context of random forests you almost always do better so this this is something that she did that, I'm, that i still find quite remarkable that she could take something as basic as random forest and figure out a simple way to do better almost all the time and that is, is the following. You cluster your predictors into K cluster and then pretend it's a multi-study problem and apply our two-stage multi-study architecture that I just told you. And you, you in mo most of the time, you'll do better than by doing that than by uh, doing the standard uh, random forest, at least in, in the type of generating models that she, has, that she has investigated. Again, these are just initial forays into an area which I think uh, needs to be explored in much greater depth. Some of that exploration in much greater depth is, is the work of Boy Uren, who has uh, uh, formulated, along with Lorenzo Trippa, a, a, uh, the multi-stacking problem as an, an optimization problem, formalizing the, um, the utility functions that are behind it, uh, and also introduced this concept of no data reuse training, which he also was able to look at as a special case of an optimization problem. In the no data reuse, you don't reuse the same data in stage one and stage two. He also has developed some uh, interesting asymptotics, not only as the sample size grows large for each study, but as the, as the number of studies grows large, which is an interesting and, and, and not very well developed area of, uh, of large sample theory. So uh, 306, I think, uh, 306 Eastern. I think this brings me to the end. I, I, this is the... Um, the transition point slides i can go back to them if 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 there's interest if there is interest i just want to uh, wrap it up with a couple of uh, uh, lessons that we've learned the first uh, is that in contrast to reproducibility replicability is a is a is an area where you have to consider the fact that the variability that we have across studies is unavoidable and so some lack of replicability is to be expected. And some of this variability contributes genuine scientific insight about uh, what is uh, same and what is different uh, across studies. Nonetheless, we really need to uh, be able, in medicine particularly, to train on a finite and often small number of studies and generate something that will be robust to this variability. And to make progress in this front, I think we need to maybe shift slightly the debate about replicability on to a, a debate on how much variation do, should we expect from study to study and what are its root causes, number, number one. Number two, on generating curated comprehensive data collection that would allow methodology to be developed in rigorous ways, both empirically and in simulation that are driven by those. Uh, collections. And last but not least, uh, uh, I think we're just scratching the surface of developing machine learning and statistical learning principles that are applicable broadly and more broadly than just one data set at a time. So I'm, I'm hoping to be working on this for another 20 years or so, and I hope that some of you will be interested in joining us as well. These are some of the papers that you can look up um, or write to me and I'll point you to something that uh, that maybe a match for your specific interest. So thank you very much patients that help you, that help you uh, uh, model those data jointly. I think that would be a great direction to go to. We haven't made any progress on that, but uh, you'd be fantastic. 
I mean, it, Barbara Engelhardt has some really nice work in that space that is in spirit very similar to what we do, vertical work that is similar to what we do horizontally across studies, right? Right. And yeah, I mean, merging the two I, uh, type of ideas is something that's always been in the back of my mind. If someone does it, it'll be a, a three-pointer. Thank you. Thank you for answering the question. Um, I don't think I see any other questions. So I think for the interest of time, uh, maybe we can leave them to the end. And thank you again for the wonderful talk. You're very welcome. Thank you guys for inviting me. All right. So let's get ready for the next speaker. It is an absolute ple pleasure to introduce Dr. Shetty as a speaker in today's symposium. As a young investigator, Dr. Shetty has some, done some groundbreaking work in developing probabilistic models for single cell RNA data sets, specifically to gain developmental insights about cell fate and decision. Actually, I've known Dr. Shetty from my graduate school days where we both overlapped in Dr. Christina Leslie's lab at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Seti did his undergrad in computer science from NIT Suratkal in India, following which he joined Columbia University for his master's also in computer science. Then he joined Cornell University and Memorial Sloan Kettering Center for his graduate studies, where he did some amazing work uh, developing and using statistical models to integrate multi-omics data sets for understanding the molecular networks in cancer cells. From there, he joined Dr. Dana Pierce's lab at Columbia and MSKCC. And in Dr. Pierce's lab, Dr. Seti developed Wishbone and Palantir, very clever and popular statistical methods that leverage single cell data to provide insight about developmental trajectories and cell fate. Dr. Seti is a highly prolific and impactful scientist with his work being published in journals like Nature Biotechnology, Nature Genetics, New England Journal of Medicine, and many more. As a postdoc, he was awarded the Tri-Institutional Breakout Prize for junior investigators. Dr. Seti has started his own lab at Fred Hedge Cancer Center just the beginning of this year, and the current focus of his lab is to develop noble computational methods for modeling and integrating single-cell genomics data, gene regulatory mechanisms that drive developmental trajectories and also understanding communication between cells. One thing that I really want to emphasize about Dr. Seti is that he is one of the few interdisciplinary scientists that are not very, or not only very well versed with computational and statistical methods, but also have a deep understanding of the biological problem. So he, he really cares about the bi biology as well. So he brings both of the best worlds in my opinion. So now I invite Dr. Seti to get to start his talk. Great, uh, thank you, Tisha. Thank you so much for your uh, very generous introduction. Uh, hello everyone, it's, uh, it's my great pleasure to present at this uh, wonderful symposium today. Um, as Atisha mentioned, I started my lab at the Fred Hutch in January, and uh, today I'll talk a, a bit about our research interests and how we are using single cell data uh, to understand uh, the differentiation process. Most of our focus today will be in healthy differentiation, uh, but I would like to kind of give a few pointers where uh, we are really interested in moving into understanding how this uh, healthy differentiation leads to disease transformation and progression. Um, as Irtisha mentioned, uh, really the core interest of my research group is to understand how the cells um, in a differentiation system acquire their different fates. Uh, we view development or differentiation as really a series of lineage decisions uh, from progenitor cells to specialized cell types. And uh, a core focus is to really try to understand and decipher the mechanisms that drive these lineage decisions. Uh, we are broadly interested in a wide array of mechanisms, um, uh, both the gene regulatory, which covers the cell autonomous part, and also the cell communication through which cells integrate signals as they make their fate choices. 
And then the primary approach we take is to develop uh, computational methods. Um, we use a wide array of machine learning techniques, uh, but most of what we do is really inspired by our understanding of, uh, of how the system uh, behaves. And, and as I mentioned uh, recently in, in my own research, independent research group, we're really interested in trying to get into understand if we have a nice reference of how the healthy system behaves, can we use that as a baseline to understand what is the initiation and how does the disease progress, particularly with collaborations using mouse models and other model systems. And, and, and as I mentioned, one of the things, we are a strong believer in using technology as a driver for discovery. And our key approach is to leverage all these amazing advances. Uh, There's always too many to mention, but some of the key technologies we really leverage in the lab are single cell RNA, uh, single cell attack, more recently single cell cut and tag as well, and spatial transcriptomics. And, and we always have a strong emphasis on developing robust uh, methods and also generalizable methods so that uh, they can generalize to a variety of model uh, uh, organisms or systems under uh, investigation. All right, so, so this is a quick overview of my talk. So I'll start by describing Palantir, which this is an algorithm we already published as part of my postdoctoral work. Uh, I'll then lead on to another algorithm, which is in the works, which is we are hopefully we submitted soon, a metacell algorithm, uh, which will help identify cell states from single cell data, particularly as a solution for the sparsity in attack seek data. And finally, I'll finish with giving a sneak preview of uh, some of the work we have been doing in my lab, where we are using multi-omics data to infer a regulatory model of lineage dynamics. Okay, uh, diving right in. Uh, so, I, I kind of taking a step back, one of the uh, amazing things about single cell data is that it's really ideally suited uh, to study, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna switch over to my pointer. Yeah, great. Uh, it's really perfectly suited to study differentiation process. And, and there are two reasons, uh, two key reasons why this makes a single cell data is perfectly suitable. One is differentiation is asynchronous. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, if we, for example, consider hematopoiesis as an example, uh, at any given point of time in the bone marrow, we can identify cells across all stages of uh, differentiation, starting from the stem cell, uh, to the mature immune cells. That means a single sample or a single draw of cells from the bone marrow can give us a complete picture of the differentiation system. And this has been one of the probably the most studied uh, 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 systems. And classically, it was always thought that there are these well-defined cell types, stem cells, uh, different progenitors, and that is organized in this hierarchy that defines the human or hematopoietic system. But when we profile uh, the same set of cells using now single cell RNA-seq, what we see is that the cells are not discrete cell types, but they're organized in a very clear uh, continuum with no well-defined breaks or tran uh, uh, transitions. So, so this kind of underlines a lot of uh, the observation across many, many systems that the cell state transition that underlie any system are also uh, continuous. And, and this led to a development of a number of trajectory detection algorithm where the idea is to, we start with a profile, uh, let's say a single cell RNA-seq profile, and the goal is to order the cells along a pseudo-temporal order that defines the developmental or differentiation progression. Now, this is probably, again, one of the most uh, widely studied, uh, let's say, uh, research projects or research topics in single cell data. And and, and we have contributed a couple of algorithms here as well. But when we were developing Palantir, um, most of the studies at that point treated the cell fate choices as discrete bifurcations. That means uh, the goal of the different trajectory algorithms was if we have a point, can we identify points where the cell decides to be one fate or another? But what our data analysis showed was that even the self-fate choice is actually a continuous process and there isn't a single 
by a point where a cell decides to be one or the other. And in fact, we should really be modeling these linear cell fate choices also as a continuous process. And what does that mean? So rather than saying along a trajectory, a cell decides to become type A or type B, can we infer what is the probability of each cell differentiating to lineage A or lineage B? And, and if we compute these probabilities for all of the cells in the system, what we have is a complete and continuous view of the cell fate choices. And, and this is the really the goal of Palantir, where we are not trying to model not only continuities in cell state transitions, but also continuities in cell fate choices. And I want to give a little bit of technical detail of how we uh, model these uh, continuities. Okay, so, so given any single cell RNA seq data, we first start with a nearest neighbor graph. And as I'm sure you're aware, nearest neighbor graphs are one of the most powerful entities, particularly when it comes to single cell data and uh, analysis. And, and, and by definition, this is an undirected graph because we, for each cell, we are looking at what are its closest neighbors based on some uh, normalization of the expression space. Now, we do assume that the start of the trajectory is known. And once we have the start, what we can do is use this nearest neighbor graph to compute shortest path distances through the graph, and that represents our pseudo-temporal order. So in this case, this is the start cell, and the cells differentiate along the pseudo-temporal order. Uh, now, that gives a continuity in cell state transition, what of the cell fate choice? Um, so now we use the undirected graph to, uh, and consistency with the pseudo time order to transform this undirected graph into a directed graph where each cell is consistent with its pseudo time order. And once we have this directed graph, we apply uh, some uh, um, a kernelization methods and actually formulate a Markov chain from the directed graph. And then this really is the core idea of Palantir, where we model the differentiation system as a Markov chain. And now that gives us access to all the properties of the Markov chain to describe the differentiation system itself. And, and one such property is it's the stationary distribution of the Markov chain, which we can use to automatically identify the different terminal states of the system without, uh, let's say, the uh, prior biological knowledge of where the differentiation ends. And, and once we have the Markov chain, we can also compute uh, the lineage probabilities. Uh, I'm not going into the technical detail here, but I'm happy to answer that during the questions. Uh, but, but using, we can essentially compute what's the probability of any given cell differentiating to the different terminal states in the system, which we identified uh, through the stationary distribution. And as you can see, uh, cells at the beginning of trajectory have non-zero probability of differentiating to all the uh, different uh, terminal states, and the cells gradually gain specialization and lose ability to differentiate to other uh, cell types. Now, one of the nice things is for each cell, uh, this is a probability distribution. It's a multinomial probability distribution, and therefore we can quantify what's the um, entropy or even just the information content in these probabilities for each cell. And we nominate that to represent the differentiation potential of the cell, a measure of the plasticity of the cell. And as far as you know, this was the first time where a measure of plasticity per single cell was identified using uh, single cell data. Uh, we have used this in uh, uh, two broad ways. One, uh, to get a detailed characterization of human hematopoiesis. Uh, we also identify, use Palantir to identify very unexpected lineage uh, decisions in the earliest mouse embryonic development. And more recently, uh, Palantir has also been used to characterize some of the tra uh, progression trajectories in cancer, but also the immune compartment of cancer to understand exhaustion uh, trajectories as well. Now, one of the uh, uh, key ideas here, even though we get a very, really clear and nice description of the system, uh, the information we gain out of 
out of single cell RNA seq analysis does tend to be uh, descriptive in nature. And we are really interested in trying to move towards a more mechanistic view where we can try to understand either the regulatory networks or the cell communication mechanism as they drive uh, cell fate choice uh, during the differentiation process. And this, the recent advances in multiomics where we can measure single cell RNA, RNA and attack from the same individual cell for thousands of cells creates this amazing opportunity uh, to be able to measure uh, or model these regulatory networks in a very high, a concrete and a high resolution uh, manner. Okay, so as uh, we have generated a multi ohm data of uh, human hematopoiesis, so CD34 is like a pan stem and progenitor cell marker for uh, human hematopoiesis. On the left side, I'm showing you a U map of the RNA, and on the right, you're, we're showing I'm showing you a U map of the attack. And uh, this is very qualitative, but at least the broad structure is very clearly recovered, giving us confidence that we can go on to do some more detailed modeling of the data. Now, one of the key issues with the data is that single cell attack seek tends to be super sparse. Uh, uh, and just to kind of give you an example, we are looking at this small subset of cells, MEPs, and you see that it has high expression of GATA. If you look at single cell profiles, there is no real uh, association. Uh, this is one of the single cells in the data, and I'm just showing you the attack profile in that single cell, there is no real association of how uh, this uh, locus uh, can dictate this given expression uh, pattern. Uh, and, and this is why uh, where we kind of came in with this new algorithm we have developed to kind of overcome the sparsity by rather than treating the data as single cells, can we identify concrete cell states from single cell uh, data, all right? So just to kind of go back and then, as I mentioned, single cell attack uh, data tends to be extremely sparse, but one solution is to look at it at the cluster level, right? So can we look at the effectively create a pseudo bulk attack profile from these clusters and look at the extra, uh, chromatin profile. And, and now this shows some reasonable association of which regulatory elements could be regulating this particular gene data one too. But, if I now just break this down into three groups, just purely really based on three quantiles of pseudo time order within this cluster, what we see is that clustering can actually be a really blunt tool in that sense, there is a lot of dynamics of the enhanced landscape that is obscured by viewing the data in a purely cluster way, a cluster format. For example, if you look at this uh, particular enhancer element, you see that there is increasing accessibility and that actually nicely correlates uh, uh, with the gene expression change along this, uh, uh, along th this pseudo time order, let's say. And, and therefore we need kind of an intermediate, right? So we have cell types, which are very broad, clustering in itself might, might be a subset of the cell types or a sub uh, classification of the cell types, but it's still a, a blunt, very blunt tool. So our idea is the single cell data is a result of measurement noise from, of course, biological um, uh, signals. So, and then it's composed. Uh, can we now aggregate these single cell data into metacells, which are effectively aggregates of cells that we think could be a result of measurement noise. And by grouping the cells together, we can significantly overcome the uh, sparsity issue and give a better signal, uh, gain a better signal of the data. All right. So the approach, uh, as, sorry, I have to mention that the idea of the metacell has been, it was not something that we have we are proposing ourselves, and it's been proposed by the Amos Tanai group um, a couple of years ago. Um, they have a very nice approach, and that works really well for the RNA data. The kind of assumptions and the start modeling assumptions, it, the, the approach that's out there really completely breaks down for attack seek data. Um, and therefore, we wanted to build an algorithm that can generalize to any type of data, irrespective of the data type itself. All right, so the approach we took is to use archetypal analysis. Uh, archetypes in effect are a convex combination of data points. 
And the goal of the archetypal analysis is to identify these archetypes uh, and such that the data points themselves can be defined as a combination of the subset of cells we identified as these goalposts or uh, our archetypes. Um, just to kind of maybe make it a bit more concrete, the way we approach the problem is to first build a cell by cell kernel matrix. Uh, one of the most important things because of this is we are moving away from uh, whatever is the data type characteristic because we are only looking at distances or affinities between cells and the measurement space, be it the enhancers or the genes do not matter anymore. Now, the archetype analysis is an iterative approach. Uh, there is an initialization, and then we try to really find groups of cells which are very similar or close to each other. And, and once we finish this iteration process, as you can see, we end up with a nice um, element of diagonal, and each of these groups is essentially a meta cell, which we aggregate and treat, it, treat as one single um, a state of the system. And, and this is what I'm showing you here. The U map is colored by the underlying meta cell and the, the darker circle shows what is the larger, uh, um, just the position on the same U map of the meta cell itself. And as you can see, it's very well spread out uh, across the U map. Okay. Um, as, as a comparison now, I showed you that the previously presented algorithm uh, does not really generalize to attack data. And we show that uh, our, our proposed algorithm based on archetypal analysis works really well for RNA, but also really generalizes to different types of uh, attack data, single cell attack data as well. Now, this is of course very qualitative. Uh, we came up with a few metrics. Uh, the idea is simple. Uh, we come up with a metric for compactness. That means if there are cells associated to be grouped together to a meta cell, uh, how compact is this meta cell in terms of its uh, expression distribution? The second metric is separation. If we have two neighboring meta cells, can we make can we show that there is a strong separation between them? And by treating this uh, meta cell as a multivariate Gaussian, uh, we can estimate the mean and covariance and show that very clearly our presented up, our approach is significantly better both in meta uh, compactness and separation in, in the different uh, data sets we have just tested on. Okay, so that's all kind of uh, it looks nice, but what, what's the, what do we gain out of doing uh, like a meta cell approach? So to highlight an example, I have chosen a subset of cells, uh, meta cells now. We're going from uh, hematopoietic stem cells to the erythroid cells, and this is the pseudo time order of progression, uh, start to end. I'm going to use two examples here. And for each cell, what I'm plotting is the fraction of peaks that are associated, uh, that are open across a, pans, uh, a set of hematopoietic genes, which, was, which were chosen in an unbiased manner. Okay, so this is what I'm showing you here. So um, the pink line represents the distribution of what fraction of peaks are open across a hematopoietic gene for hematopoietic stem cells. And the green line represents the same distribution, but now after the cells have progressed on to the erythroid uh, lineage. And as you can see, there is a clear progression from unimodal distribution to the uh, bimodal distribution. And when we look at it across um, all the meta cells in the data, we see a very nice progression, very nice and gradual progression from something resembling a unimodal distribution to a very clear bimodal distribution. And and if you look at the same analysis now at the single cell level, the signal is completely obscured uh, purely because the, uh, the noise at the single cell level uh, makes it practically impossible to define what um, uh, which is an open regulatory element at any given uh, locus. Okay. Now, one of the things here, if, because the acquisition of this bimodal distribution means some genes are gaining peaks, some genes are 
losing peaks. And we wanted to explore whether there is a biological uh, interpretation to this. So what I'm showing you here, uh, x-axis is the Palantir pseudo time, y-axis uh, is just a fraction of open peaks. Each line represents a gene and the line or the trend shows the opening or closing of a chromatin uh, enhancers, uh, cro open chromatin enhancers associated with these genes. So the orange line represents genes which gain accessibility and the blue lines are associated with genes that lose accessibility. And when we do like a, just a simple gene, gene ontology analysis, we see that basically all the uh, genes that have some already some chromatin open in the hematopoietic stem cells, but gain more in, in as they differentiate are associated basically with defining this erythroid lineage uh, showing that this is a good approach to identify key genes along differentiation. And then, and when we look at the other direction, where we look at genes that have losing accessibility, what we see is this is these are genes associated with general hematopoiesis, but also other immune uh, cell types. Um, so this really just uh, reinforces the point that a lot of the epigenomic landscape of uh, during differentiation is already pre-established uh, in the stem cells um, itself. So now, so I, I, that in many ways, it's uh, quite well known now, but I think the, what I wanted to convey is by looking at this data in through these aggregates as of cell states, we can really uncover, uh, clear, clearly decipher the enhancer dynamics and how they relate to gene expression patterns and how they impact, uh, how they impact cell differentiation. All right, so, so that kind of gives us a way now to, can we use RNA and attack in a coherent manner to understand cell fate potentials. And on this here uh, in the last few minutes, I want to just give a sneak preview of the model we have been developing to understand regulatory uh, lineage dynamics using this multi-ohm paired uh, RNA and attack data. All right. So, so the goal again is uh, simple. We start with the differentiation system uh, where we have measured RNA and attack from the same individual cells. Our goal is to identify both the lineage dynamics and fate predictions using this data, but simultaneously learn the regulatory landscape as understand what are the transcription factors that drive this differentiation process. And the way we approach this is to model this differentiation as a dynamical system. Uh, this allows us to infer both the long-term dynamics of cell behavior and the regulatory uh, drivers of these long-term dynamics. All right. So as I start, uh, as uh, using our previous algorithm, we now first infer a pseudo time order. This is purely based on the RNA. And for each of the state transitions in the pseudo time order, let's say we're going from cell I to cell J, we model the change in gene expression from I to J as a function of the transcription factor regulation uh, of the gene. Um, now we are ex uh, the, the, this kind of regression modeling has been very widely used uh, across many uh, pri but primarily in bulk data and this is the first time it's being used in the context of a dynamical system to holistically describe the differentiation process and we are really leveraging the fact of that we have paired information here where the expression change and the expression of the factor come from the RNA, whereas the accessibility and the transcription, candidate transcription factors that can regulate a gene are derived from the attack uh, modality. Now, without going into how we infer the model, uh, we basically learn all of the gene models and uh, or the regression models for all the genes and all the cells uh, simultaneously. And that gives us a set of inferred weights, which effectively defines what is the regulatory impact of a particular transcription factor on a particular gene. And using this, we can then get a measure of the velocity, right? So once we learn the model, we can apply it for using the expression pattern of each cell and understand what's the predicted direction that the cell is taking along this differentiation landscape. Uh, the nice thing about our model, we not only get a predicted direction, but we also have uh, 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 
uncertainty estimate or the variance uh, estimation of the predicted direction, which we use to infer uh, the lineage dynamics and the fate predictions. And, and the inferred weights themselves, as I mentioned, really define the regulatory impact of a particular transcription factor on a gene, and that we can use to understand what are the key regulatory drivers in, in, in key in, in important cell state uh, transitions. Okay, so I want to just maybe give a brief uh, look into the results when we applied this to human hematopoiesis. And, and this is uh, kind of showing the velocity, predicted velocities of the cells. Um, and then this is really what you would expect, right? So we have the stem cells and the, the arrows are just defining what direction the each individual cell is taking over a long period of time. And you see that cells uh, start from stem cells and move into all the different, uh, the different terminal states which we have identified in the system. Uh, what's very interesting is we can really zoom in and even if, when we zoom into the hematopoietic compartment, we already see cells that are all going towards the three different lineages, even though at the expression standpoint, they are, they seem fairly uh, uniform or uh, not as well separated as, um, as distinct cell types per se. And we can quanti and as I mentioned, we can use these uh, velocity predictions to infer the uh, fate probabilities, but also the differentiation potential of the cell. And when we look at the differentiation potential, let's say along the erythroid lineage, we see this trend: cells start to lose their ability to differentiate to other lineages. Now, if we compare this against the potential we gain, uh, we can learn just from the RNA. We see that we can. Uh, identify the fit uh, choice specification much earlier in pseudo time compared to RNA alone. And then this really shows how valuable using both RNA and attack in being able to model the lineage uh, dynamics. And this is true for all the different lineages uh, as well. Right, so uh, just uh, to maybe give a brief note about how we can use this to identify the regulator, the regulatory landscape as well. If we look at one's uh, transition, uh, we can identify, uh, in this case, the GATA2 to be the highest uh, trans ranking transcription factor that can make a prediction from the stem cells to the erythroid lineage. And we can really chart out the dynamics and say this GATA1-2 turns on GATA1, which in turn, Turn on the targets of GATA1, which will help define the erythroid lineage. And, and we are working towards, uh, we can get a pan hematopoiesis network, but we can zoom in and understand uh, the different uh, lineage uh, transitions and say, what is the subset of the regulatory network that's active uh, at any given uh, state uh, transition. And what we're hoping to do with, and we are working on increasing the resolution and the scale of this, uh, to really get a complete view of how the regulatory network itself is reconfiguring as the cells differentiate to one lineage or the other in the hematopoietic process. And, and in the longer term, we are also very interested in understanding how this impact, how these trajectories are impacted in disease, and particularly in MDS, which is a myelodysplastic syndrome, which presents as a differentiation defect with higher number of myeloid cells compared to what you would expect in a healthy differentiation system. All right, so I just wanted to, uh, sorry, the uh, just wanted to give a very quick summary that we, I hope I gave you an insight into some of the algorithms uh, that we have uh, uh, developed, including Palantir metacells and the multi o model, which is, um, which is in, which still is in a bit of uh, works and hope to have more results very soon. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, all the people who have contributed to the work, uh, both the Palantir and Metacell work is uh, part of my postdoctoral research, uh, where I was uh, part of an amazing group headed by Dana Pair. Uh, I'm building my own group now, and the multi ohm model has been led uh, heavily by Dominic, uh, who is a postdoc in my lab. Uh, we have, as uh, a new lab, we have openings at all positions. Uh, we are in Seattle, which is really a beautiful place to live and work. Um, so if you are interested, please, uh, please reach out and I'll, uh, I'm happy to take any uh, questions now.
maybe i'll i'll ask the first question so when we look at this data do we also can identify cells that have the potential to de differentiate yeah no that's a good question and especially that's a lot of what is seen in cancer right because you have increasing uh, plasticity um all of these trajectory detection algorithms um they can it, it does assume that the information flow in essence is going in one direction right so if the cells let's say do circle back i think these algorithms would in many ways just let's say purely based on the rna would get confused but i think what we think is uh, either through let's say splicing which is the rna velocity concept but also really trying to use the um, regulatory model because we have the transcription factor which precedes the expression and therefore we can have some kind of a causal information there we hope we can uh, we would be able to figure that out uh, but it definitely needs information beyond just rna to be able to make a clear uh, way to predict these the differentiation or increase in plasticity for sure yeah anybody with more questions i i have i have like two more questions honestly so sure. one would be about how does attack look for regions which people call super enhancers how does it look when we go all the way from stem cells in in con in continuum because right now you have single cell attack so how does those regions look uh, and how does also it reflect in rna because right now we have only steady state uh, or just very specific uh, mm -hmm. cell states where we have those readouts but how does it look uh, in attack in single cell in a continuum mode right no i think that's a, again a great question uh, especially when it comes to super enhancers what we see is a big chunk of those enhancers are already established at this uh, hematopoid let's say the stem cell state even though the gene is not yet expressed right so at all you have very baseline expression but um often times you see let's say a gene is associated with 20 enhancers 10 of them are open um and with transcription factor binding but you actually see zero um uh, zero expression but once when you look at the continuum right so now we can track the dynamic of the enhanced enhancers itself and trace it with the expression it's actually very continuous it doesn't show doesn't look like it's a very binary behavior where you go from 10 hand enhancers open to 20 enhancers open you take a very gradual step and as the gradual opening uh, as there is gradual opening of the chromatin the expression starts to go up and then they all both hit a plateau at the at the same time so in many ways yeah a lot of it is set up in the beginning but that doesn't always mean the gene is expressed but as there is more opening of the chromatin the expression also starts going up but the expression does always have a bit of a lag compared to the chromatin opening so when you're saying the beat of a lack i mean what is the time frame you are talking about um, ah, <laughs> so time frame is a bit uh, very hard to say here right because we are looking at really only pseudo time ordering so i would say it's um, i honestly don't want to make any statements about the time because i think it it really is a function um a function of of the uh, of the system in many ways but but what's interesting is people have done lineage tracing studies where you can tag cells right and then follow how it progresses and at least in hematopoiesis there is almost a very linear relationship uh, between what you can measure in terms of actual time um, so we don't know i mean so the absolute scale if you kind of let's say put the time as start and end and then look at what fraction of time elapses in state transitions that is actually very very consistent with the pseudo temporal order so at least in hematopoiesis we could make okay if the whole hematopoiesis takes 100% of the time the lag is i don't know 1% 2% i mean this is a number i'm making up but we can maybe make concrete statement at least in hematopoiesis given that true time seems to reflect or pseudo time seems to very well approximate true time yeah mm -hmm. thank you 
just one more question from sure. my side so for the regulatory potential you're modeling it as a factor of transcription factors but i believe uh, I, wouldn't there be other factors especially the communication happening uh, the signaling happening that would also be driving uh, these cell state transitions so do we try do you try to do that as well or is it very focused on transcription factors no, I think that's, uh, I mean, that kind of defines a lot of uh, my research program and what we are interested. So, I mean, you're totally right, right? So in the sense, the cells are integrating a lot of these signals, both autonomous and not autonomous. In many ways, we are trying to simplify the problem a bit. Uh, we effectively have things going in parallel where we are trying to, let's say, put aside regulation and try to understand how cell communication drives things, right? So that the way we are approaching that problem is if we have uh, instead of trying to look at all cell types can interact with all cell types can we get a pseudo time order or spatial resolution of what are the physically proximal cells and then try to build robust models of communication and and we are taking it almost like trying to break it down into two different problems and hopefully eventually they all uh, come together uh, but you are totally right i mean i think even looking at regulation gives us not necessarily a complete view, but I hopefully will give us kind of the advance and sufficient information to make some concrete uh, hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah. I just feel it's such a rich data set and what are the possible ways to leverage to understand more. So there is like, a, and you, you are doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you, Atisha. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any, if there are no more questions, then we'll go to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, so uh, thank, fantastic talk, uh, Dr. Sethi. Like uh, now we are moving to our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Min Jin Ha from MD Anderson. She she is an assistant professor in MD Anderson. Uh, received uh, several awards, uh, young investigator awards. Uh, Fantastic works on Gaussian graphical models, uh, network modeling, and their application, mainly the dependent structure in gene, proteins, multi-platform data, and their application in bioinformatics, which is natural. So I I'll keep it to Minjin to talk more about her research. Uh, today her talk is on integrative network modeling, which is very close to our group's heart. Okay, Minjin, it's all yours now. Okay, thank you for the nice introduction and uh, thanks the uh, organizing committee for inviting me in this nice bioinformatics symposium that attract all different uh, people who is in the, the uh, 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 different fields like bio biology, bioinformatics, statistics, like mathematics. So I would like to share my screen. Okay. Okay, I hope everyone can see my screen. So, um, so I, uh, today I would like to uh, speak about my uh, recent research, methodological research on uh, modeling the uh, pharmac pharmacogenomic data. Like, uh, so I would like to first introduce a little bit about the motivating examples, and then we'll discuss about uh, in more detail. Uh, on my uh, method of statistical framework. Okay, so let me, okay. Okay, so in cancer research, like a large volume of biological data are obtained from various domains, like uh, uh, for the development of cancer treatments. So at, at the discovery level of the bottom, so we have a high throughput, multi-platform genomic and drug screening data are available for uh, various model systems of human cancer as well as for patients. So uh, like uh, we can, uh, we have, we can, uh, there is a lot of public databases for human cancer cell lines and also from uh, animal models like a patient derived a uh, xenograft model where uh, the um, mouse are like actually implanted with a uh, 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 patient tumor. tumor. 
So uh, at this stage, the drug efficacy and the toxicity can be evaluated and the genomic-based hypothesis can be uh, generated to propose a new drugs for potential use. And then human uh, uh, testing of drugs is performed for the drugs that have shown potential in the preclinical studies. So for like uh, from patient participation, so in like uh, clinical trials uh, or cohort studies, we, it, under very highly controlled setting, we can evaluate the efficacy or like a uh, toxicity of the drug or treatment uh, in this setting. So like uh, in this uh, um, recently, like a lot of mobile devices can help to uh, improve the retention oh, and uh, oh, okay. recruitment of the patients. Okay. Okay, so at the uh, observational level, like at the surveillance, so like many institutions have their own database that store all different types of the uh, uh, patient data, like demographic information, treatment information, biomarker and imaging information are there, and then outcome information are stored there by following up these patients. So these can be used as like a, a, a evaluate the, the treatment in real world uh, 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 scenario. So however, these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, process of the drug development is not one way, it is like a cycle click so uh, because like uh, there are like uh, those drugs are like uh, mostly target the population some population on average so there will be some patients who is very responsive to this treatment however there is also other groups of patients who is not responsive to this treatment so we would like to uh, explain the uh, driving factor uh, of the uh, that explain this variable drug response across uh, different domains in cancer research. Okay. So I would like to, so I have been working uh, with a breast cancer group in MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, they are particularly interested in hormone receptor positive advanced breast cancer. So over 70% of newly diagnosed uh, breast cancers are hormone receptor positive, which is ER, ER or PR positive, and the uh, or two negative uh, subtypes. And such that, so then they actually uh, uh, progress at the end and then see the final outcomes uh, with the uh, metastatic breast cancer. So the uh, the most the endocrine therapies have been considered to be the uh, mainstay of the treatment for these uh, 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 or to uh, the hormone receptor positive breast cancers. However, like recent, most uh, recently, like uh, 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 and then uh, most of the, these and uh, patients who receive endocrine therapy show resistance, and then finally they show disease progression. So due to some dice leg regulation of the key signaling pathways. So uh, recently, uh, CDK4 and CDK6 inhibitors has, has have been developed. The most uh, earlier, uh, the earliest type of drug is named as parvocyclic. So it has been developed in combination with endocrine therapy and are considered to standard care for patients with advanced uh, ER positive breast cancers. So there has been many, many, many like in intensive clinical trials there and then to show the effect uh, the effectiveness of this parvocyclic drug and uh, the phase two, phase three studies there. So this has been evaluated in combination with endocrine therapies in first line and second line setting. Okay, so uh, we actually would like to confirm uh, the uh, with uh, from the collaboration, we would like to confirm the effectiveness of the parvocyclic drug in the real data, real world data at MD Anderson. So uh, we actually identify from uh, the uh, the database in um, Department of Breast Cancer Oncology. We actually identified five thousand four hundred or 
HR positive and, and metastatic breast cancer patients. So actually, what they what their treatments are like, uh, they actually st uh, after they get diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, then they start their first line uh, endocrine therapy with one of the aromatase inhibitors, and then if they see resistance to the drug or some disease progression, then they uh, they are getting into second line therapy with full restaurant drug, drug. So we want to evaluate the pelvocyclic drug effect uh, in combination with endocrine therapy, both in first line and second line setting. Okay. So uh, we identified from these 5,000 patients, we actually identified like four groups of the patients in the first line setting. So the patients, there is a group of patients who got the uh, aromatase inhibitor, and also alone, and also uh, aromatase inhibitor plus pyrocyclic. So in this, in the first line setting, AI can be acting as like a AI group can be acting as control group. And then in the second line setting, there is there there was a patient group who got AI first in the first line setting, and then they see the they actually had disease progression, and then they get into the second line, and then they get full western alone or fulvestron plus parvocyclic. So in this case, fulvestron alone group in the second line setting will be acting as control group. So as we see in, the, in from this uh, histogram, so this is showing the date of the year of the uh, diagnosis as uh, the uh, metastatic breast cancer. So because uh, parvocyclic is like uh, uh, approved in like uh, only five or six years back. So the uh, diagnosis date of the patients are a, a lot of, there is a lot of difference. Like this. the red is the pelvocyclic group and the blue, uh, gray is the control group. So we could uh, presume that there are uh, selection bias for the treatment. So we would like to, uh, and then also the baseline characteristic should be very different across uh, between this control and the treated group for each lines of the setting. So we actually adjust the baseline characteristic and uh, uh, characteristics using propensity matching method. So uh, what it is doing is we actually uh, construct pro propensity score, which is the probability of the patient, the treatment, get, the patient is treated uh, conditional on the baseline characteristic, such as like say, uh, uh, gender, um, uh, gender age and the tumor stage at the primary, primary tumor stage. And also uh, we use the ER and PR status, and then uh, also the primary treatment they receive. So using these uh, baseline characteristic, we actually estimated propensity scores for each individual. Then for each individual treated patient, we actually select one control uh, that uh, show the most uh, similar propensity score. So in this way, <clears throat> We could, uh, uh, from this uh, propensity matching, we ident we actually had uh, 708 pairs of the treated and controlled patients uh, from first line, and we had 380 uh, uh, patient pair for the second line uh, uh, setting. So we actually independently analyze the data first line and second line, and then the uh, Panel B show the Kaplan-Meier curves of the progression-free survival for the first line, and then C is for the second line uh, analysis. So as you see, so uh, and then uh, as you see in, from this plot, we actually we could see that there are parvocyclic is effective in uh, in positively effective in prolong the progression-free survival. So that's 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 kind of we can confirm uh, the uh, the results from clinical trials. So, uh, however, despite the significant improvement of clinical outcomes, 
almost all patients show resistance to the combination therapy, endocrine therapy plus parvocyclic. So 30% uh, of these patients do not respond to these agents from the very start of the treatment and almost all the rest of the patients will develop uh, resistance to uh, these agents by the 36 months. So following the uh, treatment. Okay, so here the uh, collaborators and we, we actually, we were wondering what would be the driving factor for these uh, that differentiate these, uh, 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 these drug uh, response. So we would, our aim is to characterize the molecular mechanisms that are relevant to sensitivity or resistance of the CDK46I in I and agents used for endocrine therapy. So the so we actually going back to uh, the uh, in preclinical models. Then we would like to identify the driving fact, driving factors there. Okay. So for doing that, we can actually, there are a lot of growing uh, uh, database, public databases, and then uh, uh, we can, that we can use. So uh, pharmacogenomic studies actually describe the study of genomic mechanisms and governing, that govern the variable drug response. So for this, we, uh, for this pharmacogenomic study, we actually, uh, we can use multiple types of high throughput data uh, that are available for multiple uh, uh, cancer model systems. So we definitely, we have patients data from like a TCGA. And then also we have cell lines data like from like CCLE project or then map and other projects and patient also we have patient derived xenograft data. So uh, P, which is animal mouse study and also we have organoids database. So uh, there are recently uh, like a prism project which is like displayed here. Actually it, they uh, uh, generated High, high throughput drug screening data. They cover almost like uh, more than 3000 drugs and also for uh, five, more than 500 cell lines. And then the drug, the screened drug is including both oncology and non-oncology drugs. Uh, and, uh, uh, and these data source can be used for finding the and characterize the uh, underlying mechanism of the drug action and that will help to develop new treatment like combination therapy or targeted therapy. Okay. So our approach also uh, the in uh, so most of the existing modeling approach to this multiomic with multi multi-platform genomic data and drug response outcome in the scientific literature, their approach to that is like a, we uh, for example we have genome like DNA level data, epigenome data, transcriptome data, proteome data. So we have four types of the data. And then uh, for each sample, we actually uh, have one vector for, from the DNA level copy number aberration, and then one vector from uh, microRNA expression, and one vector from gene expression, and one from protein expression. Then their approach is to concatenate all of these four types of vectors into one long vector. And then uh, the drug sensitivity outcome is actually uh, projected on this, regressed on this uh, whole uh, feature space. That's the approach. And then in this way, uh, they can use like a, a marginal uh, association or with the drug outcome. And then, uh, and or they can use like a, Multiple, multiple regression framework, like uh, because uh, uh, due to the high dimensionality, they can use like some penalized regression framework using like GLMNet. And then after they find the genes, then uh, maybe they, they can embed these gene signatures to the uh, pathways. And then from um, each gene enrichment analysis, they can 
uh, find some all oh, these or oh, these signature gene signatures are like uh, uh, mostly enriched in this pathway. So we can target, uh, we can uh, think about targeting these pathways. So this is the uh, uh, usual practice in these uh, scientific uh, literatures. However, uh, we would like to uh, model in a little different way. So, so we would like to take multi-level modeling. So uh, our purpose is to provide a unified framework. So uh, uh, actually, it actually it characterizes more deeply deeply for of the multi-platform regulatory be behavior across the platforms and as well as interactions within platform. So this will help in identifying key biological mechanisms to facilitate. Uh, drug de development. So uh, uh, we can we can uh, so we can find the direct effect to the drug outcome, and also we can find the indirect effect to the uh, drug outcome. So in that way, we can uh, even if we can find we have more candidate for the drug target, and also it will help to understand the whole mechanism. Okay, so uh, instead of concatenate all the vectors from multiple from data, we actually combine uh, these multiple from data in a uh, vertical uh, way. So using multiple order layers. So the genome goes first, an epigenome, and then transcriptome and proteome. So using some prior information in the biology. So then actually after using this order, we characterize the dependence within platform and also characterize the dependence between platform. Then we, after adjusting for this dependence, we actually uh, associate these uh, multi-platform features with drug sensitivity outcome. So that's the overall uh, goal of our work. So, okay. So to do the unified approach, we actually take the gra graph theoretic approaches. So um, actually in this frame, in a graphical model, uh, we can incorporate all the baseline covariates and multiple for molecular data and outcome data together. So to understand the dependent structure across multiple layers. So this cartoon illustrates the, our uh, hypothesis uh, networks across the DNA, mRNA, protein, and the outcome data. Uh, so each uh, platform constitutes one layer. And then, uh, and then we, uh, we actually assume the order of the DNA, mRNA, protein, and uh, outcome. We allow the uh, interaction between the um, within platform by undirected edge. And then we allow the directed regulatory relations by allowing on directed edges in the, between platform. So in this way, we actually, uh, and then using graphical model concept, uh, like chain graph model uh, theory, we can characterize these edges by conditional dependencies while accounting for the order. So if we, this model, uh, this modeling framework is very, flexible so that if you are not comfortable with the order between the layer, like for example, if you, you wanna assume the protein can affect to the mRNA. So in that case, we cannot assume the exact order. So you can actually uh, combine the mRNA and the G, uh, protein layer together. And then you can only identify the undirected edges in that case. So, okay. So I would like to introduce a little bit of the mathematical formula there. So graph is like a, uh, this, the whole graph is denoted by like a, has the node set V and then the edge set E. So the V is corresponding to the older random variable for the genes and then E contains both directed and undirected edges. So we assume a priori that uh, the, there are some partitioning according to the platform information. So there are the, all the P random variables are uh, 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 decom uh, 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 decompose it partitioned into these joint layers of th those P random variables. So um, if, as I, uh, as I, as I seen in the previous uh, slide, 
we only allow the uh, directions through uh, according to the ordered domain here. We are not allowing the uh, edges on backward. So in that way, we can actually uh, 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 model using we 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 are gonna model the, we are gonna estimate this graphical structure using normal uh, assumption here. So why we assume that why the total p random variables are following normal distribution with a precision parameter omega. So uh, the, the omega it can be uh, obtained by mean parameter and the residual precision parameter in this uh, multi-layered Gaussian graphical model, which is like a multi multiple regression. So. However, this uh, regression formulation is the mean and the precision parameters are highly structured and there are many, many zeros. So the zero structure, so the, uh, if, the, uh, if the, zero is, the zero structure corresponds of the mean parameter encode directed edges between layer. And then uh, the precision, the zero of the zero elements of the K encode the undirected, undirected edges within a uh, platform. Okay, sorry. Oh. oh, okay. Okay, so uh, this actually whole multivariate multiple regression problem, this is a high dimensional. So we actually assume there is more, much more random variable number of genes than the uh, 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 sample size. So we, we need, we, we need to, uh, we we can we, we are interested in like uh, decompose this whole uh, joint regression problem into smaller problems. So from the normality and normal property, and also using the uh, prior information on the order of the layer and also membership information to the layer, we can decompose the whole joint regression problem into layer-wise regressions. So for the first layer, for example, DNA layer, we the problem actually boils down to finding the precision matrix, which is Gaussian graphical model problem. So which is well known problem and there is a lot of literatures out there. And then from the uh, second layer to the last layer, we need to solve the multivariate multiple regression problem with the mean parameter and then the residual uh, precision parameter K. So uh, this is actually the whole problem, the whole joint regression problem can boil down to component-wise problem. But still, this problem is still very hard to handle. Like uh, there is Bayesian literatures and uh, frequentist literatures that handle this uh, 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 um, this problem. However, like in Bayesian literature, if we use hyper Richard prior for the precision matrix, so we we are searching the graphical structure in very limited space, like a decomposable graphical uh, space. So, however, we would like to allow more flexible modeling uh, framework. So what we would like to do is like approximate of this joint estimation. So we would like to, instead of learning all the graphical structure at once, on the compound, re compound regressions at once, we would like to uh, decompose further this problem into node-wise, local node-wise problem. So for a node, we aim to simultaneously find its neighbors and the parents which are connected by undirected and directed edges. So for example, we are, uh, we are doing the, our, uh, node, we are doing node-wise regression for this node at the protein layer. So we wanna find the edge from the upstream layers. And also we wanna find the uh, edges that are connected to the neighbors within, uh, to, to other proteins in the same layer. So uh, in a uh, mathematical form, so we actually uh, trans, we actually uh, uh, reparameterize the 
the joint model into node-wise univariate regression formulation. So uh, we, in this case for the node YB, so we, it include this regression form includes the regression coefficient from the upstream layers, which is BV. The PV is the parent set, the preceding layers. And then it includes the regression coefficient between the neighbors and the, the node V. And then also there is extra term there. So it is kind of adjusted by the uh, indirect effect from the preceding layers to the neighbor and the neighbor to the node V. So if we take some toy illustrative toy example, we can actually uh, Y1 and Y2 are external factors that affect Y3 and Y4. So uh, if you see the, our regression problem y, uh, in panel B, so for Y3, we have regression coefficient uh, B31 from Y1 for Y1 and Y3. And then alpha 3, 4 is for the undirected edge from Y4 and Y3. And then uh, it is kind of adjust, adjusted by the upstream uh, uh, parent set of the preceding layer, Y2 to Y4, and then Y4 to Y3. So we would like to solve this problem locally. And then uh, because our problem is not uh, estimating the mag actual magnitude of the regression coefficient and the prism matrix, our more, we are more interested in finding uh, the zero structure. So it's the, we view this problem as model selection problem. So uh, if because we change it, the whole joint regression problem into univariate regression problem, the thing we, if we find the uh, uh, zero, zero part, zero element in our uh, uh, regression coefficients, then all the edge, directed edges and undirected edges can be found. So we use Bayesian approach for the model selection. So using uh, Bayesian uh, spikes and slab priors and uh, after actually we introduce binary indicators for the selection of the directed structure and undirected structure and then the model selection can be achieved from through the mixture priors on the regression coefficients so we we just uh, the prior is specified uh, not uh, uh, those priors are not uh, common across the uh, each node-wise regressions, so we can learn independently learn the, uh, the the graph structure for each node. So we use mixture prior for each of the uh, regression coefficients for directed and undirected edges, and then variance parameter is like uh, follow it has the uh, gamma prior there. Okay, so after learning MCMC, our MCMC, then we actually have like a, a, a set of MCMC samples, and then then we estimate the network structure uh, with uh, uh, from by calculating the marginal posterior inclusion probability. So we actually uh, select the edge or non-edge by each node. So by each edge. And then we have to, uh, using the fact that uh, this posterior probability is the, like interpreted as local FDR, we can actually uh, control for the FDR at level, like at some level. So, uh, okay. So this is the simulation results because our approach is kind of approximation to the joint regression problem. We actually wanted to know how our method is performing compared to other uh, methods that directly solve the joint regression problem. So we actually uh, selected some of the uh, uh, multivariate regression prob uh, uh, method methodologies, MRCE and uh, uh, from Rosman and then the Kempmi from Kai at all. Uh, so we actually confirmed that our method is kind of uh, has a good accuracy uh, performance in finding the network structure. Okay, so I would like to go back to the breast cancer context here. So after we developed this method and then we would like to, so in the paper actually, 
we actually uh, use uh, patient data, TCJ data, and we see what is the pet uh, network similarity and difference uh, pain in, in the pain cancer study framework. So we are, uh, and, uh, and then we actually apply, we are applying this method to in different contexts. So here uh, we use uh, the cancer cell line encyclopedia, CCLE cell lines, and we used copy number, gene expression, protein expression data, and also drug screening data. And the, there are 61 breast cell lines. And then we actually selected parvocyclic, uh, uh, and then fulvestron and tamoxifen. So the parvoxyclib is CDK46 inhibitor, fulvestron and tamoxifen is used for the hormonal therapy, like endocrine therapy. Okay, so this is the resulting uh, network structure that we estimated for these key signaling pathways. So the green, uh, uh, those are uh, representing the drugs. And then there are big uh, uh, modules that are highly connected with the drug sensitivity and all other uh, modules are not uh, connected with the drug sensitivity. So we would like, we, are, we might be interested in this big module here. So uh, uh, even though we need to uh, validate these results in other knockout experiment or like, like uh, CRISPR uh, data, but however, we just uh, literature based on liter previous literature, uh, working with collaborators, we would like to confirm uh, this uh, network uh, is reasonable. So we actually, if we see the top part here uh, that are connected with uh, the, these three drugs. So there were several copy number aberrations that were connected with these drugs. So AR and GATA3 and e INPP4B genes are, uh, all of these three genes were in the hormone receptor and hormone signaling pathways. So, and then uh, the breast cancer is well known, uh, like uh, uh, cancer that are relevant to hormone, uh, yeah, yeah, hormones pathways. So, the, and then AR, AR gene uh, had uh, actually the first gene, this gene, had a direct effect to the hormonal therapy. And uh, therapy is tamoxifen and the and the uh, um, uh, fulvestron, which had been reported in the literatures. Uh, many there were many literatures, and this is only the main um, big uh, literature that uh, had, that that validate this result. And then there is two other genes there. So it, this was relevant to parvocyclic uh, 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 drug there. So this. Actually, this paper is for uh, my uh, from the collaborator, so they actually were pretty happy about finding uh, these two genes. And also for other interpretation, we uh, found uh, this module here. It is this gene EIF4EBP1 gene is included in the TSC and TOR pathway. So, and then uh, this gene and protein expressions were regulated by CNA and then regulated uh, by the parvocyclic drug response. Uh, which goes along with the recent finding of the CDK4 mediated mechanisms of the phosphorylation of the tumor suppressor gene. So in this, and also we also find uh, a gene with a gene expression, which is in the breast reactive pathway. Okay, so I think I need to wrap up the uh, my talk. So. Uh, I would like to sum up, quickly summarize uh, what I have been uh, uh, presenting. Uh, okay, so si uh, there are simultaneous modeling of data are, uh, arising from multiple layers provide insight into holistic picture uh, for the interactive system. And then multi-layered Gaussian graphical model is a general integrative graphical model framework, so which includes both Markov network and directed or cyclic graph. And then uh, Ben's Bayesian approach to that Bayesian node-wide selection approach is actually coherently accounts for the dependencies in the MLGGM model. 
And then uh, in, from this flexible modeling and uh, Bayesian modeling, we can incorporate any existing knowledge on the edges, regulatory relations and the interactive rela relations. So this work has been published this year and then uh, the whole code is available in my GitHub. Uh, okay, so uh, I'd like to thank the uh, method for the methodological development. Uh, I was working with Vera Valadande Yusapani, University of Michigan, and Francesco Stingo at uh, University of Florence. And then for uh, data analysis with uh, 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 breast cancer group, uh, Yu Shen uh, 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 helped me a lot and for uh, data analysis and then uh, David Tripassi and Kelly Hunt and Kal uh, Kandan Kiyomarsi uh, for the biological clinical input. Okay, so I have some grants that uh, some breast cancer uh, grant and uh, uh, some methodological grant. Okay, so this is all my talk and, and I would be happy to take any questions. Okay, so fantastic talk. Uh, any question to Minjin, anybody? We have time for one or two questions. Uh, so let me start then like, you know, I have a very, uh, Nice question. So you are doing this multi-layer, but a lot of your multi-platform things are not continuous. They don't, because you are doing Gaussian graphical model, right? And the whole methodology depends on conditioning Gaussian models. Uh, but if you have suppose copy number, like counts or zero insulated counts kind of thing you work on. So how do you integrate them? Do you make a transformation or something to make them Gaussian? Yeah, so that's uh, uh, directly relevant to our future study. Uh, expanding this work. So in in some simulation study for this paper, we actually um, uh, tested our method in the setting of Poisson distribution and it worked pretty well uh, compared to other existing methods in the robust setting. And then one other, uh, uh, and, uh, for using this data, we need to, um, the data should be continuous. However, there is, so we are actually working on extending this work into discrete data and also even continuous, there might be some, uh, some cases where uh, the marginal distribution is actually not normal. There is habitat distribution and such that. So to account for this non-normality habitat distribution, we can kind of in, uh, uh, add a uh, more parameter that model the if the node is normal or not normal by uh, using some scale uh, parameter like uh, yeah so scale yeah Gaussian yeah so uh, so that's uh, directly relevant to our work but it will be very interesting if we can robust and missed in the continuous data if we can robustify this procedure it might be very uh, interesting. Excellent. So, any other question? If you don't, uh, again, uh, big thanks to uh, Minjin for such a nice presentation. And we'll move to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ziao Li. Uh, yes. Uh, hey. Are you are here. So, let me introduce Ziao Li. So, uh, he is the lead. Uh, you are data scientist there, right? So lead data yeah. scientist, statistician, bioinformatician, whatever you say. I know he's a lead data scientist in uh, Gentech. Uh, so his work, I know what he does is uh, very nice. What he was in high dimensional data, he does spatial smoothing. So you can have image data, we can have a lot of other signals, which if you don't do spatial smoothing, you can miss some uh, very relevant signals. So, and that he did in his multiple papers, what I read, and he used some kind of, he integrated the spatial and non-parametric approaches together which is very, very interesting. Again, it's very close to our group's heart. Like we work, we try to work in those things. So again, uh, uh, Ziao, it's all yours. So you start, uh, tell us what you're doing these days. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dr. Uh, Malek. Uh, so let me share my screen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. 
uh, a need uh, for the invitation to uh, for me to speak here today. Uh, it's so fr from my talk, um, I will switch uh, uh, the gear a bit to, uh, from the omics field to uh, uh, imaging uh, imaging topics. Um, so. Okay, I, I hope I hope my screen works fine. Um, so today my topic is about Bayesian spatial and non-parametric models for cancer radiomics. Um, so th the talk uh, has four parts, and in, in the first part, I will talk about some background in case uh, the audience today the audiences today are not quite familiar with some uh, important concept in the in the field of of cancer radiomics, and then in the second. Part uh, I will talk about the second and third part. I will talk about uh, NOAA methods that we developed when I was in school with my advisor for supervised tasks and unsupervised tasks uh, learning, a uh, learning tasks approach. And then in the last section, I will uh, conclude a summary. Um, so some background about radiomics. Uh, so radiomics is an emerging field in quantitative imaging. So it encompasses uh, a broad class of analytics techniques, as well as data structures. So you have different imaging, mod uh, imaging modality uh, and you have different uh, methods to analyze such images. And uh, radiomics also uh, is considered as a conversion of digital medical images to analytical ready data set or manable data set so that it can be consumed by, uh, by information, statistician or data scientist. And, and also it incorporates uh, multiple type of uh, quantitative features that describe different characteristics of, of tumor, uh, tumor tissue imaging. Uh, and of course, re uh, radiomics, you will see uh, radiomics probably a lot in uh, the field of oncology. Um, it has a broad uh, application in oncology for classification, clustering, or association studies. So this picture uh, depicts the typical overflow of radiomics um, so you start with imaging uh, curation or acquisition, and then some type of, depending on the, the, uh, the imaging modality and, and, and the disease, you will probably do some uh, imaging noise removal and then tumor segmentation step. And after that, you can derive a variety of uh, features. Um, so there are, for example, there are size and shape based features that characterize the morphology of the tumor lesion. And then you have histogram based features, which are based on the raw intensity uh, from the, the, the images. And then you have another type of feature called a uh, texture feature, which is also the scope of today uh, that describe the tumor heterogeneity um, characteristics, right? So, uh, and after you have this many uh, field, uh, many type of features, then you can further associate this uh, feature to clinical endpoint or, or genomics profile. So that's the overflow of cancer radiomics. Um, again, so in this talk, I will focus on the subfield of texture analysis. And speaking of texture feature analysis, there's an uh, important uh, uh, concept uh, called grid level core cancer matrix, matrix. So here I'm showing uh, one of the uh, the, the, the case uh, from the, the adrenal uh, latent data cohort that we will uh, use in the following uh, presentation. Uh, on, the, on the left hand side, this is the raw uh, tissue, the, the, the tumor tissue imaging. So this is a CT scan. So the, uh, the, uh, the unit in the, uh, in the raw imaging space is a Hansfield unit. And on the right hand side is the corresponding GLCM that derived uh, from this, this raw CT image. And a GLCM is defined over the uh, image space to be the distribution of co-occurring uh, uh, co-occurring gray skills um, at a given distance and a given angle. So, for example, uh, the dimension of first of all, the GLCM is a square matrix, and it's the dimension is the 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 gray level uh, corresponding to the original image. And then for the IJ's entry of this matrix, uh, it, it's the uh, number, it depicts the number of times that uh, gray level I and gray level J co-occurs together in a given neighborhood and uh, uh, defined by a certain directions and a certain distance far away from each other. Uh, so, uh, and one big advantage of um, 
deriving the, using the GLCM to represent the information in the raw image is that for statistics, uh, for statisticians, uh, if you want to build, for example, population level uh, in, in, um, uh, model, you need to ensure that the, the input dimension for each patient are uh, the same. But uh, with the with the raw images, um, because different people will have different uh, size of tumor, right? So it's it's very hard to guarantee that. Uh, then, but then you can uh, this GLCM actually guarantees the the uniform dimension of the uh, of the input of the modeling object. The current uh, this all the state of art algorithm. Uh, uh, well, before the deep learning, I should say. Uh, before the deep learning algorithm populated and, and you know getting to be the start state of art algorithm, uh, back in the in the days, um, people are using the feature based approach um, where they derive the features different features from the uh, GLCM matrices. So, for example, you can derive the uh, correlation energy and etc. So on, so on according to the formula, and if each feature this depicts the patterns you observe in the GLCM matrices. And then after uh, you having this, uh, uh, like let's say p-dimension vector, uh, then you can uh, fit in into a, uh, for example, supporting vector machine or random forest, those typical machine learning uh, models. Uh, however, um, if you think about how this current analytic framework works down, uh, it's it, it it's uh, it's considered as inherently limited because uh, first of all, uh, summarizing the complex information from the GLCM uh, to a p-dimensional vector is considered a reductive mapping, and uh, uh, of course, some of the features you derived from from this approach was uh, highly correlated with each, with each other. Uh, and according, to, de depending on the uh, application, uh, different uh, um, uh, different data set may uh, uh, different uh, different uh, features may, may be selected or inf uh, better inform the, the clinical endpoint. So that's limited the reproducibility across uh, different uh, application or data set. Uh, so given all that, um, we uh, we argue that the a uh, multivariate inferential modeling strategy that captures the complex pattern of interest are, are actually absent uh, at the moment. So um, we want, and we want to uh, fill that gap. So the first approach we propose is called the Bayesian Spatial Gaussian Process Classifier, uh, which is uh, built to, uh, to, to do the supervised uh, Supervised classification, uh, su su supervision, uh, su supervised learning um, tasks. So here, um, the this is the illustrative pattern of the GLCM in the uh, adrenaline uh, uh, case study dataset we were talking, we were used. Uh, here on the left uh, column, this is uh, the uh, again, this is the latent RI image, the, the tumor tissue segmented, and then on the right hand side is the. Uh, is the derived GLCM uh, corresponding to each of these uh, raw, uh, raw uh, CT images. And we observe that actually a, a typical malignant tissue uh, will have the, 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 the peak of the counts in the GLCM space in the lower, you know, in the lower right direction. And on the other hand, a typical benign pattern will have a peak, uh, core, uh, a peak, uh, counts occurs in the upper left direction. And of course, there are a fairly amount of uh, patients that have, uh, that have the, the peak counts appears in the middle. So it's, it's called this mixed pattern. And the goal here is to, can we find a way that directly model on the GLCM matrices itself, and then also uh, can correctly classify a given GLCM uh, to its corresponding true classes, benign or malignant. So that's the that's the goal. Uh, so here we uh, it, it, we used uh, uh, we, we employed a, a spatial uh, mixed effect model uh, framework to uh, for the model specification. So um, where why here is the normalized uh, GLCM increase? So if you remember in the previous slides, the GLCM are the counts matrices. So uh, we cannot model on the counts by 
uh, imposing the Gaussian uh, distribution assumption. So we need to do some transformation. So here by normalizing, uh, we mean to say that each count uh, is divided by the total sum of, a total sum of, of this GLCM. Uh, and then depending on the data, uh, further data transformation, uh, for example, square root transformation may, may needed to guarantee that uh, normality assumption. Uh, and so the, the, key, uh, the key component in this construction is the eta, uh, is the eta here. So eta is the uh, latent spatial process that capture the spatial dependencies among the GLCM entries. Uh, so if, if you, if you um, observe, so if you watch closely to the GLCM entries, you can observe that uh, for a given entry that the neighboring uh, GLCM entries actually has very similar uh, actually positive correlation to these current uh, spatial locations. And we want to capture that spatial dependencies using this, this eta uh, uh, spatial random field. And uh, we use uh, the, the, the so-called Gaussian Markov random field construction to, uh, to um, represent the structure of eta here. And of course, like any mixed effect model, you have a fixed, you have random effect and you have, you of course have a fixed effect. So this fixed effect can be age and you know, the other clinical uh, demographic variables. Uh, and then beta here is the, uh, the location specific effects that, kept, that assumes to be the same across different patients. And here as convention, the uh, epsilon i here is the random noise. And so some words about the Gaussian Markov random field. Uh, so Gaussian Markov random field, uh, defined by a collection of uh, uh, conditional distribution, a conditional probability. So the key idea here is the, uh, the, spatial, the, the value at a spatial location SK uh, will only depends on its neighboring values, uh, where its neighboring is defined by this uh, WKD. So uh, uh, WKD takes value of zero if SD and SK are not in the close uh, spatial proximity and, and so SD is not considered as the neighborhood of SK. And it, it takes value of one if it is in the adjacent region. So, uh, uh, so that, uh, uh, you know, SK will only influenced by the neighboring uh, values. So after we, we so we, we, divide, we divide our uh, Bayesian spatial Gaussian process classifier uh, by using this, this formula, by calculating posterior classification probability. So essentially, uh, remember this is for super, supervised uh, tasks. So essentially we know the, uh, which patient that belongs to which group uh, beforehand. So we can fit the model, the previous uh, spatial mixed effect model um, by groups by, by, or by classes. And then we store the parameter estimated for each of the class. And then for a given new image or given new patient, we fit this uh, posterior uh, classification probability by using the fitted parameter for, for each uh, class. Uh, and then uh, we assign the predicted class uh, label according to the largest value of posterior classification probability. So it's very, uh, very straightforward um, to, to understand and implement. Uh, and to evaluate the proposed methods, we uh, conduct a series of simulation to compare uh, against the, uh, the benchmark models. Uh, and then the benchmark models, I mean, the feature-based approaches uh, that, uh, that embedded in the machine learning uh, uh, models. So uh, in, the, in the simulation mechanism, we have two parameters that controls the simulated patterns. Uh, well, the first one is S. So S controls the signal to noise ratio. Uh, when S is small, the simulated pattern has, uh, the signal to noise ratio is high. So the, the simulated concentration is very, uh, the simulated pattern is very concentrated around a certain area. Uh, when S is large, then it's, so you, you will see the simulated pattern will be more spread it out. So in that case, the noise, uh, the signal to noise ratio uh, will be high. And th there's another parameter controls the simulated pattern uh, that is C uh, and C controls the location of the simulated uh, peak or the red cells in the, in the GLCM space. Uh, so C equals zero is the upper, is the upper left uh, side. And then when you increase C that are larger to zero, 
then you will gradually see that the 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 location or the peak of the const of uh, of the counts are shifted gradually from the upper upper left to lower right direction gradually. So uh, and this the upper left pan, uh, panel will be our simulated uh, benign class, and then the 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 value of c uh, larger than zero will be our simulated uh, malignant class. So our task is. We want to compare each of simulated. And we want to compare uh, our proposed methods and the benchmark models using each of these simulated patterns. So here is the uh, uh, results of all the approaches. So first of all, we observe that when S increases, as I said, S control the signal to noise ratio. Uh, when S increases, the signal to noise ratio decreases. So all the methods. Uh, drop their performance, um, and uh, when uh, and for given S, uh, we observe that uh, our proposed methods, where our proposed methods is the green line here, uh, and the the competing methods are feature-based logistic regression and support vector machine, artificial uh, neural network, and then random forest. So uh, uh, the green line uh, is uh, above uh, the proposed methods. Uh, the, the benchmark methods for uh, basically every scenario. Um, and you will see that the, um, the, the competing methods have kind of a, a bell-shaped uh, curve. Uh, that's because it's kind of symmetric. It's, that's because uh, the feature-based approach is rotation uh, invariant. So if you simulate a pattern uh, like this and derive features, it will be similar to a pattern like this because it's rotation invariant. So it's, it's, it's having a, a symmetric performance. Um, but our methods is very sensitive to spatial location, so it's a monotonically increasing uh, uh, curve. Uh, so then uh, after the simulation, we, 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 we uh, applied our methods to a case study, and you can see uh, our proposed methods beating the competing uh, methods, which is feature-based approach uh, by a lot. Uh, so um, the the second approach is uh, for unsupervised tasks learning. Um, the uh, this approach we call hierarchical rounded Gaussian spatial distributed process model. Um, so the, in this this task, the goal is to we want to subgroup the patients into according to their observed uh, uh, GLCM patterns, so that we can better characterize the heterogeneity. Uh, of this cohort of the tumor uh, of the solid tumor laying. Uh, so this is some some words about the process. Uh, and the, the so the the so the reason we use the process here uh, is because for A it releases the parametric assumption uh, as the previous approach. And uh, secondly, it induces cluster membership, which is uh, uh, which is the, the major interest of, of these tasks. Uh, so the process prior the um, duration process has two components it's the concentration parameter which controls the expected number of uh, uh, clusters and then the the second component is called base is base matter it denotes as g0 uh, and then uh, g is a distribution uh, draw from this uh, uh, duration process construction uh, so although g0 can be a continuous distribution uh, g is almost surely discrete so the fact that the G is the, uh, the sample from G is discrete is the reason that why there's a process can induce clustering uh, memberships, and that's that's the key for for this uh, at least for this uh, application. Um, and then we we will introduce the the concept of running kernel. So uh, running kernel. So let's denote Z T as the count vector from the GLCM matrices. And previously, remember we normalized the counts so the so it's it's a continuous vector, but here uh, we argue that the, uh, the the data transformation step is uh, can can cause some information loss, right? So we, we want to avoid this data transformation as as possible as much as possible. So here we are directly modeling on the uh, on the uh, count vector itself, and h small h denotes the mapping function that maps the count vector to latent continuous. Uh, vector associated with uh, with the count vector z. Um, 
such that uh, the after the transfer uh, after, after this mapping uh, the, the 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 value you observe at the spatial location as i for the patient t equals k uh, can be expressed as a probability that uh, the transform uh, the, the mapped um, latent value y t as i at the same location of the same patient lies in the interval or bounded by the interval a k and a k plus one and we further uh, define the joint distribution of this mapping and also we further define the a zero to be the negative infinity and a k to be uh, k minus one uh, so after we having this uh, uh, this map mapping uh, we will have a latent continuous vector y and then we can build so similar strategy as the previous methods we can build the mix uh, mix effect model framework on this uh, transformed uh, continuous latent uh, vector uh, and here the the difference is between this one and the previous one is here uh, we are not modeling the 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 uh, spatial random uh, field using the Gaussian mark random field directly but we use the spatial Dirichlet process prior um, which uh, can induce the clustering membership and secondly uh, does not uh, have the strong assumption of uh, multivariate Gaussian uh, distribution assumption uh, but however the uh, the as said before the basic uh, measure uh, for the digital process prior part uh, has the construction of Gaussian Markov random field so the idea is we want to uh, model this uh, while modeling the GLCM matrices patterns we want to cluster in the patients that has the same uh, GLCM spatial patterns to be clustered together so in the end we will have uh, the uh, the cluster, the, the subgroups of, of the patients to, to better characterize the heterogeneity of this uh, solid tissue. And again, this is the graphic re representation of the proposed uh, approach. So um, again, this, uh, this approach has, um, th so again, th th this approach uh, is very similar to uh, the Euro spatial uh, mixed effect model approach. You have a uh, fixed effect subject level fixed effect and then you have uh, the random effect here the random effect that we we are capturing using the clustering spatial process which induced by the spatial digital process prior uh, and then these two components will uh, add up to this latent spatial uh, latent uh, sorry latent uh, uh, continuous uh, vector y but in the same time y is also bounded by the uh, original count vector z um, so this is uh, so this is basically the model mechanism and in the end the cluster membership uh, uh, attached to each GLCM count data will be induced by the cluster membership uh, of each theta vector uh, for each for each GLCM matrices um, so what's mentioning what's what worth mentioning uh, about this method is uh, this method so using this proposed method we can fit a spatial surface that is uh, non-stationary and non-Gaussian. So it's very flexible frame framework to model uh, the, um, to release the, the Gaussianality assumption and the stationary assumption like a lot of application does. Um, so to, again, so in, in order to, uh, evaluate the, uh, the, the proposed methods. Uh, so we first conduct a, a, a simulation study. So the simulation setup um, are very similar to uh, the previous uh, approach that we have C and S, where again, C controls the spatial location of the concentration stability here. So in this case, uh, we have, uh, so look at the first row, we have simulated uh, five different C uh, therefore, we have five different patterns, so five clusters uh, for each uh, given S. And again, S controls the signal to noise ratio. So S is small, the signal to noise ratio is high. Uh, so you can see, so for example, um, when you look at this cluster and th this cluster, so they are equally different. But when S is uh, large, the signal to noise ratio is low. Uh, then basically, this is the same the same uh, 
the, the same value of, of the C's, but uh, uh, you will, so it's at least it's ably hard to distinguish this, uh, for example, this pattern and this pattern, uh, just because the signal to noise ratio is low in this case. Um, so here are the uh, performance of uh, using the simulated data um, from our pro proposed methods and then uh, the, uh, the, 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 the benchmark uh, competitor models. The competitor models uh, here we used uh, are the feature-based uh, consensus clustering, Gaussian mixture model, uh, hierarchical clustering, uh, k-means clustering, and spectral clustering, so five competitors. And uh, uh, of course, our proposed methods. Uh, here are the metrics. Uh, we, we used the two metrics to characterize the uh, performance of, the, uh, of each uh, clustering approach. Uh, we, we, use, we, we use the uh, Pearson uh, cost square uh, test statistics, uh, which, uh, which used to measure the homogeneity of the true class membership and the assigned class membership. So uh, the, the, the larger the value of the, of the test statistics, the more uh, which represents larger deviation from the non-hypothesis, which, which assumes ra uh, random frequency distribution. So larger the value uh, characters better the performance that our uh, predicted cluster membership uh, concordant with the, the ground truth or cluster membership. Uh, as you can see that uh, uh, for when, when S is small, the signal to noise ratio is, is, is big, then uh, basically this is, uh, our, our model can, can pick up uh, the, the right cluster membership and number of clusters uh, correctly every time. Um, but then when, so it's, it seems that the, the, model, the limit of the model for, for this simulation setting is when uh, S equals 16 and above, it starts to drop the performance or starts to make uh, mistakes. But still, the, um, you know, the, the performance is still outperforms, the, the, the proposed method is still um, outperforms the competing uh, methods. And similarly, another metric is called missed assignment rate. So this is defined as the proportion of, uh, of wrongly assigned patients um, uh, from, its, uh, from its ground truth. And of course, the, uh, the lower the better. So in this case, when the signal to noise ratio is, is, is large, uh, our model, again, did very well, uh, of course, all performed the uh, competing methods. Uh, and again, when S equals 16 and above, uh, the, our model starts to make mistakes. Uh, and, uh, but still, we, we, we still observe better performance uh, for our proposed model than the competing uh, methods. And then we, we applied the, 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 this, uh, this uh, pr proposed approach to the same uh, adrenaline latent data set. Uh, and we have two scans. For, so one is the uh, non-contrast scan, which has the baseline, and then a delay scan, which is at a later time point. Uh, we, so we run the model separately on these two time point uh, scans, and each of the scans, uh, each of the, uh, each of the um, time point yield the two uh, number of clusters. So in total, we have four number, we have four subtype of clusters. Uh, and then to further validate the, uh, our, the meaning of our, uh, our discovered uh, subgroups, uh, we further uh, checked the, uh, the, the true pathological uh, label for, 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 the, for each of the patient in the cluster. And here, the red number in the parentheses uh, denotes the a uh, true malignant patient in that cluster. And, and so we further name the sub, uh, subgroups by using the majority vote scheme. So that's that, for example, uh, in this subgroup, uh, the majority of the patients are benign, uh, has, has the true uh, pathological diagnosis as benign. So this is a benign cluster. And on the other hand, this is a malignant cluster. So um, this is malignant uh, subgroups. And so um, if we're doing this and we, we found that the classification accuracy is actually 
0 0.78. So it's if you remember, uh, the first uh, supervised learning approach is kind of uh, uh, on the same level. Um, it's kind of on the same level. Mm, so, but when we fit in this model, we don't use the uh, outcome yet. So th because this is a supervised, unsupervised learning approach. So it's uh, so it's it's quite uh, quite uh, uh, quite okay. And for, for, for more details about this paper, because of the talk is uh, kind of short. So for more details of the, uh, of the talk, you, you can find uh, our paper uh, that recently published uh, in, in GSSC. Um, so again, this is uh, the, the example of uh, um, derived subtype of the, the adrenal layers. So for the first subtype, uh, basically the patients have uh, has both uh, scan uh, has both a concentration of the GLCM matrices for different time point scans uh, that are located on the upper left uh, corner. And for, for on the other hand, for cluster four, which is a malignant, uh, malignant class, so they, they, they have both scans uh, concentration on the lower, lower right corner. And then for, for the for, for sub, sub, subgroup uh, two, they have uh, the non-contrast scan on the uh, upper uh, left, but have a delay scan on the lower right. Uh, so for similarly for cluster subgroup three, uh, they have the non-contrast scan in the in the middle, and but have the delay scan in the lower left. Uh, the concentration has uh, the the delay scan concentration is in the lower right uh, direction. Um, so. Um, the, the proposed approach uh, is very flexible, so it can fit both for over dispersion and under dispersion count surfaces compared to if you, for example, one use Poisson models or by, by, uh, by a negative binomial, which over which uh, suits over uh, dispersion scenarios. Uh, and then this model can be ex easily extended to other type of correlated data. So, for example, uh, if you are dealing with uh, uh, longitudinal data, so you can easily extend this model by replacing the uh, Gaussian uh, marker and field structure into, for example, AR1 or compound symmetry in the base measure in the base measure of the initial process pair. Uh, and it it also can extend to, for example, continuous outcome. If you don't use the Raleigh kernel uh, techniques, you you can just directly work with the second stage. Uh, and then, so it's a, it's, it's a flexible uh, uh, methods for uh, design for complex structure. Uh, and uh, so I think it's almost time. So I would like to um, end this presentation uh, by acknowledging my advisor at school. So Dr. Brian Hobbs, who is now in University of Texas at Austin uh, and Dr. Michele Gundani, uh, who is now in University of California, Irvine. And then uh, my medical uh, collaborator, Dr. Na Chen, uh, who is still in uh, University uh, of Texas and Yangtze Cancer Center. Uh, and I would also like to uh, thank the audience today for all of the time. So um, that's the end of uh, my talk. Excellent talk, Zili. Uh, thank you. <laughs> let me ask, <laughs> fantastic. So let me ask if anybody has any question. Because it's a fantastic application of, uh, uh, you know, Bayesian non-parametric spatial things, pretty complex modeling in such a nice application. So, uh, if there is no other question, then uh, I'll pass it to Tapasri to give thanks to all the speakers, and I'll stop here. Sure. So, Tapasri, it's all yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so as we end our today's event, uh, I would like to thank you all for joining the symposium, and in particular, I would like to thank all our, our sincere gratitude to the wonderful speakers for sharing their research and expertise with us. Again, thanks to IAMCS for sponsoring us. And we hope to continue organizing this symposium every year with other departments. Thank you all for attending and have a good rest of the day. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.